240. Rainy landscape. Hour after hour, all night long, the patter of the rain rained down. All night long as I tossed and turned, its cold monotony beat against the windows. A gust of wind sometimes whipped overhead, and the rain would wave with sound, passing its quick hands over the panes. At other times there was just a muffled sound that made everything sleep in the dead exterior. My soul, as always, whether among bedclothes or among people, was painfully conscious of the world. The day, like happiness, kept procrastinating, indefinitely it seemed. If happiness in the new day would never come, if at least we could never have the disillusion of getting what we wait and hope for. The chance sound of a late-night car, jostling roughly over the cobblestones, became steadily louder, clacked rudely beneath my window, and faded at the far end of the street, at the far end of my fitful sleep that never became true slumber. Now and then a neighbor's door would slam. At times there was a splashing of footsteps, a swishing sound of wet clothes. Once or twice, when the steps were numerous, they made a louder sound. Then they died out. The silence returned and the rain relentlessly continued. If I opened my eyes from my pretended slumber, I could see, on the darkly visible walls of my room, floating snatches of dreams to be dreamed. Dim lights, black lines, hazy shapes climbing up and down. The various pieces of furniture, larger than in the daytime, indistinctly blotted the dark's absurdity. The door was distinguishable as something no whiter or blacker than night, just different. The window I could only hear, not see. Again, fluid and uncertain, the rain pattered. Time dragged to its accompaniment. My soul's solitude grew and spread, invading what I felt, what I wanted, and what I was going to dream. The room's hazy objects, which shared my insomnia in the shadows, moved with their sadness into my desolation. 241 Triangular Dream The light had become an extremely sluggish yellow, a yellow that was filthy white. The distance between things had increased, and sounds were spaced differently, disconnectedly, and farther apart. As soon as they were heard, they suddenly ceased, as if cut short. The heat, which seemed to have intensified, was cold, though it was still heat. Through the crack between the windows, two shutters, the only visible tree displayed an exaggeratedly expectant attitude. It had a different kind of green, which infused it with silence. The atmosphere, like a flower, had closed its petals. And in the composition of space itself, a different interrelationship of something like planes had changed and fragmented the way that sounds and lights and colors use space. 242. Even apart from our ordinary dreams, those abominations from the soul's sores that no one would dare confess and that oppress our nights like foul phantoms, grimy bubbles and slime of our repressed sensibility. What ridiculous, frightening, and unspeakable things the soul, with a little effort, can recognize in its corners. The human soul is a madhouse of the grotesque. If a soul were able to reveal itself truthfully, if its shame and modesty didn't run deeper than all its known and named ignominies, then it would be, as it is said of truth, a well, but a sinister well full of murky echoes and inhabited by abhorrent creatures, slimy non-beings, lifeless slugs, the snot of subjectivity. 243. All it would take to make a catalogue of monsters is to photograph in words the things the night brings to drowsy souls unable to sleep. These things have all the incoherence of dreams without the alibi of sleeping. They hover like bats over the soul's passivity, or like vampires that suck the blood of submission. They are larvae from the debris on the hillside, shadows that fill the valley, remnants left by destiny. Sometimes they're worms, loathsome to the very soul that cradles and breeds them. Sometimes they're ghosts that sinisterly skulk around nothing at all. 
Sometimes they pop out as snakes from the absurd hollows of spent emotions. Ballast of falseness. They're useful for nothing but to render us useless. They are doubts from the abyss that drag their cold and slithery bodies across the soul. They hang on as smoke. They leave tracks. And they never amounted to more than the sterile substance of our awareness of them. One or another is like an inner firework, sparking between dreams, and the rest is what our unconscious consciousness saw of them. A dangling, untied ribbon. The soul doesn't exist in and of itself. The great landscapes belong to tomorrow, and we have already lived. The conversation was cut short and fizzled. Who would have thought life would turn out like this? I'm lost if I find myself. I doubt what I discover. I don't have what I've obtained. I sleep as if I were taking a walk, but I'm awake. I wake up as if I'd been sleeping, and I don't belong to me. Life, in its essence, is one big insomnia, and all that we think or do occurs in a lucid stupor. I'd be happy if I could sleep. This is what I think now, because I'm not sleeping. The night is an enormous weight beyond the silent blanket of dreams, under which I smother myself. I have indigestion of the soul. After this is over, morning will come as always, but it will be too late as always. Everything sleeps and is happy except me. I rest a little, without even trying to sleep, and huge heads of non-existent monsters rise in confusion from the depths of who I am. They're oriental dragons from the abyss, with their red tongues hanging outside of logic, and their eyes deadly staring at my lifeless life that doesn't stare back. The lid, for God's sake, the lid. Close the lid on unconsciousness and life. Fortunately, through the open shutters of the cold window, a bleak thread of pale light begins to chase darkness from the horizon. Morning, fortunately, is what's going to break. The disquiet that so wearies me has almost quieted down. A cock crows absurdly in the middle of the city. The wan day begins in my vague slumber. Eventually I'll sleep. The noise of wheels tells me there's a cart. My eyelids sleep, but not I. Everything, finally, is destiny. 244. To be a retired major seems to me ideal. Too bad it's not possible to have eternally been nothing but a retired major. My longing to be whole puts me into this state of useless regret, the tragic futility of life. My curiosity, sister to the Skylarks. The treacherous anxiety of sunsets, the dawn's timid shroud. Let's sit down here. From here we can see more of the sky. The vast expanse of these starry heights is soothing. Life hurts less as we look at them. A whiff of air from an invisible fan refreshes our life-wearied face. 245. The human soul is so inevitably the victim of pain that it suffers the pain of the painful surprise, even with things it should have expected. A man who has always spoken of fickleness and unfaithfulness as perfectly normal behavior in women will feel all the devastation of the sad surprise when he discovers that his sweetheart has been cheating on him, exactly as if he'd always held up female fidelity and constancy as a dogma or a rightful expectation. Another man, convinced that everything is hollow and empty, will feel like he's been struck by lightning when he learns that what he writes is considered worthless, or that his efforts to educate people are in vain, or that it's impossible to communicate his emotion. We need not suppose that those who have experienced these and similar disasters were insincere in what they said or wrote, even if the disasters they suffered were foreseeable in their words. The sincerity of intellectual affirmation has nothing to do with the naturalness of spontaneous emotion. Strangely or not, it seems the soul may be given such surprises merely so that it won't lack pain, 
so that it will still know disgrace, so that it will have its fair share of grief and life. We are all equal in our capacity for error and suffering. Only those who don't feel don't experience pain. And the highest, most notable, and most prudent men are those who experience and suffer precisely what they foresee and what they disdain. This is what is known as life. 246. To see all things that happen to us as accidents or incidents from a novel, which we read not with our eyes, but with life. Only with this attitude can we overcome the mischief of each day and the fickleness of events. 247. The act of life has always struck me as the least comfortable of suicides. To act, in my view, is a cruel and harsh sentence passed on the unjustly condemned dream. To exert influence on the outside world, to change things, to overcome obstacles, to influence people, all of this seems more nebulous to me than the substance of daydreams. Ever since I was a child, the intrinsic futility of all forms of action has been a cherished touchstone for my detachment from everything, including me. To act is to react against oneself. To exert influence is to leave home. I've always pondered how absurd it is that, even when the substance of reality is just a series of sensations, there can be things so complexly simple as businesses, industries, and social and family relationships, so devastatingly unintelligible in light of the soul's inner attitude towards the idea of truth. 248. My abstention from collaborating in the existence of the outside world results in, among other things, a curious psychic phenomenon. Abstaining entirely from action and taking no interest in things, I am able to see the outside world with perfect objectivity. Since nothing interests me or makes me think it should be changed, I don't change it, and thus I am able... 249. Beginning in the mid-18th century, a terrible disease progressively swept over civilization. Seventeen centuries of consistently frustrated Christian aspirations, and five centuries of forever postponed pagan aspirations. Catholicism having failed as Christianity, the Renaissance having failed as paganism, and the Reformation having failed as universal phenomenon. The shipwreck of all that had been dreamed, the paltriness of all that had been achieved, the sadness of living a life too miserable to be shared by others, and other people's lives too miserable for us to want to share. All of this fell over souls and poisoned them. Minds were filled with a horror of all action, which could be contemptible only in a contemptible society. The soul's higher activities languished, only its baser, more organic functions flourished. The former having stagnated, the latter began to govern the world. Thus was born a literature, an art, made of the lower elements of thought, romanticism, and with it a social life made of the lower elements of action, modern democracy. Souls born to rule had no recourse but to abstain. Souls born to create, in a society where creative forces were flagging, had no world to mold to their will besides the social world of their dreams, the introspective sterility of their own soul. We apply the name romantics to both the great men who failed and to the little men who showed themselves for what they were. But the only similarity between the two is in their overt sentimentality, which in the former denotes an inability to make active use of the intelligence, while in the latter it denotes the lack of intelligence itself. A Chateaubriand and a Hugo, a Vigny and a Michelet, are products of the same age, but Chateaubriand is a great soul that was diminished, Hugo a soul that was inflated by the winds of the day. Vigny is a genius that had to flee, Michelet a woman that was forced to be a man of genius. In the father of them all, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the two tendencies coincide. He possessed, in equal measure, the intelligence of a creator and the sensibility of a slave. 
his social sensibility infected his theories, which his intelligence merely set forth with clarity. His intelligence served only to bemoan the tragedy of coexisting with such a sensibility. Rousseau is the modern man, but more complete than any modern man. From the weaknesses that made him fail, he extracted, alas for him and for us, the forces that made him triumph. The part of him that went forward conquered, but when he entered the city, the word defeat could be read at the bottom of his victory banners. And in the part of him that stayed behind, incapable of fighting to conquer, there were crowns and scepters, a ruler's majesty and a conqueror's glory, his legitimate inner destiny. 2. We were born into a world that has suffered from a century and a half of renunciation and violence, the renunciation of superior men and the violence of inferior men, which is their victory. No superior trait can assert itself in the modern age, whether in action or in thought, in the political sphere or in the theoretical sphere. The downfall of aristocratic influence has created an atmosphere of brutality and indifference towards the arts, such that a refined sensibility has nowhere to take refuge. Contact with life is ever more painful for the soul, and all efforts are ever more arduous, because the outer conditions for making an effort are forever more odious. The downfall of classical ideals made all men potential artists, and therefore bad artists. When art depended on solid construction and the careful observance of rules, few could attempt to be artists, and a fair number of these were quite good. But when art, instead of being understood as creation, became merely an expression of feelings, then anyone could be an artist, because everyone has feelings. 250. Even if I wanted to create, the only true art is that of construction. But the present-day milieu makes it impossible for constructive qualities to appear in the human spirit. That's why science developed. Machines are the only things today in which there's construction. Mathematical proofs are the only arguments with a chain of logic. Creativity needs a prop, a crutch of reality. Art is a science. It suffers rhythmically. I can't read, for my hypercritical sensibility notices only flaws, imperfections, things that could be improved. I can't dream, for my dreams are so vivid that I compare them with reality and quickly realize they're unreal, hence without value. I can't enjoy innocently gazing at people and things, for my longing to dig deeper is inexorable. And since my interest can't exist without this longing, it must either die at its hands or wither on its own. I can't be satisfied by metaphysical speculations, for I know all too well, from my own experience, that all systems are defensible and intellectually possible, and to enjoy the intellectual art of constructing systems, I would have to be able to forget that the goal of metaphysical speculation is the search for truth. A happy past, in whose remembrance I would also be happy, with nothing in the present that would cheer or interest me, with no dream or possibility of a future that could be any different from this present or have a past other than this past. Here lies my life, a conscious ghost of a paradise I never knew, a stillborn corpse of my unrealized hopes. Happy those who suffer as unified selves, whom anxiety alters but doesn't divide, who believe at least in unbelief and who can sit in the sun without mental reservations. 251. Fragments of an Autobiography First I was engrossed in metaphysical speculations, then in scientific ideas. Finally I was attracted to sociological concepts. But in none of these stages of my search for truth did I find relief or reassurance. I didn't read much in these various fields, but what I did read was enough to make me weary of so many contradictory theories, all equally based on elaborate rationales, all equally probable and in accord with a selection of the facts that always gave the impression of being all the facts. If I raised my tired eyes from the books, or if I distractedly shifted focus 
from my thoughts to the outside world, I saw only one thing, which plucked one by one all the petals of the notion of effort, convincing me that all reading and thinking are useless. What I saw was the infinite complexity of things, the vast sum, the utter attainability of even those few facts that would be necessary for the formation of a science. I gradually discovered the frustration of discovering nothing. I could find no reason or logic for anything except a skepticism that didn't even seek a self-justifying logic. It never occurred to me to cure myself of this, and indeed, why be cured of it? What would it mean to be healthy? How could I be sure that this attitude meant I was sick? And if I was sick, who's to say that sickness wasn't preferable or more logical or more text is missing than health? If health was preferable, then wasn't I sick due to some natural cause? And if it was natural, why go against nature? Which, for some purpose or other, if it has any purpose, must have wanted me to be sick. I never found convincing arguments for anything other than inertia, and over time I became even more keenly, sullenly aware of my inertia as an abdicator, seeking out modes of inertia, pleading to evade all personal struggle and social responsibility. This is the substance from which I carved the imaginary statue of my existence. I got tired of reading and I stopped arbitrarily pursuing now this, now that, aesthetic mode of life. Of the little I did read, I learned to extract only the elements useful for dreaming. Of the little I saw and heard, I strove to take away only what could be prolonged in me as a distant and distorted reflection. I endeavored to make all my thoughts and all the daily chapters of my experience provide me with nothing but sensations. I gave my life an aesthetic orientation, and I made that aesthetic utterly personal, exclusively my own. The next step in the development of my inner hedonism was to shun all sensibility to things social. I shielded myself against feeling ridiculous. I learned to be insensitive to the appeals of instinct and to the entreaties of. I reduced my contact with others to a minimum. I did my best to lose all attachment to life. In time, I even shed my desire for glory, like a sleepy man who takes off his clothes to go to bed. After studying metaphysics and, text is missing, sciences, I went on to mental occupations that were more threatening to my nervous equilibrium. I spent frightful nights hunched over tomes by mystics and cabalists, which I never had the patience to read except intermittently trembling and the rites and mysteries of the Rosicrucians, the text is missing, symbolism of the Kabbalah, and the Templars. All of this oppressed me for a long time. My feverish days were filled with pernicious speculations based on the demonic logic of metaphysics, magic, alchemy, and I derived a false vital stimulus from the painful and quasi-psychic sensation of being always on the verge of discovering a supreme mystery. I lost myself in the delirious subsystems of metaphysics, systems full of disturbing analogies and pitfalls for lucid thought, vast enigmatic landscapes where glimmers of the supernatural arouse mysteries on the fringes. Sensations aged me. Too much thinking wore me out. My life became a metaphysical fever, always searching for the occult meaning of things, playing with the fire of mysterious analogies, denigrating, bracketed question mark, itself by putting off full lucidity and normal synthesis. I fell into a complex state of mental indiscipline and general indifference. Where did I take refuge? My impression is that I didn't take refuge anywhere. I abandoned myself to I don't know what. I limited and focused my desires to hone and refine them. To reach the infinite, and I believe it can be reached, we need to have a sure port, just one, from which to set out for the indefinite. Today I'm an ascetic in my religion of myself. A cup of coffee, a cigarette, and my dreams 
can substitute quite well for the universe and its stars, for work, love, and even beauty and glory. I need virtually no stimulants. I have opium enough in my soul. What dreams do I have? I don't know. I force myself to reach a point where I'm no longer sure what I think, dream, or envision. I seem to dream ever more remotely, about vague and imprecise things that can't be visualized. I have no memories about life. I don't know or wonder whether it's good or bad. In my eyes, it's harsh and sad, with delightful dreams interspersed here and there. Why should I care what it is for others? Other people's lives are of use to me only in my dreams, where I live the life that seems to suit each one. 252. Thinking is still a form of acting. Only in sheer reverie, where nothing active intervenes, and even our self-awareness gets stuck in the mind. Only there, in this warm and damp state of non-being, can total renunciation of action be achieved. To stop trying to understand, to stop analyzing, to see ourselves as we see nature, to view our impressions as we view a field, that is true wisdom. 253. The Sacred Instinct of Having No Theories 254. More than once, while roaming the streets in a late afternoon, I've been suddenly and violently struck by the bizarre presence of organization in things. It's not so much natural things that arouse this powerful awareness in my soul. It's the layout of the streets, the signs, the people dressed up and talking, their jobs, the newspapers, the logic of it all. Or rather, it's the fact that ordered streets, signs, jobs, people, and society exist, all of them fitting together and going forward and opening up paths. When I take a good look at man, I see that he's as unconscious as a dog or a cat, that he speaks and organizes himself into society through a different kind of unconsciousness, patently inferior to the unconsciousness that guides ants and bees in their social life. And as if a light had turned on, the intelligence that creates and informs the world becomes as clear to me as the existence of organisms, as clear as the existence of logical and invariable physical laws. On these occasions, I always recall the words of I can't remember which scholastic, Deus es anima brutorum, God is the soul of the beasts. This marvelous phrase was the author's way of explaining the certainty with which instincts guide inferior animals, which display no intelligence, or only a primitive outline of one. But are we all inferior animals, and speaking and thinking are merely new instincts, less dependable than the others precisely because they're new? So that the beautifully accurate phrase of the scholastic has a wider application, and I say, God is the soul of everything. I've never understood how anyone who has stopped to consider the tremendous fact of this universal watch mechanism can deny the watchmaker, in whom not even Voltaire disbelieved. I understand why, in light of certain events that have apparently deviated from a plan, and only by knowing the plan could one know if they have deviated from it, someone might attribute an element of imperfection to this supreme intelligence. I understand this, although I don't accept it. And I understand why, in view of the evil that's in the world, one might not acknowledge that the creating intelligence is infinitely good. I understand this, although again, I don't accept it. But to deny the existence of this intelligence, namely God, strikes me as one of those idiocies that sometimes afflict, in one area of their intelligence, men who in all other areas may be superior. Those, for example, who systematically make mistakes in adding and subtracting. Or who, considering now the intelligence that rules aesthetic sensibility, cannot feel music or painting or poetry. I've said that I don't accept the notion of the watchmaker who is imperfect or who isn't benevolent. I reject the notion of the imperfect watchmaker because those aspects of the world's government and organization that seem flawed or nonsensical might prove otherwise if we only knew the plan. While clearly seeing a plan in everything, 
We also see certain things that apparently make no sense. But if there's a reason behind everything, then won't these things be guided by that same reason? Seeing the reason but not the actual plan, how can we say that certain things are outside the plan, when we don't know what it is? Just as a poet of subtle rhythms can insert an arithmetic verse for rhythmic purposes, i.e. for the very purpose he seems to be going against, and a critic who's more linear than rhythmic will say that this verse is mistaken. So the Creator can insert things that our narrow logic considers arithmetic into the majestic flow of his metaphysical rhythm. I admit that this notion of the unbenevolent watchmaker is hard to refute, but only on the surface. One could say that since we don't really know what evil is, we cannot rightfully affirm that something is bad or good. But it's true that a pain, even if it's for our ultimate good, is obviously bad in itself. And this is enough to prove that evil exists in the world. A toothache is enough to make one disbelieve in the goodness of the Creator. The basic error in this argument seems to lie in our complete ignorance of God's plan, and our equal ignorance of what kind of an intelligent person the intellectual infinite might be. The existence of evil is one thing, the reason for its existence is another. The distinction may be subtle, to the point of seeming sophistic, but it is nevertheless valid. The existence of evil cannot be denied, but one can deny that the existence of evil is evil. I admit that the problem persists, but only because our imperfection persists. 255. If there's one thing life grants us for which we should thank the gods, besides thanking them for life itself, it's the gift of not knowing of not knowing ourselves, and of not knowing each other. The human soul is a murky and slimy abyss, a well on the earth's surface that's never used. No one would love himself if he really knew himself, and without the vanity which is born of this ignorance and is the blood of the spiritual life, our souls would die of anemia. No one knows anyone else, and it's just as well, for if he did, he would discover in his very own mother, wife, or son, his inveterate metaphysical enemy. We get along because we're strangers at heart. What would become of so many happy couples if they could see into one another's soul, if they could truly understand one another, as romantics say, without knowing the danger, albeit ultimately inconsequential, of what they're saying? All marriages are flawed because each partner holds inside in a secret corner where the soul belongs to the devil, the wispy image of the desired man who is nothing like the husband, the hazy figure of the sublime woman whom the wife doesn't live up to. The happiest people are unaware of their frustrated inclinations. The less happy are aware but choose to ignore them. And only an occasional jerky movement or brusque remark evokes, on the casual surface of gestures and words, the hidden demon the ancient Eve, the night and the sylph. The life we live is a flexible, fluid misunderstanding, a happy mean between the greatness that doesn't exist and the happiness that can't exist. We are content thanks to our capacity, even as we think and feel, for not believing in the soul's existence. In this masked ball, which is our life, we're satisfied by the agreeable sensation of the costumes, which are all that really count for a ball. We're servants of the lights and colors, moving in the dance as if in the truth, and we're not even aware, unless, remaining alone, we don't dance, of the so cold and lofty night outside, of the mortal body under the tatters that will cultivate it, of all that we privately imagine is essentially us, but is actually just an inner parody of that supposedly true self. All that we do, say, think, or feel, wears the same mask and the same costume. No matter how much we take off what we wear, we'll never reach nakedness, which is a phenomenon of the soul and not of removing clothes. And so, dressed in a body and soul, with our multiple costumes stuck to us like feathers on a bird, we live happily or unhappily, or without knowing how we live. This brief time given us by the gods that we might amuse them, 
like children who play at serious games. One or another man, liberated or cursed, suddenly sees, but even this man sees rarely, that all we are is what we aren't. That we fool ourselves about what's true and are wrong about what we conclude is right. And this man, who in a flash sees the universe naked, creates a philosophy or dreams up a religion, and the philosophy spreads and the religion propagates. And those who believe in the philosophy begin to wear it as a suit they don't see, and those who believe in the religion put it on as a mask they soon forget. Knowing neither ourselves nor each other, and therefore cheerfully getting along, we keep twirling around in the dance and chatting during the intervals, human, futile, and in earnest, to the sound of the great orchestra of the stars, under the aloof and disdainful gaze of the show's organizers. Only they know that we're the prey of the illusion they created for us. But what's the reason for this illusion? And why is there this or any illusion? And why did they, likewise deluded, give us the illusion they gave us? This, undoubtedly, not even they know. 256 I've always felt an almost physical loathing for secret things. Intrigues, diplomacy, secret societies, occult sciences. What especially irks me are these last two things. The pretension certain men have that, through their understandings with gods or masters or demiurges, they and they alone know the great secrets on which the world is founded. I can't believe their claims, though I can believe someone else might. But is there any reason why all these people might not be crazy or deluded? The fact there are a lot of them proves nothing, for there are collective hallucinations. What really shocks me is how these wizards and masters of the invisible, when they write to communicate or intimate their mysteries, all write abominably. It offends my intelligence that a man can master the devil without being able to master his native tongue. Why would dealing with demons be easier than dealing with grammar? If through long exercises of concentration and willpower one can have so-called astral visions, why can't the same person, applying considerably less concentration and willpower, have a vision of syntax? What is there in the teachings and rituals of the magic arts that prevents their adherence from writing, I won't say with clarity, since obscurity may be part of the occult law, but at least with elegance and fluency, which can exist in the sphere of the abstruse? Why should all the soul's energy be spent studying the language of the gods, without a pittance left over to study the color and rhythm of the language of men. I don't trust masters who can't be down to earth. For me, they're like those eccentric poets who can't write like everybody else. I accept they're eccentric, but I'd like them to show me that it's because they're superior to the norm rather than incapable of it. There are supposedly great mathematicians who make errors in simple addition, but what I'm talking about here is ignorance, not error. I accept that a great mathematician can add two and two and get five. It can happen to anyone in a moment of distraction. What I don't accept is that he not know what addition is or how it's done. And this is the case of the overwhelming majority of occult masters. 257. Thought can be lofty without being elegant but to the extent that it lacks elegance, it will have less effect on others. Force without finesse is mere mass. 258. To have touched the feet of Christ is no excuse for mistakes in punctuation. If a man writes well only when he's drunk, then I'll tell him, get drunk. And if he says that it's bad for his liver, I'll answer, what's your liver? A dead thing that lives while you live? Whereas the poems you write live without while. 259. I enjoy speaking. Or rather, I enjoy wording. Words for me are tangible bodies, visible sirens, incarnate sensualities. Perhaps because real sensuality doesn't interest me in the least. 
not even intellectually or in my dreams. Desire in me metamorphosed into the aptitude for creating verbal rhythms and for noting them in the speech of others. I tremble when someone speaks well. Certain pages from Fialio and from Chateaubriand make my whole being tingle in all of its pores, make me rave in a still shiver with impossible pleasure. Even certain pages of Vieira, in the cold perfection of their syntactical engineering, make me quiver like a branch in the wind, with the passive delirium of something shaken. Like all who are impassioned, I take blissful delight in losing myself, in fully experiencing the thrill of surrender. And so I often write with no desire to think, in an externalized reverie, letting the words cuddle me like a baby in their arms. They form sentences with no meaning, flowing softly like water I can feel, a forgetful stream whose ripples mingle and undefine, becoming other, becoming other, still other ripples, and still again other. Thus ideas and images, throbbing with expressiveness, pass through me in resounding processions of pale silks on which imagination shimmers like moonlight, dappled and indefinite. I weep over nothing that life brings or takes away, but there are pages of prose that have made me cry. I remember, as clearly as what's before my eyes, the night when as a child I read for the first time, in an anthology, Vieta's famous passage on King Solomon, Solomon built a palace, and I read all the way to the end, trembling and confused. Then I broke into joyful tears, tears such as no real joy could make me cry, nor any of life's sorrows ever make me shed. That hieratic movement of our clear majestic language, that expression of ideas in inevitable words, like water that flows because there's a slope, that vocalic marvel in which the sounds are ideal colors, all of this instinctively seized me like an overwhelming political emotion, and I cried. Remembering it today, I still cry. Not out of nostalgia for my childhood, which I don't miss, but because of nostalgia for the emotion of that moment, because of a heartfelt regret that I can no longer read for the first time that great symphonic certitude. I have no social or political sentiments, and yet there is a way in which I am highly nationalistic. My nation is the Portuguese language. It wouldn't trouble me at all if Portugal were invaded or occupied, as long as I was left in peace. But I hate with genuine hatred, with the only hatred I feel, not those who write bad Portuguese, not those whose syntax is faulty, not those who used phonetic rather than etymological spelling, but the badly written page itself, as if it were a person. Incorrect syntax, as someone who ought to be flogged. The substitution of I for Y as the spit that directly disgusts me, independent of who spat it. Yes, because spelling is also a person. The word is complete when seen and heard and the pageantry of Greco-Roman transliteration dresses it for me in its authentic royal robe, making it a lady and a queen. 260. Art consists in making others feel what we feel, in freeing them from themselves by offering them our own personality. The true substance of whatever I feel is absolutely incommunicable. And the more profoundly I feel it, the more incommunicable it is. In order to convey to someone else what I feel, I must translate my feelings into his language, saying things, that is, as if they were what I feel, so that he, reading them, will feel exactly what I felt. And since this someone is presumed by art to be not this or that person, but everyone, i.e. that person common to all persons, what I must finally do is convert my feelings into a typical human feeling, even if it means perverting the true nature of what I felt. Abstract things are hard to understand because they don't easily command the reader's attention, so I'll use a simple example to make my abstractions concrete. Let's suppose that, for some reason or other, which might be that I'm tired of keeping the books or bored because I have nothing to do, 
I'm overwhelmed by a vague sadness about life, an inner anxiety that makes me nervous and uneasy. If I try to translate this emotion with close-fitting words, then the closer the fit, the more they'll represent my own personal feelings, and so the less they'll communicate it to others. And if there is no communicating it to others, it would be wiser and simpler to feel it without writing it. But let's suppose that I want to communicate it to others, to make it into art, that is, since art is the communication to others of the identity we feel with them, without which there would be no communication and no need for it. I search for the ordinary human emotion that will have the coloring, spirit, and shape of the emotion I'm feeling right now for the inhumane, personal reason of being a weary bookkeeper or a bored Lisboan. And I conclude that the ordinary emotion, which in ordinary souls has the same characteristics as my emotion, is nostalgia for one's lost childhood. Now I have the key to the door of my theme. I write and weep about my lost childhood, going into poignant details about the people and furniture of our old house in the country. I recall the joy of having no rights or responsibilities, of being free because I still didn't know how to think or feel. And this recollection, if it's well written and visually effective, will arouse in my reader exactly the same emotion I was feeling, which had nothing to do with childhood. I've lied? No, I've understood. That lying, except for the childish and spontaneous kind that comes from wanting to be dreaming, is merely the recognition of other people's real existence and of the need to conform that existence to our own, which cannot be conformed to theirs. Lying is simply the soul's ideal language. Just as we make use of words, which are sounds articulated in an absurd way, to translate into real language the most private and subtle shifts of our thoughts and emotions, which words on their own would never be able to translate, so we make use of lies and fiction to promote understanding among ourselves, something that the truth, personal and incommunicable, could never accomplish. Art lies because it is social, and there are two great forms of art, one that speaks to our deepest soul, the other to our attentive soul. The first is poetry, the second is the novel. The first begins to lie in its very structure, the second in its very intention. One purports to give us the truth through lines that keep strict meters, thus lying against the nature of speech. And the other purports to give us the truth by means of a reality that we all know never existed. To feign is to love. Whenever I see a pretty smile or a meaningful gaze, no matter whom the smile or gaze belongs to, I always plumb to the soul of the smiling or gazing face to discover what politician wants to buy our vote, or what prostitute wants us to buy her. But the politician that buys us loved at least the act of buying us, even as the prostitute loved being bought by us. Like it or not, we cannot escape universal brotherhood. We all love each other, and the lie is the kiss we exchange. 261 in me, all affections take place on the surface, but sincerely. I've always been an actor, and in earnest. Whenever I've loved, I've pretended to love, pretending it even to myself. 262. Today I was struck by an absurd but valid sensation. I realized in an inner flash that I'm no one. Absolutely no one. In a flash, what I'd supposed was a city proved to be a barren plain, and the sinister light that showed me myself revealed no sky above. Before the world existed, I was deprived of the power to be. If I was reincarnated, it was without myself, without my I. I'm the suburbs of a non-existent town, the long-winded commentary of a book never written. I'm no one, no one at all. I don't know how to feel, how to think, how to want. I'm the character of an unwritten novel, waiting in the air, dispersed without ever having been, among the dreams of someone who didn't know how to complete me. I always think, I always feel, 
but there's no logic in my thought, no emotions in my emotion. I'm falling from the trap door on high through all of infinite space in an aimless, infinitudinous, empty descent. My soul is a black whirlpool, a vast vertigo circling a void, the racing of an infinite ocean around a hole in nothing. And in these waters, which are more a churning than actual waters, float the images of all I've seen and heard in the world. Houses, faces, books, boxes, snatches of music and syllables of voices, all moving in a sinister and bottomless swirl. And amid all this confusion, I, what's truly I, am the center that exists only in the geometry of the abyss. I'm the nothing around which everything spins, existing only so that it can spin, being a center only because every circle has one. I, what's truly I, am a well without walls, but with the wall's viscosity, the center of everything with nothing around it. It's not demons who at least have a human face, but hell itself that seems to be laughing inside me. It's the croaking madness of the dead universe, the spinning cadaver of a physical space, the end of all worlds blowing blackly in the wind, formless and timeless, without a god who created it, without even its own self, impossibly whirling in the absolute darkness as the one and only reality, everything. If only I knew how to think, if only I knew how to feel. My mother died too soon for me ever to know her. 263. As prone as I am to tedium, it's odd that until now I've never seriously thought about just what it is. Today my soul is in that state of limbo where neither life nor anything else really appeals. And I've decided, since I've never done it before, to analyze tedium through my impressionistic thoughts, even though whatever analysis I dream up will naturally be somewhat factitious. I don't know if tedium is merely the waking equivalent of a vagrant's drowsy stupor, or if it is something more noble. In my own experience, tedium occurs frequently but unpredictably, without following a set pattern. I can go an entire listless Sunday without tedium, or I can suddenly experience it like a cloud overhead, in the middle of concentrated labor. As far as I can tell, it isn't related to my state of health, or lack thereof, nor does it result from causes residing in my visible, tangible self. To say that it's a metaphysical anxiety in disguise, that it's an acute disillusion incognito, that it's a voiceless poetry of the bored soul sitting at the window which looks out onto life. To say this or something similar can color tedium, like a child who colors over the outlines of a figure and effaces them. But it's no more to me than a din of words echoing in the cellar of the mind. Tedium. To think without thinking, but with the weariness of thinking. To feel without feeling, but with the anxiety of feeling. To shun without shunning, but with the disgust that makes one shun. All of this is in tedium, but is not tedium itself, being at best a paraphrase or translation of it. In terms of our immediate sensation, it's as if the drawbridge had been raised over the moat of the soul's castle, such that we can only gaze at the lands around the castle, without ever being able to set foot on them. There's something in us that isolates us from ourselves, and the separating element is as stagnant as we are a ditch of filthy water around our self-alienation. Tedium. To suffer without suffering. To want without desire. To think without reason. It's like being possessed by a negative demon. Like being bewitched by nothing at all. Wizards and witches, by making images of us and subjecting them to torments, can supposedly cause those torments to be reflected in us through an astral transference. Transposing this image, I'd say that my tedium is like the fiendish reflection of an elfin demon's sorceries, applied not to my image but to its shadow. It's on my internal shadow, on the outside of my inner soul, that papers are pasted or needles are poked. I'm like the man who sold his shadow, 
or rather, like the shadow that was sold. Tedium. I work hard. I fulfill what the moralists of action would say is my social duty. I fulfill that duty, or fate, without too much effort and without gross incompetence. But sometimes, right in the middle of my work, or in the middle of the rest, which, according to the same moralists, I deserve and ought to enjoy, my soul overflows with a bitter inertia, and I'm tired, not of working or of resting, but of me. Why of me, if I wasn't thinking about myself? Of what other thing, if I wasn't thinking about anything? The mystery of the universe that descends on my bookkeeping, or on my repose. The universal sorrow of living, which is suddenly particularized in my soul-turned medium. Why so ennoble someone whose identity isn't even certain? It's a sensation of emptiness, a hunger without appetite, as noble as the sensations that come to our physical brain and stomach when we smoke too much or suffer from indigestion. Tedium. Perhaps deep down, it is the soul's dissatisfaction because we didn't give it a belief. The disappointment of the sad child, who we are on the inside because we didn't buy it the divine toy. Perhaps it is the insecurity of one who needs a guiding hand and who doesn't feel, on the black path of profound sensation, anything more than the soundless night of not being able to think, the empty road of not being able to feel. Tedium. Those who have gods don't have tedium. Tedium is the lack of a mythology. For people without beliefs, even doubt is impossible. Even their skepticism will lack the strength to question. Yes, tedium is the loss of the soul's capacity for self-delusion. It is the mind's lack of the non-existent ladder by which it might firmly ascend to truth. 264. I know, by analogy, what it means to overeat. I know it through my sensations, not my stomach. There are days when they've eaten too much, and my body gets heavy, my gestures are clumsy, and I don't feel like moving a muscle. On these occasions, like a thorn in the side, a vestige of my vanished imagination nearly always emerges from out of my undisturbed torpor. And I make plans founded on ignorance. I raise edifices based on hypotheses and I'm dazzled by what's bound to never happen. At these strange times, my moral as well as material life are mere appendages to who I am. I forget not only about the notion of duty, but also about the idea of being, and I feel physically tired of the whole universe. I sleep what I know and what I dream with an equal intensity that makes my eyes sore. Yes, at these times, I know more about myself than I've ever known. And I'm every snooze of every beggar lying under the trees on the estate of nobody. 265. The idea of traveling seduces me vicariously, as if it were the perfect idea for seducing someone I'm not. All the world's vast panorama traverses my alert imagination like a colorful tedium. I trace a desire as one who's tired of making gestures, and the anticipated weariness of potential landscapes scourges the flower of my drooping heart like a harsh wind. And as with journeys, so with books, and as with books, so with everything. I dream of an erudite life in the quiet company of the ancients and the moderns, a life in which I would renew my emotions via the emotions of others and fill myself with contradictory thoughts based on the contradiction between the meditators and those who almost thought, and who are the majority of writers. But the very idea of reading vanishes as soon as I pick up a book from the table. The physical act of reading abolishes all desire to read. In the same way, the idea of traveling withers if I happen to go near a platform or port of departure and I return to the two worthless things that I, likewise worthless, am certain of, my daily life as an inconspicuous passerby, and the waking insomnia of my dreams. And as with books, so with everything. 
As soon as something occurs to me that might interrupt the silent procession of my days, I lift my eyes with heavy protest towards the sylph who belongs to me and who, poor thing, might have been a siren had she only learned to sing. 266. When I first came to Lisbon, I used to hear, from the apartment above ours, the sound of scales played on a piano, the monotonous practicing of a girl I never actually saw. Today I realize that in the cellar of my soul, by some mysterious process of infiltration, those scales persist, audible if the door below is opened, played over and over by the girl who is now someone else, a grown woman, or dead and enclosed in a white place where verdant cypresses blackly wave. I'm no longer the child I was back then, but the sound of the playing is the same in my memory as it was in reality so that whenever it gets up from where it pretends to be sleeping, it has the same slow finger work, the same rhythmic monotony. When I feel or think about it, I'm overwhelmed by a vague and ancient sadness that's my own. I don't mourn the loss of my childhood. I mourn because everything, including my childhood, is lost. It's not the concrete passing of my own days, but the abstract light of time that torments my physical brain with the relentless repetition of the piano scales from upstairs, terribly anonymous and far away. It's the huge mystery of nothing lasting which incessantly hammers things that aren't really music, just nostalgia, in the absurd depths of my memory. I summon up, insensibly, the vision of the sitting room that I never saw, where the pupil I never met is still playing today finger by careful finger, the forever identical scales of what's already dead. I see, I see more and more, I reconstruct by seeing, and the entire household of the upstairs apartment, for which today I feel a nostalgia I didn't feel yesterday, is fictitiously constructed in my uncertain contemplation. I suspect, however, that all of this is vicarious that the nostalgia I feel isn't truly mine or truly abstract, but is the emotion intercepted from an unidentified third party, for whom these emotions, which in me are literary, are, as Vieta would say, literal. Conjectured feelings are what grieve and torment me, and the nostalgia that makes my eyes well with tears is conceived and felt through imagination and projection, and with a relentlessness that comes from the world's depths, with a persistence that strikes the keys metaphysically. The scales of a piano student keep playing over and over, up and down the physical backbone of my memory. It's the old streets with other people, the same streets that today are different. It's dead people speaking to me through the transparency of their absence. It's remorse for what I did or didn't do. It's the rippling of streams in the night, Noises from below in the quiet building. I feel like screaming inside my head. I want to stop, to break, to smash the impossible phonograph record that keeps playing inside me, where it doesn't belong, an intangible torture. I want my soul, a vehicle taken over by others, to let me off and go on without me. I'm going crazy from having to hear. And in the end, it is I, in my odiously impressionable brain, in my thin skin, in my hypersensitive nerves, who am the keys played in the scale. O oh, horrible and personal piano of our memory! And always, always, as if in a part of my brain that had become autonomous, the scales play, 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 below me and above me, in the first building I lived in when I came to Lisbon. 267. It's the last death of Captain Nemo. Soon I too will die. All of my childhood was deprived, in that moment, of any possibility of enduring. 268. Smell is a strange way of seeing. It evokes sentimental scenes, sketched all of a sudden by the subconscious. I've often experienced this. I'm walking down a street. I see nothing. 
Or rather, I look all around and see the way everyone sees. I know I'm walking down a street and don't know that it exists with two sides comprised of variously shaped buildings made by human hands. I'm walking down a street. The smell of bread from a bakery nauseates me with its sweetness, and my childhood rises up from a distant neighborhood, and another bakery emerges from that fairyland, which is everything we ever had that has died. I'm walking down a street. Suddenly I smell the fruit on the slanted rack of a small grocery. In my short life in the country, I can't say from when or where, has trees in the background, and peace in what only can be my childhood heart. I'm walking down a street. I'm unexpectedly thrown off balance by the smell of crates from the crate makers. My dear Sasadio, you appear before me, and at last I'm happy, for I've returned by way of memory to the only truth, which is literature. 269. One of my life's greatest tragedies is to have already read the Pickwick Papers. I can't go back and read them for the first time. 270. Art frees us, albeit illusory, from the squalor of being. While feeling the wrongs and sufferings endured by Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, we don't feel our own, which are vile because they're ours, and vile because they're vile. Love, sleep, drugs, and intoxicants are elementary forms of art, or rather, of producing the same effect as art. But love, sleep, and drugs all have their disillusion. Love wearies or disappoints. We wake up from sleep, and while sleeping we haven't lived. And we pay for drugs with the ruin of the very body they serve to stimulate. But in art there is no disillusion, since illusion is accepted from the start. There's no waking up from art, because we dream but don't sleep in it. Nor do we pay a tax or penalty for having enjoyed art. Since the pleasure we get from art is in a sense not our own, we don't have to pay for it or regret it later. By art I mean everything that delights us without being ours. The trail left by what has passed, a smile given to someone else, a sunset, a poem, the objective universe. To possess is to lose. To feel without possessing is to preserve and keep, for it is to extract from things their essence. 271. It's not love but love's outskirts that are worth knowing. The repression of love sheds much more light on its nature than does the actual experience of it. Virginity can be a key to profound understanding. Action has its rewards, but brings confusion. To possess is to be possessed, and therefore to lose oneself. Only the idea can fathom reality without getting ruined. 272. Christ is a form of emotion. In the pantheon, there's room for all the gods that mutually exclude each other. All have their throne and their sovereignty. Each one can be everything. For here there are no limits, not even logical ones, and the mingling of various immortals allows us to enjoy the coexistence of diverse infinities and assorted eternities. 273. Nothing is ever sure in history. There are periods of order when everything is contemptible and periods of disorder in which all is lofty. Decadent eras abound in mental vitality, mighty eras in intellectual weakness. Everything mixes and crisscrosses, and truth exists only in so far as it is presumed. So many noble ideas fallen into the dung heap, so many heartfelt desires lost in the torrent. Gods and men, they're all the same to me in the rampant confusion of unpredictable fate. They march through my dreams in this anonymous fourth-floor room, and they're no more to me than they were to those who believed in them. Idols of leery, wide-eyed Africans, animal deities of hinterland savages, the Egyptians' personified symbols, luminous Greek divinities, stiff Roman gods. 
Midras, Lord of the Sun and of Emotion. Jesus, Lord of Consequences and Charity. Various versions of the same Christ. New holy gods of new towns. All of them make up the funeral march, be it a pilgrimage or burial, of error and disillusion. They all march, and behind them march the dreams that are just empty shadows cast on the ground, but that the worst dreamers suppose are firmly planted there. Pathetic concepts without a body or soul. Liberty, humanity, happiness, a better future, social science. Moving forward in the solitude of darkness, like leaves dragged along by the train of a royal robe stolen by beggars. 274. Revolutionaries make a crass and grievous error when they distinguish between the bourgeoisie and the masses, the nobility and the common people, the ruling and the ruled. The only distinction is between those who adapt and those who don't. The rest is literature, and bad literature. The beggar, if he adapts, can become king tomorrow, though in doing so he'll forfeit the virtue of being a beggar. He'll have crossed the border, losing his nationality. These thoughts console me in this cramped office, whose grimy windows overlook a joyless street. These thoughts console me, and for company I have my fellow creators of the world's consciousness, the reckless playwright William Shakespeare, John Milton the schoolteacher, Dante Alighieri the tramp, and even, if the reference be permitted, Jesus Christ, who is nothing in the world, his very existence being doubted by history. Quite a different class of men is formed by the likes of the state councillor Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, the senator Victor Hugo, the chief of state Lenin, the chief of state Mussolini. Those of us in the shade, among the delivery boys and the barbers, constitute humanity. On the one hand, there are the kings with their prestige, the emperors with their glory, the geniuses with their aura, the saints with their halos, the leaders with their supremacy, the prostitutes, the prophets, and the rich. On the other hand, there's us, the delivery boy on the corner, the reckless playwright William Shakespeare, the barber with his jokes, John Milton the schoolteacher, the shop assistant, Dante Alighieri the tramp, those whom death forgets or consecrates, and whom life forgot without ever consecrating. 275. Government of the world begins in us. It's not the sincere who govern the world, but neither is it the insincere. It's those who create in themselves a real sincerity by artificial and automatic means. This sincerity is what makes them strong, and it outshines the less false sincerity of others. To be adept at deluding oneself is the first prerequisite for a statesman. Only poets and philosophers see the world as it really is, for only to them is it given to life without illusions. To see clearly is to not act. 276. An opinion is a vulgarity, even if it's not sincere. Every instance of sincerity is an intolerance. There are no sincere liberal minds. There are, for that matter, no liberal minds. 277. There everything is feeble, anonymous, and gratuitous. There I saw great demonstrations of compassion, which seemed to reveal the depths of tragically sad souls. But I discovered that the demonstrations lasted no longer than the moment in which they were words, and that they originated, how often I observed this with the discernment of the silent, in something analogous to pity lost just as swiftly as the novelty of the observation, or else in the wine of the compassionate soul's dinner. There was always a direct relationship between the humanitarian sentiments expressed and the amount of brandy consumed, and many a great gesture suffered from one glass too many, or from a pleonistic thirst. All of these individuals had sold their souls to a devil from hell's riffraff, a devil that craves sordidness and idleness. They lived drunken lives of vanity and sloth, 
and limply died in the cushions of words, in a morass of scorpions whose venom is mere drool. The most extraordinary thing about all these people was their complete and unanimous lack of importance, in every sense of the word. Some wrote for the major newspapers and succeeded in not existing. Others figured prominently in the professional register and succeeded in doing nothing in life. Others were even poets of renown, but one in the same ashen dust paled their foolish faces, and they were all a graveyard of embalmed stiffs, positioned with their hands on their hips in postures of living. From the short time that I stagnated in that exile of mental cleverness, I've retained the memory of a few good and genuinely amusing moments, of many dull and unhappy moments, of several profiles standing out from the nothingness, of some gestures directed at whatever waitress happened to be on duty, in short, a physically nauseating tedium and the remembrance of a funny joke or two. Interspersed among them, like blank spaces, there were a few older men, who with their outmoded witticisms would backbite like the others, and about the same people. I've never felt so much sympathy for the minor figures of public glory as when I saw them vilified by these minor men who grudge them their petty glory. I understood then why the pariahs of greatness are able to triumph, because they triumph in relation to these men and not in relation to humanity. Poor devils with their insatiable hunger, either hungry for lunch, hungry for fame, or hungry for life's desserts. Anyone who hears them for the first time will imagine he's listening to Napoleon's tutors and Shakespeare's teachers. Some triumph in love, some triumph in politics, and some triumph in art. The first group has the advantage of storytelling, since one can be highly successful in love without there being public knowledge of what happened. Of course, on hearing one of these men recount his sexual marathons, we begin to have our doubts after about the seventh conquest. Those who are the lovers of aristocratic or well-known ladies, and it seems to be the case for nearly all of them, ravage so many countesses that a tally of their conquests would shatter the gravity and composure of even the great-grandmothers of young women with titties. Some specialize in physical conflict, killing the boxing champions of Europe in nocturnal revelries on the street corners of Chiado. Others have influence over the ministers of all the ministries, and these are the ones whose claims are at least plausible. Some are terrible sadists, others are inveterate pederists, and still others confess in a loud, sad voice that they're brutal with women, having brought them along life's past by the whip. They always let someone else pay for their coffee. Some are poets, some are... I know no better antidote for the torrent of shadows than direct acquaintance with common human life. In its commercial reality, for instance, as exhibited on the Rua dos Torredores. With what relief I used to return from the madhouse of puppets to the real presence of Moriera, my supervisor, a genuine, competent bookkeeper, badly dressed and out of shape, but at any rate a man, something none of the others have succeeded in being. 278. Most men spontaneously live a fictitious and alien life. Most people are other people, said Oscar Wilde, and he was right. Some spend their lives in pursuit of something they don't want. Others pursue something they want that's useless to them. Still others lose themselves. But most men are happy and enjoy life for no reason. Man usually doesn't weep much, and when he complains, that's his literature. Pessimism isn't viable as a democratic formula. Those who lament the world's woes are isolated. They lament only their own. A Leopardi or an Antero de Cuenta doesn't have a sweetheart? Then the universe is a torment. A Vignet feels he's inadequately loved? The world is a prison. A Chateaubriand dreams the impossible? Human life is tedious. A Job is covered with boils? Earth is covered with boils. P. 
People step on some sad fellow's corns. Alas for his feet, the suns and the stars. Indifferent to all this, humanity keeps on eating and living, weeping over only what it must weep, and for as short a time as possible. Over the death of a son, for instance, who is soon forgotten except on his birthday, or over the loss of money, which only causes weeping until more money comes along, or one gets used to the loss. The will to live recovers and carries on. The dead are buried. Our losses are forgotten. 279. He left today for his hometown, apparently for good. I mean the so-called office boy. The same man I'd come to regard as part of this human corporation, and therefore as part of me and my world. He left today. In the corridor, casually running into each other for the expected surprise of our farewell, he timidly returned my embrace. And I had enough self-control not to cry, as in my heart, independent of me, my ardent eyes wanted. Whatever has been ours, because it was ours, even if only as a casual presence in our daily routine, or in what we see, becomes part of us. The man who left today for a Galician town I've never heard of was not, for me, the office boy. He was a vital part, because visible and human, of the substance of my life. Today I was diminished. I'm not quite the same. The office boy left today. Everything that happens where we live happens in us. Everything that ceases in what we see ceases in us. Everything that has been, if we saw it when it was, was taken from us when it went away. The office boy left today. Wearier, older, and less willing, I sit down at the high desk and continue working from where I left off yesterday. But today's vague tragedy, stirring thoughts I have to dominate by force, interrupts the automatic process of good bookkeeping. The only way I'm able to work is through an active inertia, as my own slave. The office boy left today. Yes, tomorrow or another day, or whenever the bell will soundlessly toll my death or departure, I'll also be one who's no longer here. An old copier stowed away in the cabinet under the stairs. Yes, tomorrow, or when fate decides, the one in me who pretended to be I will come to an end. Will I go to my hometown? I don't know where I'll go. Today the tragedy is visible because of an absence, considerable because it doesn't deserve consideration. My God, my God, the office boy left today. 280. O oh, night in which the stars feign light. O oh, night that alone is the size of the universe. Make me, body and soul, part of your body, so that, being mere darkness, I'll lose myself and become night as well, without any dreams as stars within me, nor a hoped-for sun shining with the future. 281. First it's a sound that makes another sound in the nocturnal hollow of things. Then it's a low howl, accompanied by the creaking of the street's swaying signboards. And then the voice of space becomes a shout, a roar, and everything shudders. Nothing sways, and there's silence in the dread of all this, like a speechless dread that sees another dread when the first one has passed. Then there's nothing but wind, just wind, and I sleepily notice how the doors shake in their frames and how the glass in the windows loudly resists. I don't sleep. I inter-exist. A few vestiges of consciousness persist. I feel the weight of slumber, but not of unconsciousness. I don't exist. The wind. I wake up and go back to sleep without yet having slept. There's a landscape of loud and indistinct sound beyond which I'm a stranger to myself. I cautiously delight in the possibility of sleeping. I really do sleep, but don't know if I'm sleeping. In what seems to me like a slumber, there is always a sound of the end of all things, the wind in the darkness, and, if I listen closely, the sound of my own lungs and heart.
282. After the last stars whitened into nothing in the morning sky, and the breeze turned less cold in the orange-yellow of the light falling over several low-lying clouds, I finally succeeded in dragging my body, exhausted from nothing, out of the bed where I had sleeplessly pondered the universe. I walked to the window with eyes that were burning from having stayed open all night. The light reflected off the crowded rooftops in various shades of pale yellow. I contemplated everything with the grand stupidity that comes from not sleeping. The yellow was wispy and insignificant against the hulking figures of the tall buildings. Far off in the west, the direction I was facing, the horizon was already a greenish-white. I know that today will oppress me as when I can't grasp a thing. I know that everything I do today will be marked not by weariness from the sleep I didn't have, but by the insomnia I did have. I know that my existence will feel even more like sleepwalking than usual, not just because I haven't slept, but because I couldn't sleep. There are days that are philosophies, that suggest interpretations of life, that are marginal notes full of critical observations in the book of our universal destiny. This seems to be one of those days. I have the ludicrous impression that it is my heavy eyes and my empty brain that trace, like an absurd pencil, the letters of my profound and useless commentary. 283. Freedom is the possibility of isolation. You are free if you can withdraw from people, not having to seek them out for the sake of money, company, love, glory, or curiosity, none of which can thrive in silence and solitude. If you can't live alone, you were born a slave. You may have all the splendors of the mind and the soul, in which case you're a noble slave or an intelligent servant, but you're not free. And you can't hold this up as your own tragedy, for your birth is a tragedy of fate alone. Hapless you are, however, if life itself so oppresses you that you're forced to become a slave. Hapless you are if, having been born free, with the capacity to be isolated and self-sufficient, Poverty should force you to live with others. This tragedy, yes, is your own, and it follows you. To be born free is the greatest splendor of man, making the humble hermit superior to kings and even to the gods, who are self-sufficient by their power, but not by their contempt of it. Death is a liberation, because to die is to need no one. In death, the wretched slave is forcibly set free from his pleasures, from his sufferings, from his coveted and ongoing life. The king is freed of the domains he didn't want to give up. Women who spread love are freed of the triumphs they cherish. Men who conquered are free of the victories for which their lives were predestined. Death ennobles, dressing our poor ridiculous bodies in finery they have never known. In death a man is free, even if he didn't want freedom. In death he's no longer a slave, even if he wept on giving up his slavery. Like a king whose greatest glory is his kingly title, and who as a man may be laughable but as a king is superior, so the dead man may be horribly deformed but is still superior, because death is freedom. Tired, I close the shutters of my windows, I exclude the world, and I have a few moments of freedom. Tomorrow I'll go back to being a slave, but right now, alone, needing no one, and worried only that some voice or presence might disturb me, I have my little freedom, my moment of exorcis. Leaning back in my chair, I forget the life that oppresses me. Nothing pains me besides having felt pain. 284. Let's not even touch life with the tips of our fingers. Let's not even love in our minds. May we never know the feel of a woman's kiss, not even in our dreams. Artisans of morbidity, let us excel in teaching others how to cast off all illusions. Spectators of life, let us peer over all walls with the pre-weariness of knowing that we'll see nothing new or beautiful. Weavers of despair, 
Let us weave only shrouds, white shrouds for the dreams we never dreamed, black shrouds for the days that we died, gray shrouds for the gestures we merely dreamed, and royal purple shrouds for our useless sensations. On the hills and in the valleys and along the swampy shores, hunters hunt wolves, deer, and wild ducks. Let us hate them, not because they kill, but because they enjoy themselves and we don't. May our facial expression consist of a wan smile, like that of someone who's about to cry, a faraway gaze, like that of someone who doesn't want to see, and a disdain in all its features, as when someone despises life and lives only to despise it. And may our disdain be for those who work and struggle, and our hatred for those who hope and trust. 285. I'm almost convinced that I'm never awake. I'm not sure if I'm not in fact dreaming when I live, and living when I dream, or if dreaming and living are for me intersected, intermingled things that together form my conscious self. Sometimes when I'm actively engaged in life and have as clear a notion of myself as the next man, my mind is beset by a strange feeling of doubt. I begin to wonder if I exist if I might not be someone else's dream. I can imagine, with an almost carnal vividness, that I might be the character of a novel, moving within the reality constructed by a complex narrative, in the long waves of its style. I've often noticed that certain fictional characters assume a prominence never attained by the friends and acquaintances who talk and listen to us in visible, real life. And this makes me fantasize about whether everything in the sum total of the world might not be an interconnected series of dreams and novels, like little boxes inside larger boxes that are inside yet larger ones, everything being a story made up of stories, like a thousand and one nights, unreality taking place in the never-ending night. If I think, everything seems absurd to me. If I feel, everything seems strange. If I want, it's something in me that does the wanting. Whenever there's action in me, I'm sure I wasn't responsible for it. If I dream, it seems I'm being written. If I feel, it seems I'm being painted. If I want, it seems I've been placed in a vehicle, like freight to be delivered, and that I continue with a movement I imagine is my own towards a destination I don't want until I get there. How confusing it all is. How much better it is to see rather than think. To read rather than write. What I see may deceive me, but I don't consider it mine. What I read may distress me, but I don't have to feel bad for having written it. How painful everything is when we think of it as conscious thinkers, as contemplative beings whose consciousness has reached that second stage by which we know that we know. Although the day is gorgeous, I can't help but think this way. To think or to feel. Or what third thing among the stage sets in the back? Tedium of twilight and disarray. Shut fans. Weariness from having had to live. 286. We walked, still young, beneath the fall trees in the forest's soft rustling. The moonlight made pawns out of the clearings that sprang into view along our aimless path, and their branch-tangled shores were more night than night itself. The breeze of woodland sighed among the trees. We talked about impossible things, and our voices were part of the night, the moon, and the forest. We heard them as if they belonged to others. The obscure forest wasn't entirely pathless. Our steps wended along trails that we instinctively knew, among dappling shadows and streaks of cold, hard moonlight. We talked about impossible things, and the whole of that real-life landscape was just as impossible. 287. We worship perfection because we can't have it. If we had it, we would reject it. Perfection is inhuman, because humanity is imperfect. We harbor a secret hatred of paradise. 
Our yearnings are like those of the poor wretch who hopes for the countryside in heaven. It's not abstract ecstasies or marvels in the absolute that can enchant a feeling soul. It's homesteads and hillsides, green islands and blue seas, wooded paths and restful hours spent on ancestral farms. Even if we've never had these things. If there's no land in heaven, then better there were no heaven. Better that everything be nothing and that the plotless novel come to an end. To achieve perfection would require a coldness foreign to man, and he would lose the human heart that makes him love perfection. In awe we worship the impulse to perfection of great artists. We love their approximation to perfection, but we love it because it is only an approximation. 288. How tragic not to believe in human perfectibility. And how tragic to believe in it. 289. If I had written King Lear, I would be plagued by remorse for the rest of my life. For the sheer greatness of this work grossly magnifies its defects, its monstrous defects, the tiniest things that stand between certain scenes and their possible perfection. It's not the sun marred by spots, it's a broken Greek statue. All that has ever been done is ridden with errors. Faulty perspectives, ignorance, signs of bad taste, shortcomings and oversights. To write a masterpiece large enough to be great and perfect enough to be sublime is a task no one has had the fortune or divine capacity to accomplish. Whatever can't be done in a single burst, suffers from the unevenness of our spirit. This thought causes my imagination to be overwhelmed by regret, by a painful certainty that I'll never be able to do anything good and useful for beauty. The only method for achieving perfection is to be God. Our greatest effort takes time. The time it takes passes through various stages of our soul, and each stage of the soul, being unlike any other, taints the character of the work with its own personality. All we can be certain of when we write is that we write badly. The only great and perfect works are the ones we never dream of realizing. Listen still, with a sympathetic ear. Hear me out, and then tell me if dreaming isn't better than life. Hard work never pays off. Effort never leads anywhere. Only abstention is noble and lofty for it alone recognizes that realization is always inferior, that the work we produce is always the grotesque shadow of the work we dreamed. How I would love to be able to record, in words on paper, that could be read out loud and listened to, the dialogues of the characters in my imagined dramas. The action in these dramas flows perfectly and the dialogues are flawless. But the action isn't spatially delineated in me such that I could materially project it. Nor does the substance of these inner dialogues consist of actual words which I could listen to closely and transcribe on paper. I love certain lyric poets precisely because they weren't epic or dramatic poets, because they had the intuitive wisdom never to want to express more than an intensely felt or dreamed moment. What can be written unconsciously is the exact measure of the perfection that is possible. No Shakespearean drama satisfies like a lyric poem of Heine. The poetry of Heine is perfect, whereas all drama, of Shakespeare or anyone else, is inevitably imperfect. Ah, to be able to construct a complete whole, to compose something that would be like a human body, with perfect harmony among all its parts, and with a life, a life of unity and congruency, uniting the scattered traits of its various parts. You who listen but hardly hear me have no idea what a tragedy this is. To lose father and mother, to attain neither glory nor happiness, to have neither friend nor lover, all of that can be endured. What cannot be endured is to dream something beautiful, that's impossible to achieve in word or deed. The awareness that a work is perfect, 
the satisfaction of a work achieved. Soothing is the sleep under the shady tree in the calm of summer. 290. When I lean back and belong only remotely to life, then how fluently I dictate to my inertia the phrases I'll never write, and how clearly I describe in my meditation the landscapes I could never describe. I fashion complete sentences with not a word out of place. Detailed dramatic plots unroll in my mind. I sense the verbal and metrical cadence of great poems in each and every word and a great enthusiasm follows me like an invisible slave in the shadows. But if I get up from the chair, where these nearly actualized sensations lull, and step over to the table to write them down, then the words flee, the dramas die, and the vital nexus underlying the rhythmic murmur vanishes, leaving only a distant nostalgia, a vestige of sunlight on faraway mountains a wind that stirs leaves on the edge of a wilderness, a kinship that's never revealed, the orgy other people enjoy, the woman whom we expect to turn around and look, but who never quite exists. I've undertaken every project imaginable. The Iliad composed by me had a structural logic in its organic linking of the podes such as Homer could never have achieved. The meticulous perfection of my unwritten verses makes Virgil's precision look sloppy and Milton's power slack. My allegorical satires surpassed all of Swift's in the symbolic exactitude of their rigorously interconnected particulars. How many Horaces I've been! And whenever I've stood up from the chair where in fact these things were not totally dreamed, I've experienced a double tragedy of realizing that they're worthless and that they weren't pure dream, that something of them remains on the abstract threshold of my thinking and their being. I was a genius in more than dreams and in less than life. That is my tragedy. I was the runner who led the race until he fell down, right before the finish line. 291. If in art there were the office of improver, then I would have a function in life, at least in my life as an artist. To begin with somebody else's creation, working only on improving it. Perhaps that is how the Iliad was written. Anything but to have to struggle with original creation. How I envy those who produce novels, those who begin them and write them and finish them. I can imagine novels chapter by chapter, sometimes with the actual phrases of dialogue, and the narrative commentary in between, but I'm incapable of committing these dreams of writing to paper. 292. Every form of action, from war to logical reasoning, is false. And every abdication is also false. If only I could not act and not abdicate from acting, that would be the dream crown of my glory, the scepter of silence of my greatness. I don't even suffer. My disdain for everything is so complete that I even disdain myself. The contempt I have for the sufferings of others I also have for my own. And so all my suffering is crushed under the foot of my disdain. Ah, but this makes me suffer more. Because to value one's own suffering is to gild it with the sun of pride. Intense suffering can give the sufferer the illusion of being the chosen one of pain, thus. 293. Dolorous Interlude Like someone whose eyes, when lifted up after staring at a book for a long time, wince at the mere sight of a naturally bright sun, so too, when I lift my eyes from looking at myself, it hurts and stings me to see the vivid clarity and independence from me of the world outside of the existence of others, of the position and correlation of movements in space. I stumble on the real feelings of others. The antagonism of their psyches towards mine shoves me and trips up my steps. I slide and tumble above and between the sounds of their strange words in my ears, the hard indefinite falling of their feet on the actual floor, 
their motions that really exist, their various and complex ways of being persons who are not mere variants of my own. And once I've hurled myself into these souls, I suddenly feel helpless and empty, as if I died and yet I live, a sore and pale shade, which the first breeze will knock to the ground and the first physical contact dissolve into dust. And then I wonder, was it worth all the effort I put into isolating and raising myself up? Was it worth making my life into a long, drawn-out cavalry for the sake of my crucified glory? And even if I know that it was worth it, in these moments I'm overwhelmed by the feeling that it wasn't and will never be worth it. 294. Money, children, lunatics. Wealth should never be envied except platonically. Wealth is freedom. 295. Money is beautiful, because it frees us. To want to die in Beijing and not be able to is one of the things that weigh on me like a feeling of impending doom. The buyers of useless things are wiser than is commonly supposed. They buy little dreams. They become children in the act of acquisition. When people with money succumb to the charms of those useless little objects, they possess them with the joy of a child gathering seashells on the beach. The image that best expresses the child's happiness. He gathers shells on the beach. No two are ever alike for a child. He falls asleep with the two prettiest ones in his hand. And when they're lost or taken from him, a crime, they've made off with the outward bits of his soul. They've stolen pieces of his dream. He weeps like a god robbed of a just-created universe. 296. The love of absurdity and paradox is the animal happiness of the sad. Just as the normal man talks nonsense and slaps others on the back out of zest and vitality, so those incapable of joy and enthusiasm do somersaults in their minds and perform, in their own cold way, the warm gestures of life. 297. Reductio ad absurdum is one of my favorite drinks. 298. Everything is absurd. One man spends his life earning and saving up money, although he has no children to leave it to, nor any hope that some heaven might reserve him a transcendent portion. Another man strives to gain posthumous fame, without believing in an afterlife that would give him knowledge of that fame. Yet another wears himself out in pursuit of things he doesn't really care for. Then there's one who... One man reads so as to learn, uselessly. Another man enjoys himself so as to live, uselessly. I'm riding on a tram and, as usual, am closely observing all the details of the people around me. For me, these details are like things, voices, phrases. Taking the dress of the girl in front of me, I break it down into the fabric from which it's made and the work that went into making it, such that I see a dress and not just fabric. And the delicate embroidery that trims the collar decomposes under my scrutiny into the silk thread with which it was embroidered and the work it took to embroider it. And immediately, as in a textbook of basic economics, factories and jobs unfold before me. The factory where the cloth was made, the factory where the darker colored silk was spun to trim with curlicues its place around the neck, the factory's various divisions, the machines, the workers, the seamstresses. My inwardly turned eyes penetrate into the offices where I see the managers trying to stay calm and I watch everything being recorded in the account books. But that's not all. I see beyond all this to the private lives of those who live their social existence in these factories and offices. The whole world opens up before my eyes merely because in front of me, on the nape of a dark-skinned neck, whose other side has I don't know what face, I see a regularly irregular dark green embroidery on a light green dress. 
All humanity's social existence lies before my eyes. And beyond this I sense the loves, the secrets, and the souls of all who labored so that the woman in front of me in the tram could wear around her mortal neck the sinuous banality of a dark green silk trim on a less dark green cloth. I get dizzy. The seats in the tram made of tough, close-woven straw take me to distant places and proliferate in the form of industries, workers, their houses, lives, realities, everything. I get off the tram dazed and exhausted. I've just lived all of life. 299. Every time I go somewhere, it's a vast journey. A train trip to Cascay tires me out as if in this short time I've traveled the urban and rural landscapes of four or five countries. I imagine myself living in each house I pass, each chalet, each isolated cottage whitewashed with lime and silence, happy at first, then bored, then fed up. It all happens in a moment, and as soon as I've abandoned one of these homes, I'm filled with nostalgia for the time I lived there. And so every trip I make is a painful and happy harvest of great joys, great boredoms, and countless false nostalgias. And as I pass by those houses, villas, and chalets, I also live the daily lives of all their inhabitants, living them all at the same time. I'm the father, mother, sons, cousins, the maid and the maid's cousin, all together and all at once, thanks to my special talent for simultaneously feeling various and sundry sensations, for simultaneously living the lives of various people, both on the outside, seeing them, and on the inside, feeling them. I've created various personalities within. I constantly create personalities. Each of my dreams, as soon as I start dreaming it, is immediately incarnated into another person, who is then the one dreaming it, and not I. To create, I've destroyed myself. I've so externalized myself on the inside that I don't exist there except externally. I'm the empty stage where various actors act out various plays. 300. Triangular Dream in my dream on the deck I shuddered. A chilling presentiment ran through my faraway prince's soul. A noisy, threatening silence invaded the room's visible atmosphere like a livid breeze. It all comes down to a harsh, troubling brilliance in the moonlight over the ocean that no longer tosses but still waves. Though I still couldn't hear them, it became clear that there were cypresses next to the prince's palace. The sword of the first lightning bolt vaguely whirled in the beyond. The moonlight over the high sea is the color of lightning. And what it all means is that the palace of the prince I never was is now ruins in a distant past. As the ship draws near with a sullen sound, the room lividly darkens. And he didn't die. Nor is he captive, but I don't know what has become of him, the prince. What cold and unknown thing is his destiny now? 301. The only way you can have new sensations is by forging a new soul. It's useless to try to feel new things without feeling them in a new way, and you can't feel in a new way without changing your soul. For things are what we feel they are, how long have you known this without yet knowing it? And the only way for there to be new things, for us to feel new things, is for there to be some novelty in how we feel them. Change your soul. How? That's for you to figure out. From the time we're born until we die, our soul slowly changes, like the body. Find a way to make it change faster, even as our body changes more rapidly when suffering or recovering from certain diseases. We should never stoop down to delivering lectures, lest anyone think we have opinions or would condescend to speak with the public. Let the public read us, if they wish. The lecturer, moreover, 
resembles an actor, an errand boy of art, a figure despised by any good artist. 302. I've discovered that I'm always attentive to, and always thinking about, two things at the same time. I suppose everyone is a bit like that. Certain impressions are so vague that only later, because we remember them, do we even realize we had them. I believe these impressions form a part, perhaps the internal part, of the dual attention we all possess. In my case, the two realities that hold my attention are equally vivid. This is what constitutes my originality. This, perhaps, is what constitutes my tragedy, and what makes it comic. Hunched over the ledger, I attentively record the entries that tell the useless history of an obscure firm. While at the same time, and with equal attention, my thoughts follow the route of a non-existent ship past landscapes of an unreal orient. For me, the two things are equally visible and equally distinct. The ruled pages on which I carefully write the commercial epic of Vasquez & Co., and the deck where I carefully observe, beyond the ruled pattern of the floorboards, tarred joints, the rows of lounge chairs and the stretched legs of passengers, relaxing on the voyage. If I were run over by a child's bicycle, the child's bicycle would become part of my history. The smoking room blocks the view, that's why only their legs can be seen. As I dip my pen in the inkwell, the door of the smoking room opens up, almost right next to where I feel I am, to reveal the face of the stranger. He turns his back to me and walks towards the others. His gait is slow and his hips don't tell much. He's English. I begin another entry. I try to figure out where I was going wrong. The Marquez account should be debited rather than credited. I see him as a chubby and affable jokester, and suddenly the ship disappears. 303. The world belongs to those who don't feel. The essential condition for being a practical man is the absence of sensibility. The chief requisite for the practical expression of life is will, since this leads to action. Two things can thwart action, sensibility and analytic thought the latter of which is just thought with sensibility. All action is by nature the projection of our personality onto the external world. And since the external world is largely and firstly made up of human beings, it follows that this projection of personality is basically a matter of crossing other people's paths, of hindering, hurting, or overpowering them, depending on the form our action takes. To act, then, requires a certain incapacity for imagining the personalities of others, their joys and sufferings. Sympathy leads to paralysis. The man of action regards the external world as composed exclusively of inert matter, either intrinsically inert like a stone he walks on or kicks out of his path, or inert like a human being who couldn't resist him, and thus might as well be a stone as a man, since, like a stone, he was walked on or kicked out of the way. The best example of the practical man is the military strategist, in whom extreme concentration of action is joined to its extreme importance. All life is war, and the battle is life synthesis. The strategist is a man who plays with lives like the chess player with chess pieces. What would become of the strategist if he thought about how each of his moves brings night to a thousand homes and grief to three thousand hearts. What would become of the world if we were human? If man really felt, there would be no civilization. Art gives shelter to the sensibility that action was obliged to forget. Art is Cinderella, who stayed at home because that's how it had to be. Every man of action is basically cheerful and optimistic because those who don't feel are happy. You can spot a man of action by the fact he's never out of sorts. A man who works in spite of being out of sorts is an auxiliary to action. He can be a bookkeeper, as it were, in the vast general scheme of life, as I happen to be in my own particular life. But he cannot be a ruler over things or men. 
Rulership requires insensibility. Whoever governs is happy, since to be sad one has to feel. Today my boss, Senor Vasquez, closed a deal that brought a sick man and his family to ruin. As he negotiated the deal, he completely forgot that this man existed, except as the opposing commercial party. After the deal was closed, he was touched by sensibility. Only afterwards, of course, since otherwise the deal never would have been made. I feel sorry for the fellow, he told me. He's going to wind up being destitute. Then, lighting up a cigar, he added, Well, if he needs anything from me, meaning some kind of charity, I won't forget that I have him to thank for a good business deal and a few thousand escudos. Senor Vasquez isn't a crook. He's a man of action. The loser in this game can indeed count on my boss's charity in the future, for he's a generous man. Senor Vasquez is like all men of action. Be they business leaders, industrialists, politicians, military commanders, social and religious idealists, great poets, great artists, beautiful women, or children who do what they please. The one who ordains is the one who doesn't feel. The one who succeeds is the one who thinks only of what is needed for success. The remaining general lot of humanity, amorphous, sensitive, imaginative, and fragile, is no more than the backdrop against which these stage actors perform until the puppet show ends, no more than the flat and lifeless chessboard over which the pieces move until they're put away by the great player, who, fooling himself with a double personality, plays against his own person and is always entertained. 304. Faith is the instinct of action. 305. My vital habit of disbelieving everything, especially instinctive things, and my natural inclination to insincerity neutralize all obstacles to the constant application of my method. What I basically do is convert other people into my dreams. I take up their opinions, which I develop through my reason and intuition, in order to make them my own. Having no opinions, I can adopt theirs as well as any others, and to conform them to my taste, turning their personalities into things that have an affinity with my dreams. I've so favored dreaming over real life that I'm able, in my verbal encounters, the only kind I have, to keep on dreaming and to keep following, through the opinions and feelings of others, the fluid course of my own amorphous personality. Other people are channels or conduits in which the ocean's water flows according to their fancy, and the shimmering of the water in the sunlight defines their curved path much better than their empty dryness could do. Although it sometimes seems to my hasty analysis that I'm the parasite of others, what really occurs is that I force them to be parasites of my subsequent emotion. My life inhabits the shells of their personalities. I reproduce their footsteps in my spirit's clay, absorbing them so thoroughly into my consciousness that I, in the end, have taken their steps and walked in their paths even more than they. Due to my habit of dividing myself, following two distinct mental operations at the same time, it's generally the case that I lucidly and intensely adapt myself to what others are feeling. I simultaneously undertake a rigorously objective analysis of their unknown self, what they think they are. And in my dreaming, without ever interrupting my reverie, I not only live the distilled essence of their sometimes dead emotions, I also discover and classify the intricate links between their various intellectual and spiritual energies, which were often lying dormant in their soul. Nor, while all this is going on, do their physiognomies and dress and gestures escape my notice. I live their dreams, their instinctive nature, and their body and its postures all at the same time. In a sweeping, unified dispersion, I ubiquitize myself in them. And at each moment of our conversation, I create, and am, a multitude of selves, conscious and unconscious, 
analyzed and analytical, joined together as in a spread fan. 306. I belong to a generation that inherited disbelief in the Christian faith and created in itself a disbelief in all other faiths. Our fathers still had the believing impulse, which they transferred from Christianity to other forms of illusion. Some were champions of social equality. Others were wholly enamored of beauty. Still others had faith in science and its achievements. And there were some who became even more Christian, resorting to various Easts and Wests in search of new religious terms to entertain their otherwise hollow consciousness of merely living. We lost all of this. We were born with none of these consolations. Each civilization follows the particular path of a religion that represents it. Turning to other religions, it loses the one it had, and ultimately loses them all. We lost the one, and all the others with it. And so we were left, each man to himself, in the desolation of feeling ourselves live. A ship may seem to be an object whose purpose is to sail, but no, its purpose is to reach a port. We found ourselves sailing without any idea of what port we were supposed to reach. Thus we reproduced a painful version of the Argonaut's adventurous precept. Living doesn't matter, only sailing does. Without illusions, we live by dreaming, which is the illusion of those who can't have illusions. Living off our inner selves has diminished us, for the complete man is the one who doesn't know himself. Without faith, we have no hope, and without hope, we have no real life. Having no idea of the future, we likewise have no idea of today, because today, for the man of action, is nothing but a prologue to the future. The energy to fight was stillborn in us, for we were born without the fighting spirit. Some of us stagnated in the idiotic conquest of the ordinary, contemptibly seeking our daily bread without ever sweating for it, without making a conscious effort, without the nobility of achievement. Others of us, more high-minded, spurned state and society, wanting and desiring nothing, and trying to take to the calvary of oblivion the cross of simply existing, an impossible endeavor for whoever doesn't have, like the bearer of the cross, the consciousness of a divine origin. Still others, busy on the outside of the soul, devoted themselves to the cult of noise and confusion, thinking they were living whenever they heard themselves, and supposing they loved whenever they brushed love's outward forms. Living was painful because we knew we were alive. Dying didn't scare us, for we had lost the normal notion of what death is. But those who formed the terminal race, the spiritual limit of the deadly hour, didn't even have courage enough for true denial and asylum. What we lived was in denial, discontent, and disconsolation. But we lived it within, without moving, forever closed, at least in the way we lived, inside the four painted walls of our room and the four stone walls of our inability to act. 307. Aesthetics of Discouragement Since we can't extract beauty from life, let's at least try to extract beauty from not being able to extract beauty from life. Let's make our failure into a victory into something positive and lofty, endowed with columns, majesty and our mind's consent. If life has given us more than a prison cell, let's at least decorate it as best we can, with the shadows of our dreams, their colorful patterns engraving our oblivion on the static surface of the walls. Like every dreamer, I've always felt that my calling was to create, since I've never been able to make an effort or carry out an intention. Creation for me has always meant dreaming, wanting, or desiring, and action has meant dreaming of the acts I wish I could perform. 308. I called my incapacity for living genius, and I dressed up my cowardice by calling it refinement. I placed myself, God gilded with false gold, on an altar of cardboard, 
painted to look like marble. But I didn't succeed in fooling myself, nor my self-delusion. 309. The pleasure of praising ourselves. Rainy landscape. It smells to me of coldness, of regret, of the hopelessness of every road and of every ideal ever dreamed up. Women today take so much care with how they look and move that they give the excruciating impression of being ephemeral and irreplaceable. Their text is missing, embellishments so paint and color them that they become more decorative than carnally alive. Freezes, pictures, paintings, that's all they amount to, visually speaking. The mere gesture of wrapping a shawl around the shoulders is done with a greater awareness of its visual effect than ever before. The shawl used to be part of a woman's basic attire. Now it's an optional feature, depending solely on notions of aesthetic taste. In these colorful times, when almost nothing escapes being turned into art, everything plucks petals from the conscious sphere and merges, text is missing, into flights of fancy. These female figures are all like fugitives from pictures that were never painted. Some of them are too full of details. Certain profiles stand out too sharply, as if they were trying to look unreal. So detached are their pure lines from the background. 310. My soul is a secret orchestra, but I don't know what instruments, strings, harps, cymbals, drums, strum and bang inside me. I only know myself as the symphony. Every effort is a crime, because every gesture is a dead dream. Your hands are captive doves. Your lips are silent doves that come to coo before my eyes. All of your gestures are birds. They're a swallow when you stoop, a condor when you look at me, and an eagle in your disdainful lady's ecstasies. I look at you and see a pond full of flapping wings. You are nothing but wings. Rain, rain, rain. Groaning, unrelenting rain. My body makes even my soul shiver. Not with a coldness that's in the air, but with a coldness that comes from watching the rain. Every pleasure is a vice, because to seek pleasure is what everyone does in life. And the only black vice is to do what everyone else does. 311. Sometimes, without expecting it, and with no reason to expect it, the oppressiveness of common life makes me gag, and I feel physically nauseated by the voice and gestures of my so-called fellow man. It's an instant physical nausea, automatically felt in my stomach and head, an impressive but stupid consequence of my alert sensibility. Everyone who talks to me, each face whose eyes gaze at me, hits me like an insult or a piece of filth. I brim with disgust at the whole lot. I get dizzy from feeling myself feel them. And in these moments of abdominal distress, there's nearly always a man, a woman, or even a child that stands before me as a live representative of the banality that torments me. Not a representative according to my subjective, pondered emotion, but by an objective truth, outwardly corresponding to what I inwardly feel, and appearing to me by analogical magic as the perfect example for the rule I conceive. 312. There are days when everyone I meet, and especially the people I'm forced to have daily contact with, appear as symbols, and individually or together, they form a prophetic or occult writing that obscurely describes my life. The office becomes a page with people for its words. The street is a book. The words I exchange with familiar or unfamiliar faces are phrases for which I have no dictionary, though I have an idea of what they mean. They speak, they tell, but it's not of themselves that they speak or tell. They are words, as I've said, that don't disclose their meaning, 
but they allow glimpses. In my twilight vision, I only vaguely distinguish what these sudden glass panes on the surfaces of things let show from the interior that they veil and reveal. I understand without knowledge, like a blind man when someone tells him about colors. Walking along the street, I often hear snatches of private conversations, and they're almost all about another woman, another man, a friend's boyfriend, or someone else's girlfriend. Just to hear these shadows of human speech, which is all that occupies most conscious lives, fills me with a sickening tedium, an anguished feeling of being exiled among spiders, and a sudden awareness of my humiliation among real people, condemned to being looked upon by the landlord and the whole neighborhood as a tenant just like everyone else on the block. And it's with loathing that I peer through the bars of the storeroom's back windows, seeing everybody's rubbish heaped up in the rain in the grimy courtyard which is my life. 313. I loathe the happiness of all these people who don't know they're unhappy. Their human life is full of what, in a true sensibility, would produce a surfeit of anxieties. But since their true life is vegetative, their sufferings come and go without touching their soul, and they live a life that can be compared only to that of a man with a toothache who won a fortune, the genuine good fortune of living unawares, the greatest gift granted by the gods, for it is the gift of being like them, superior just as they are, albeit in a different fashion, to happiness and pain. That's why, in spite of everything, I love them all, my dear vegetables. 314. I'd like to develop a code of inertia for superior souls in modern societies. Society would govern itself spontaneously if it didn't contain sensitive and intelligent people. You can be sure that they're the only thing that hinders it. Primitive societies were happy because they didn't have such people. Unfortunately, superior souls would die if expelled from society, because they don't know how to work. And without any stupid blanks between them, perhaps they would die of boredom. But my concern here is with overall human happiness. Each superior soul who appeared in society would be exiled to the island of the superiors. The superiors would be fed like animals in cages, by normal society. Believe me, if there were no intelligent people to point out humanity's various woes, humanity wouldn't even notice them. And sensitive people who suffer cause the rest to suffer by association. For the time being, since we live in society, our one duty as superiors is to reduce to a minimum our participation in the life of the tribe. We shouldn't read newspapers, for example, or should read them only to find out what anecdotal and unimportant things are happening. You can't imagine the delight I get from the provincial news roundup. The very names make doors to the indefinite open up in me. The highest honor for a superior man is to not know the name of his country's chief of staff, or whether he lives under a monarchy or a republic. He should be careful to position his soul in such a way that passing things and events can't disturb him. Otherwise, he'll have to take an interest in others in order to look out for himself. 315. There's an aesthetics to wasting time. For those who cultivate sensations, there's an unwritten handbook on inertia, with recipes for all the forms of lucidity. To develop the right strategy for fighting against the notion of social mores, against the impulses of our instincts, and against the solicitations of sentiment requires a study that not every aesthete is prepared to undertake. A rigorous ideology of our scruples should be followed by an ironic diagnosis of our concessions to normality. We must also learn how to ward off life's intrusions. Uh text is missing. Caution is necessary to make us impervious to outside opinions. 
and a velvety indifference to insulate our soul against the invisible blows of coexisting with others. 316. A life of aesthetic quietism, to prevent the insults and humiliations of life and the living from getting any closer than a loathsome periphery of our sensibility, outside the walls of our conscious soul. All of us, in some part or other, are loathsome. We all harbor a crime we've committed, or a crime our soul is begging us to commit. 317. One of my constant preoccupations is to understand how other people can exist, how there can be souls that aren't mine, consciousnesses that have nothing to do with my own, which, because it's a consciousness, seems to me like the only one. I accept that the man standing before me, who speaks with words like mine and gesticulates as I do or could do, is in some sense my fellow creature. But so are the figures from illustrations that fill my imagination, the characters I meet in novels, and the dramatic personae that move on stage through the actors who represent them. No one, I suppose, genuinely admits the real existence of another person. We may concede that the person is alive and that he thinks and feels as we do, but there will always be an unnamed element of difference, a materialized inequality. There are figures from the past and living images from books that are more real to us than the incarnate indifferences that talk to us over shop counters or happen to glance at us on the train or brush against us in the dead happenstance of the streets. Most people are no more for us than scenery, generally the invisible scenery of a street we know by heart. I feel more kinship and intimacy with certain characters described in books and certain images I've seen in prints than I feel with many so-called real people, who are of that metaphysical insignificance known as flesh and blood. And flesh and blood, in fact, describes them rather well. They're like chunks of meat displayed in the window of a butcher's. Dead things, bleeding as if they were alive. Shanks and cutlets of destiny. I'm not ashamed of feeling this way, as I've discovered that's how everyone feels. What seems to lie behind people's mutual contempt and indifference, such that they can kill each other like assassins who don't really feel they're killing, or like soldiers who don't think about what they're doing is that no one pays heed to the apparently abstruse fact that other people are also living souls. On certain days, in certain moments, brought to me by I don't know what breeze and opened to me by the opening of I don't know what door, I suddenly feel that the corner grocer is a thinking entity, that his assistant, who at this moment is bent over a sack of potatoes next to the entrance, is truly a soul capable of suffering. When I was told yesterday that the employee of the tobacco shop had committed suicide, it seemed to me like a lie. Poor man, he also existed. We had forgotten this, all of us, all who knew him in the same way as all those who never met him. Tomorrow we'll forget him even better. But he evidently had a soul, for he killed himself. Passion? Anxiety? No doubt. But for me, as for all humanity, there's only the memory of a dumb smile and the shabby sports coat that hung unevenly from his shoulders. That's all that remains to me of this man who felt so much that he killed himself for feeling. Since what else does one kill himself for? Once, as I was buying cigarettes from him, it occurred to me that he would go bald early. As it turns out, he didn't have time enough to go bald. That's one of the memories I have of him. What other one can I have, if even this one is not of him, but of one of my thoughts? I suddenly see his corpse, the coffin where they placed him, the so alien grave where they must have lowered him, and it dawns on me that the cashier of the tobacco shop, with crooked coat and all, was in a certain way the whole of humanity. It was only a flash. What's clear to me now, Today, 
as the human being I am, is that he died. That's all. No, others don't exist. It's for me that this heavy-winged sunset lingers, its colors hard and hazy. It's for me that the great river shimmers below the sunset, even if I can't see it flow. It's for me that this square was built overlooking the river, whose waters are now rising. Was the cashier of the tobacco shop buried today in the common grave? Then the sun isn't setting for him today. But because I think this, and against my will, it has also stopped setting for me. 318. Ships passing in the night that neither signal nor recognize each other. 319. I realize now that I failed, and it only surprises me that I didn't foresee that I was going to fail. What was there in me to suggest I might triumph? I had neither the conqueror's blind force nor the madman's sure vision. I was lucid and sad like a cold day. Clear things console me, and sunlit things console me. To see life passing by under a blue sky makes up for a lot. I forget myself indefinitely, forgetting more than I could ever remember. The sufficiency of things fills my weightless, translucent heart, and just to look is a sweet satisfaction. I've never been more than a bodiless gaze, whose only soul was a slight breeze that passed by and saw. I have something of the spirit of a bohemian, of those who let life slip away, like something that slips through one's fingers, because the gesture to seize it falls asleep at the mere idea. But I never had the outward compensation of the bohemian spirit, the carefree acceptance of come-and-go emotions. I was never more than an isolated bohemian, which is an absurdity, or a mystic bohemian, which is an impossibility. I've lived certain moments of respite in the presence of nature, moments sculpted out of tender isolation that will always be like metals for me. In these moments, I forgot all of my life's goals, all of the paths I wanted to follow. An immense spiritual tranquility fell into the blue lap of my aspirations and allowed me to enjoy being nothing. But I've probably never enjoyed an incorruptible moment, free of any underlying spirit of failure and gloom. In all my moments of spiritual liberation, there was a dormant sorrow, vaguely blooming in gardens beyond the walls of my consciousness, and the scent and the very color of those sad flowers intuitively passed through the stone walls, whose far side, where the roses bloomed, never ceased being a hazy near side in the obscure mystery of who I am, in the drowsiness of my daily existence. It was in an inner sea that the river of my life ended. All around my dreamed mansion, the trees were yellow with autumn. This circular landscape is my soul's crown of thorns. The happiest moments of my life were dreams, and dreams of sorrow. And I saw myself in their ponds, like a blind narcissist, who enjoyed coolness as he bent over the water, aware of his reflection there through an inner, nocturnal vision that was confided to his abstract emotions, and maternally adored in the recesses of his imagination. Your necklaces of imitation pearls loved with me my finest hours. Carnations were our preferred flower, perhaps because they didn't suggest pomp. Your lips solemnly celebrated the irony of your own smile. Did you really understand your destiny? It was because you knew it, without understanding it, that the mystery written in the sadness of your eyes had cast a pall on your resigned lips. Our homeland was too far away for roses. In the cascades of our gardens, the water was pellucid with silences. In the tiny hollows of the rocks over which the water flowed, there were secrets from our childhood and dreams, the same size as our toy soldiers of old which we could station on the cascade stones 
in the static execution of a huge military operation. With nothing lacking in our dreams and nothing lagging in our imagination. I know I've failed. I enjoy the vague voluptuosity of failure, like one who, in his exhaustion, appreciates the fever that laid him up. I had a certain talent for friendship, but I never had any friends, either because they simply didn't turn up, or because the friendship I had imagined was an error of my dreams. I've always lived alone, and ever more alone, as I've become more self-aware. 320. Towards the end of the summer, when the dull sun's heat had lost its harshness, autumn began before it was autumn, with a mild and endlessly indefinite sadness, as if the sky didn't feel like smiling. Its blue was sometimes lighter, sometimes greener, from the lofty color's own lack of substance. There was a kind of forgetfulness in the subdued purple tones of the clouds. It was no longer a torpor, but a tedium that filled the lonely expanses where the clouds go by. The real beginning of autumn was announced by a coldness in the air's non-coldness, by a subduing of the still unsubdued colors, by something of shadow and distance in the tint of the landscapes and the fuzzy countenance of things. Nothing was going to die yet, but everything, as in a still unformed smile, looked longingly back at life. Finally, the full autumn came. The air turned cold and windy. Leaves rustled with a dry sound, even if they weren't dry. The ground took on the color of the impalpable shape of a shifting swamp. What had been a final smile faded as eyelids drooped and gestures flagged. And so everything that feels, or that we imagine feels, pressed its own farewell tight against its breast. A sound of whirling wind in a courtyard wafted through our consciousness of something else. Convalescence appealed as a way of at least truly feeling life. But the first rains of winter, falling already in the now harsh autumn, washed away these half-tones without respect. High winds howled against whatever was fixed, stirred up whatever was tied, swept along whatever was movable, and pronounced, between the rain's loud outbursts, absent words of anonymous protest, sad and almost angry sounds of glum despair. And at last autumn coldly and grayly ceased. What came now was an autumn of winter, with the dust of everything becoming the mud of everything. But there was also a foretaste of the winter cold's good side, the harsh summer behind us, spring on its way, and autumn finally taking shape as winter. And in the lofty sky, whose dull tones no longer recalled heat or sadness, everything was propitious to night and indefinite meditations. That's how it was for me before I thought about it. If I write it down today, it's because I remember it. The autumn I have is the one I lost. 321. Opportunity is like money, which, come to think of it, is nothing but opportunity. For those who act, opportunity concerns the will, and the will doesn't interest me. For those like me who don't act, opportunity is the song of no sirens existing. It should be voluptuously spurned stowed high away for no use at all. To have occasion to... In this space the statue of renunciation will be raised. O oh, sprawling fields in the sun, the spectator for whom you alone exist is gazing at you from the shade. O oh, alcohol of grand words and long phrases that swell like waves with the breathing of their rhythms and then crash, smiling, with the irony of twisting snakes of foam and the sad magnificence of glimmering shadows. 322. Every gesture, however simple, violates an inner secret. Every gesture is a revolutionary act, an exile, perhaps, from the true text is missing of our intentions. 
Action is a disease of thought, a cancer of the imagination. Action is self-exile. Every action is incomplete and flawed. The poem I dream has no flaws until I try to realize it. We find this recorded in the myth of Jesus. God, becoming man, cannot help but end in martyrdom. The supreme dreamer has the supreme martyr for a son. The leaves tattered shadows, the birds tremulous song, the river's long arms shimmering coolly in the sun, the plants, the poppies, and the simplicity of sensations. Even while feeling all this, I'm nostalgic for it, as if in feeling it, I didn't feel it. Time, like a wagon at the close of day, creakingly returns through the shadows of my nostalgia. If I lift up my eyes from my thinking, they smart at the sight of the world. To realize a dream, one must forget it, tearing away his attention from it. To realize is thus to not realize. Life is full of paradoxes, as roses are of thorns. I'd like to write the encomium of a new incoherence that could serve as the negative charter for the new anarchy of souls. I've always felt that a digest of my dreams might be useful to humanity, which is why I've never tried to complete one. The idea that something I did might be helpful galled me and made me feel sapped. I have country homes on the outskirts of life. I escape from the city of my actions to the trees and flowers of my reverie. Not a single echo from the life of my acts reaches my green retreat. I'm lulled by my memory as by an endless procession. From the goblets of my meditation, I drink only the smile of the golden wine. I drink it only with my eyes, closing them, and life passes by like a sail in the distance. Sunny days smack of what I don't have. The blue sky and white clouds, the trees, the flute that's missing, eclogues left unfinished by the branches rustling. All this is the silent harp grazed by the lightness of my fingers. The vegetable academy of silences. Your name that sounded like poppies. The pawns. My going home. The crazy priest who went out of his mind during Mass. These memories are from my dreams. I keep my eyes open but see nothing. The things I do see aren't here. Seaweed. Waters. The lush green of the trees, through a jumble of entanglements, is part of my blood. Life throbs in my distant heart. I wasn't meant for reality, but life came and found me. The agony of fate. I could die tomorrow. Even today, something terrible could befall my soul. When I think of these things, I'm sometimes appalled at the supreme tyranny that obliges us to take steps without knowing where our uncertain past will lead. 223. The rain kept sadly falling, but now with less force, as if seized by a cosmic weariness. There was no lightning, and only very occasionally would a distant, short roll of thunder harshly tumble, haltingly at times, as if it too were weary. Suddenly the rain let up even more. One of the employees opened the windows facing onto the Rua dos Torredores. A cool air, with dead remnants of warmth, drifted into the large office. The voice of Senor Vasquez talked loudly on the phone in his private office. You mean the line's still busy? And then there was a dryly spoken aside, presumably an obscene remark to the receptionist on the other end. 324. To be able to have dreams, it's crucial that you know how to have no illusions. In this way you'll reach the summit of dreamy abstention, where senses blend, feelings overflow, and ideas intermingle. There, colors and souls taste like each other, hatreds taste like loves, and concrete things like abstract things, abstract like concrete. The ties that joined everything, but also separated everything, because they isolated each element, are broken. Everything melds and merges. 
325. Fictions of the interlude, colorfully covering the torpor and sloth of our underlying disbelief. 326. And I don't dream, I don't live. I dream real life. All ships are dream ships, if we have the power to dream them. What kills the dreamer is to not live while he dreams. What hurts the man of action is to not dream while he lives. I fuse the beauty of dreaming and the reality of life into a single, blissful color. However much a dream may be ours, we can never possess it like the handkerchief in our pocket, or, if you will, like our own flesh. However much one lives a life of full, boundless, and triumphant action, he will never be free from the, text is missing, of contact with others, from stumbling over obstacles, even if small, and from feeling the passage of time. To kill our dream life would be to kill ourselves, to mutilate our soul. Dreaming is the one thing we have that's really ours, invulnerably and inalterably ours. Life and the universe, be they reality or illusion, belong to everyone. Everyone can see what I see and have what I have, or can at least imagine himself seeing it and having it. And this is... But no one besides me can see or have the things I dream. And if I see the outer world differently from how others see it, it's because I inadvertently incorporate into what I see the things from my dreams that have stuck to my eyes and ears. 327. On this clear, bright day, even the softness of the sounds is golden. There's gentleness everywhere. If I were told that a war had broken out, I would say there was no war. A day like today cannot admit anything that would disturb the gentleness that is everything. 328. Join your hands and put them in mine, and listen, my love. I want to tell you, with the soft and soothing voice of a confessor giving counsel, how much our yearning to attain falls short of what we do attain. With my voice and your attention, I want us to pray together the litany of despair. There is no artist's work that could not have been more perfect. When read line by line, the greatest of poems has few verses that couldn't be improved, few scenes that couldn't have been told more vividly, and the overall result is never so good that it couldn't have been vastly better. Woe to the artist who notices this, who one day happens to think about it. Never again will he work with joy or sleep in peace. He'll be a young man without youth and grow old dissatisfied. And why should anyone express himself? What little he may say would be better left unsaid. If I could really convince myself that renunciation is beautiful, how dolefully happy I would always be. For you do not love the things I say with the same ears I use to hear myself say them. Even my ears, should I speak out loud, do not hear the words I speak in the same way as my inner ear hears the words I think. Even if I, when I hear myself, get confused and am not always sure what I meant, then how much more other people are bound to misunderstand me? What elaborate misconceptions from other people's understanding of us? The joy of being understood by others cannot be had by those who want to be understood, for they are too complex to be understood, and simple people who can be understood by others never have the desire to be understood. 329. Have you ever considered beloved other, how invisible we all are to each other. Have you ever thought about how little we know each other? We look at each other without seeing. We listen to each other and hear only a voice inside ourself. The words of others are mistakes of our hearing, shipwrecks of our understanding. How confidently we believe in our meanings of other people's words. We hear death in words they speak to express sensual bliss. We read sensuality and life 
in words they drop from their lips without the slightest intention of being profound. The voice of brooks that you interpret, pure explicator. The voice of trees whose rustling means what we say it means. Ah, my unknown love, this is all just us and our fantasies, all ash trickling down the bars of our cell. 330. Since perhaps not everything is false, may nothing cure us, my love, of the almost ecstatic pleasure of lying. Ultimate subtlety, supreme perversion. The absurd lie has all the charm of the perverse, with the even greater ultimate charm of being innocent. The deliberately innocent perversion. Who can go beyond this supreme subtlety? The perversion that doesn't even aspire to give us pleasure, and that lacks the fury to cause us pain. Falling to the ground between pleasure and pain, useless and absurd, like a shoddy toy with which an adult tries to amuse himself. Don't you know, exquisite one, the pleasure of buying things you don't need? Don't you know the delight of roads, which, when we're distracted, we take by mistake? What human act has a color as lively as a spurious one, which lies to its own nature and contradicts its own intention? How sublime to waste a life that could have been useful, never to execute a work of art that was certain to be beautiful, to abandon midway a sure road to victory. Ah, my love, the glory of works which have been lost forever, of treatises which today are mere titles, of libraries which burn down, of statues which were demolished. How blessed with absurdity are the artists who set fire to a beautiful work or the artist who could have made a beautiful work, but deliberately made it ordinary, or the great poets of silence who, knowing they were capable of writing an absolutely perfect work, preferred to crown it with the decision never to write it. For an imperfect work, it makes no difference. How much more beautiful the Mona Lisa would be if we couldn't see it, and if someone were to steal it just to burn it, what an artist he would be, even greater than the one who painted it. Why is art beautiful? Because it's useless. Why is life ugly? Because it's all aims, objectives, and intentions. All of its roads are for going from one point to another. If only we could have a road connecting a place no one ever leaves from a place no one ever goes. If only someone would devote his life to building a road from the middle of one field to the middle of another a road that would be useful if extended at each end, but that would sublimely remain as only the middle stretch of a road. The beauty of ruins? That they're no longer good for anything. The sweetness of the past? Our memory of it, since to remember it is to make it present, and it isn't present, nor ever can be. Absurdity, my love, absurdity. And I, who am saying all this, why am I writing this book? because I realize it's imperfect. Dreamed it would be perfection. Written it becomes imperfect. That's why I'm writing it. And above all else, because I advocate uselessness, absurdity. I write this book to lie to myself, to be unfaithful to my own theory. And the supreme glory of all this, my love, is to think that perhaps none of it is true, and that I don't even believe it's true. And when lying begins to bring us pleasure, let's give it the lie by telling the truth. And when lying causes us anxiety, let's stop so that the suffering can't become even perversely pleasurable. 331. I'm suffering from a headache and the universe. Physical aches, more blatantly painful than moral ones, reflect in the spirit and set off tragedies not contained in them. They make the sufferer cross with everything, and everything naturally includes every star. I do not share, have never shared, and can't imagine ever sharing, that degenerate concept that regards us, as living souls, to be consequences of a material thing called the brain, which originates and resides in another material thing known as the cranium. I cannot be a materialist, 
which I believe is what one calls an adherent to this concept. For I cannot establish a clear relationship, I mean a visual relationship, between a tangible mass of gray or otherwise colored matter, and this thing known as the eye that behind my gaze sees the skies and thinks about them, and imagines skies that don't exist. But even if I cannot fall into the pit of supposing that one thing is another just because they're in the same place, like a wall in my shadow on it, or that my soul's dependence on my brain is any greater than my dependence when traveling on the vehicle that carries me. I do believe there is a social relationship between what in us is pure spirit and what in us is the body spirit, such that quarrels can occur between them. And what usually occurs is that the more ordinary of the two persons gets on the other's nerves. My head aches today, and perhaps my stomach is the source of its aching. But the ache, once it is suggested by my stomach to my head, interrupts the meditation that goes on behind my thinking brain. Covering my eyes won't blind me, but it will keep me from seeing. And so now, because my head aches, I find nothing at all admirable or worthwhile in the show going on outside me, which, in this absurd and monotonous moment, I don't even wish to see as the world. My head aches, which means I'm aware that matter has offended me, and, as happens when one is offended, I'm resentful and apt to be irritable with everyone, including whoever hasn't offended me but happens to be nearby. What I feel like doing is dying at least temporarily, but this, as I've indicated, is only because my head aches. And it suddenly occurs to me how much more eloquently a great prose stylist would say this. Sentence by sentence he would elaborate on the anonymous grief of the world. The imagining eyes behind his paragraphs would scan the earth's various human dramas, and through the feverish throbbing of his temples an entire metaphysics of woe and misery would take shape on paper. But I don't have an eloquent style. My head aches because my head aches. The universe hurts me because my head hurts. But the universe that actually hurts me is not the true one, which exists because it doesn't know I exist, but that other universe which belongs only to me, and which, should I pass my hands through my hair, makes me feel that each strand suffers for no other reason than to make me suffer. 332. I'm astonished by my capacity for anxiety. Though not generally inclined to metaphysical speculation, for some days now I've been filled with intense, even physical anxiety as I grope for answers to the metaphysical and religious problems. I quickly realize that for me, the solution to the religious problem meant solving the emotional problem in rational terms. 333. No problem has a solution. None of us can untie the Gordian knot. Either we give up or we cut it. We brusquely resolve intellectual problems with our feelings, either because we're tired of thinking, or because we're afraid to draw conclusions or because of an inexplicable need to latch on to something, or because of a gregarious impulse to return to other people and to life. Since we can never know all the factors that a problem entails, we can never solve it. To arrive at the truth, we would need more data, along with the intellectual resources for exhaustively interpreting the data. 334. It's been months since I last wrote. I've lived in a state of mental slumber, leading the life of someone else. I've felt, very often, a vicarious happiness. I haven't existed. I've been someone else. I've lived without thinking. Today I suddenly return to whom I am or dream I am. It was during a moment of great fatigue, after finishing a tedious assignment. I propped my elbows on the high slanted desk, rested my head against my hands, closed my eyes, and rediscovered myself. In a faraway pseudo-slumber, I remember everything I had ever been. And as vividly as if it stood before my eyes, I suddenly saw, before or after everything, 
the side of the old farm that opened onto the fields, and in the middle of the scene appeared the threshing floor, empty. I immediately felt how futile life is. As if prompted by a dull pain in my elbows, everything I was seeing, feeling, remembering, and forgetting, merged with the faint din from the street and the slight sounds of work as usual in the quiet office. When I laid my hands on the desk and looked at what was there, with a gaze that must have been heavy with dead worlds, the first thing I saw, with my physical eyes, was a blowfly, that soft buzzing that didn't belong to the office, poised on top of the inkstand. I looked at it from the depths of the abyss, anonymous and attentive. It was colored by green shades of black-blue, and its shiny repulsiveness wasn't ugly, a life. Who knows for what supreme forces, gods or demons of truth in whose shadows we roam, I may be nothing but a shiny fly that alights in front of them for a moment or two. A facile hypothesis? Trite observation? Philosophy with no real thought? Maybe. But I didn't think. I felt. It was carnally, directly, with profound and dark horror that I made this ludicrous comparison. I was a fly when I compared myself to one. I really felt like a fly when I imagined I felt like one. And I felt I had a flyish soul, slept flyishly, and was flyishly withdrawn. And what's more horrifying is that I felt at the same time like myself. I automatically raised my eyes towards the ceiling, lest a lofty wooden ruler should swoop down to swat me as I might swat that fly. When I lowered my eyes, the fly had fortunately disappeared without a sound, at least not any I could hear. And the involuntary office was again without philosophy. 335. To feel is a pain in the neck. This offhand remark spoken by a stranger I met in a restaurant has been glowing ever since on the floor of my memory. The very earthiness of the language gives the sentence spice. 336. I wonder how many have contemplated, with the attention it merits, a deserted street with people in it. This sentence, by its phrasing, seems to want to say something else, and indeed it does. A deserted street is not a street no one walks on, but a street on which people walk as if it were deserted. This isn't hard to understand, provided one has seen it. A zebra can't be understood by a man that doesn't know more than a donkey. Our sensations change according to how we understand them, and to what extent. There are ways of understanding that have special ways of being understood. There are days when a tedium, a bitterness, an anxiety about life seems to rise to my head from the ground underneath me, and I would say it's intolerable if I didn't in fact tolerate it. It's a strangling of the life inside me, a longing to be another in all of my pores, a brief glimpse of the end. 337. What I most of all feel is weariness and the disquiet that is its twin when the weariness has no reason to exist but to exist. I dread the gestures I have to make and am intellectually shy about the words I have to speak. Everything strikes me in advance as futile. The unbearable tedium of all these faces, silly with intelligence or without it, nauseatingly grotesque in their happiness or unhappiness, hideous because they exist, an alien tide of living things that don't concern me. 338. I've always worried in those occasional moments of detachment when we become conscious of ourselves as individuals who are seen as others by other people, about the physical and even moral impression I must make on those who observe me and talk to me, whether on a daily basis or in a chance meeting. We're all used to thinking of ourselves as primarily mental realities, and of other people as immediately physical realities. We vaguely see ourselves as physical people, 
insofar as we consider how we look to others. And we vaguely see others as mental realities, though only when we're in love or in conflict does it really dawn on us that they, like we, are predominantly soul. And so sometimes I lose myself in futile speculations about the sort of person I am in the eyes of others, how my voice sounds, what kind of impression I leave on their involuntary memory, how my gestures, my words, and my visible life are inscribed on the retinas of their interpretation. I've never succeeded in seeing myself from the outside. No mirror can show us ourself from the outside, because no mirror can take us out of ourself. We would need a different soul, a different way of looking and thinking. If I were an actor projected on a screen, or if I recorded my voice on records, I'm certain that I still wouldn't know what I am on the outside. Because like it or not, and no matter what I might record of myself, I'm always here inside, enclosed by high walls, on the private estate of my consciousness of me. I don't know if others are like me, or if the science of life consists essentially in being so alienated from oneself that this alienation becomes second nature, such that one can participate in life as an exile from his own consciousness. Or perhaps other people, even more self-absorbed than I, are completely given over to the brutishness of being only themselves, living outwardly by the same miracle that enables bees to form societies more highly organized than any nation and allows ants to communicate with a language of tiny antennae whose results surpass our complex system of mutual understanding. The geography of our consciousness of reality is an endless complexity of irregular coasts, low and high mountains, and myriad lakes. And if I ponder too much, I see it all as a kind of map, like that of the Pays du Tombe, or of Gulliver's Travels, a fantasy of exactitude inscribed in an ironic or fanciful book for the amusement of superior beings, who know where countries are really countries. Everything is complex for those who think, and no doubt thought itself takes delight in making things yet more complex. But those who think need to justify their abdication with a vast program of understanding, which they set forth, like liars their explanations, with heaps of exaggerated detail that eventually reveal, once the earth is swept away, the lying root. Everything is complex, or I'm the one who's complex, but at any rate it doesn't matter, because at any rate nothing matters. All of this, all these considerations that have strayed off the broad highway, vegetate in the gardens of excluded gods like climbing plants detached from their walls. And on this night, as I conclude these inconclusive considerations, I smile at the vital irony which makes them appear in a human soul that was already, even before there were stars, an orphan of fate's grand purposes. 339. The golden tint that still glows on waters abandoned by the setting sun is hovering on the surface of my weariness. I see myself as I see the lake I've imagined, and what I see in that lake is myself. I don't know how to explain this image, or this symbol, or this I that I envision, but I know I see, as if in reality I were seeing, a sun behind the hills that casts its doomed rays onto this lake that dark goldenly shimmers. One of the perils of thinking is to see while thinking. Those who think with their reason are distracted. Those who think with their emotion are sleeping. Those who think with their desire are dead. I, however, think with my imagination. And all reason, sorrow, and impulse in me are reduced to something remote and irrelevant. Like this lifeless lake among rocks where the last light of the sun unlastingly hovers. Because I stopped, the waters trembled. Because I pondered, the sun withdrew. I close my slow and sleepy eyes, and there's nothing in me but a lake region, 
where the night begins to replace the day on the shimmering, dark brown surface of waters in which seaweed floats. Because I wrote, I said nothing. My impression is that what exists is always in another region, beyond the hills, and that there are great journeys to be made if we have soul enough to make them. I have crossed, like the sun in my landscape. Nothing remains of what I said or saw except for an already fallen night, full of a lifeless glimmer of lakes on a lowland with no wild ducks, fluid and dead, humid and sinister. 340. No, I don't believe in the landscape. I don't say it because I believe in Amiel's The Landscape is a State of Emotion, one of the better verbal moments of his unbearable interiorizing. I say it because I don't believe. 341. Day after day, in my ignoble and profound soul, I register the impressions that form the external substance of my self-awareness. I put them in vagabond words that desert me as soon as they're written, wandering on their own over slopes and meadows of images, along avenues of concepts, down footpaths of confusions. None of this is of any use to me, because nothing is of any use to me. But writing makes me calmer, as when a sick man breathes easier without the sickness having passed. Some people absent-mindedly scribble lines and absurd names on their desk blotter. These pages are the scribbles of my intellectual self-unawareness. I trace them in a stupor of feeling whatever I feel, like a cat in the sun, and I sometimes reread them with a vague, belated astonishment, as when I remember something I forgot ages ago. When I write, I pay myself a solemn visit. I have special chambers, remembered by someone else in the interstices of my imagining, where I take delight in analyzing what I don't feel, and I examine myself like a picture in a dark corner. I lost my ancient castle before I was born. The tapestries of my ancestral palace were sold before I existed. My manor house from before I had life fell into ruins. And only in certain moments, when the moon shines in me over the river's reeds, do I shiver with nostalgia for the place where the toothless remains of the walls blackly stand out against the dark blue sky, made less dark by a milky yellow tinge. I sphinxly discern myself, and from the lap of the queen I'm missing falls the forgotten ball of thread that is my soul, a little mishap of her useless embroidery. It rolls under the inlaid chest of drawers, where part of me follows it like a pair of eyes, until it vanishes in a nameless mortuary horror. 342. I never sleep. I live and I dream. Or rather, I dream in life and in my sleep, which is also life. There's no break in my consciousness. I'm aware of what's around me if I haven't fallen asleep yet, or if I sleep fitfully and I start dreaming as soon as I'm really asleep. And so I'm a perpetual unfolding of images, connected or disconnected, but always pretending to be external, situated among people in the daylight if I'm awake, or among phantoms in the non-light that illumines dreams if I'm asleep. I honestly don't know how to distinguish one state from the other, and it may be that I'm actually sleeping when I'm awake, and that I wake up when I fall asleep. Life is a ball of yarn that someone got all tangled. It would make sense if it were rolled up tight, or if it were unrolled and completely stretched out. But such as it is, life is a problem without shape, a confusion of yarn leading nowhere. I'm only half asleep, and as I think these things which I write down later, I'm already dreaming of the sentences I'll use. I'm seeing the landscapes of my vague dreams and hearing the patter of the rain outside which makes my dreams even more vague. They're riddles from the void, quivering with nothingness, and through them trickles the useless, external moaning of the constant rain, the one incessantly repeated detail of the auditory landscape. Hope? None. The wind-whipped shower of grief slowly pours down from the invisible sky. I keep on sleeping. 
It was undoubtedly in the promenades of the park that the tragedy resulting in life occurred. There were two of them, both beautiful, and they wanted to be something else. Their love was waiting for them in the tedium of the future, and their nostalgia for what was yet to come arrived as the daughter of the love they hadn't experienced. And so, with no desires or hopes, by the light of the moon filtering through the nearby woods, they strolled hand in hand through the desert of the abandoned pathways. They were perfect children, because they weren't really children. Taking path after path, cutting silhouettes among the trees, they moved like cardboard figures across the stage setting of no one. And finally, ever closer and more separate, they vanished from sight in the vicinity of the pools. And the patter of the vague rain that's now letting up is the sound of the fountains they were heading to. I am the love they shared, which is why I'm able to hear them on this night when I can't sleep, and also why I'm able to live without joy. 3.43 A Day Zigzag If only I had been the madam of a harem. What a pity this didn't happen to me. What remains at the end of this day is what remained yesterday and will remain tomorrow. The boundless, insatiable longing to be always the same and other. Come down from your unreality by the steps of my dreams and fatigues. Come down and replace the world. 344. In Praise of Sterile Women Should I one day take an earthly woman to wife, pray for me the following, that she, at any rate, be sterile. But also ask, should you pray for me, that I never come to have this hypothetical wife. Only sterility is noble and worthy. Only to kill what never was is lofty, perverse, and absurd. 345. I don't dream of possessing you. Why should I? It would only debase my dream life. To possess a body is to be banal, and to dream of possessing a body is perhaps even worse, if that's possible. It's to dream of being banal, the supreme horror. And since we wish to be sterile, let us also be chaste, for there is nothing more shameful and ignoble than to forswear what in nature is fertile, while holding on to the part that we like in what we've forsworn. There are no halfway noble attitudes. Let us be chaste like hermits, pure like dreamed bodies, and resigned to being this way, like mad nuns. May our love be a prayer. Anoint me with seeing you, and I will make the moments I dream of you into a rosary, with my tediums for our fathers and my anxieties for Hail Marys. Let us remain eternally like a male figure in one stained-glass window opposite a female figure in another stained-glass window, and between us humanity passing by, shadows whose footsteps coldly echo, murmurs of prayers, secrets of... Sometimes the air fills up with... Text is missing. Incense. At other times, a statuesque figure sprinkles holy water on this side and that side. And we will always be the same stained glass windows, with the same colors when the sun strikes us, the same outlines when the night falls. The centuries will not touch our vitreous silence. In the world outside, civilizations will come and go. Revolutions will break out. Feasts will whirl and rage. Peaceful and orderly peoples will carry on, while we, my unreal love, will always have the same useless expression, the same false existence, and the same... Until one day, at the end of various centuries and empires, the church will finally collapse and everything will cease. But we, oblivious to it all, will remain. I don't know how, or in what space, or for how long. Eternal stained glass windows, hours of naive design and coloration executed by some artist who for ages has slept in a gothic tomb on which two angels, their hands pressed together, freeze the idea of death in marble. 
346. The things we dream have just one side. We can't walk around and see what's on the other side. The problems with the things of life is that we can look at them from all sides. The things we dream have, like our souls, only the side that we can see. 347. A letter not to post. I hereby excuse you from appearing in my idea of you. Your life. This is not my love. It's merely your life. I love you the way I love the sunset or the moonlight. I want the moment to remain, but all I want to possess in it is the sensation of possessing it. 348. Nothing is more oppressive than the affection of others, not even the hatred of others, since hatred is at least more intermittent than affection. Being an unpleasant emotion, it naturally tends to be less frequent in those who feel it. But hatred as well as love is oppressive. Both seek us, pursue us, won't leave us alone. My ideal would be to live everything through novels and to use real life for resting up to read my emotions, and to live my disdain of them. For someone with a keen and sensitive imagination, the adventures of a fictional protagonist are genuine emotions enough, and more, since they are experienced by us as well as the protagonist. No greater romantic adventure exists than to have loved Lady Macbeth with true and directly felt love. After a love like that, what can one do but take a rest? not loving anyone in the real world. I don't know the meaning of this journey I was forced to make between one and another night in the company of the whole universe. I know I can read to amuse myself. Reading seems to me the easiest way to pass the time on this as on any other journey. I occasionally lift my eyes from the book where I'm truly feeling and glance as a foreigner at the scenery slipping by fields, cities, men and women, fond attachments, yearnings, and all this is no more to me than an incident in my repose, an idle distraction to rest my eyes from the pages I've been reading so intently. Only what we dream is what we truly are, because all the rest, having been realized, belongs to the world and to everyone. If I were to realize a dream, I'd be jealous for it would have betrayed me by allowing itself to be realized. I've achieved everything I wanted, says the feeble man, and it's a lie. The truth is that he prophetically dreamed all that life achieved through him. We achieve nothing. Life hurls us like a stone, and we sail through the air, saying, Look at me move. Whatever be this interlude played out under the spotlight of the sun and the spangles of the stars, Surely there's no harm in knowing it's an interlude. If what's beyond the theater door is life, then we will live. And if it's death, we will die. And the play has nothing to do with this. That is why I never feel so close to truth, so initiated into its secrets, as on the rare occasions when I go to the theater or the circus. Then I know that I'm finally watching life's perfect representation. And the actors and the actresses, the clowns and magicians, are important and futile things. Like the sun and the moon, love and death, the plague, hunger and war among humanity. Everything is theater. Is it truth I want? I'll go back to my novel. 349. The most abject of all needs is to confide, to confess. It's the soul's need to externalize. Go ahead and confess, but confess what you don't feel. Go ahead and tell your secrets to get their weight off your soul. But let the secrets you tell be secrets you've never had. Lie to yourself before you tell that truth. Expressing yourself is always a mistake. Be resolutely conscious. Let expression for you be synonymous with lying. 350. I don't know what time is. I don't know what its real measure is, presuming it has one. I know that the clock's measure is false, as it divides time spatially, 
from the outside. I know that our emotions way of measuring time is just as false, dividing not time, but our sensation of it. The way our dreams measure time is erroneous, for in dreams we only brush against time, now leisurely, now hurriedly, and what we live in them is fast or slow, depending on something in their flowing that I can't grasp. Sometimes I think that everything is false, and that time is just a frame placed around things that are extraneous to it. In the remembrance I have of my past life, the times are arranged in absurd levels and planes, so that I'm younger in a certain episode from my serious-minded fifteenth year than in another from my childhood surrounded by toys. My mind gets confounded if I think about these things. I sense there's a mistake in all this, but I don't know where it is. It's as if I were watching a magic show and knew I was being tricked, but couldn't work out the technique or the mechanism behind the trick. And then I'm visited by thoughts which are absurd, but which I can't reject as completely absurd. I wonder if a man who slowly thinks in a fast-moving car is going fast or slow. I wonder if the identical speeds of a suicide who jumps into the sea and a man on a terrace who accidentally falls are equal. I wonder if my actions of smoking a cigarette, writing this passage, and obscurely thinking, all of which occupy the same interval of time, are truly synchronized. We can imagine that one of two wheels on the same axle will always be in front of the other, if only by a fraction of a millimeter. A microscope would magnify this fractional distance until it became almost unbelievable, impossible were it not real. And why shouldn't the microscope be right rather than our poor eyesight? These considerations are useless? Indeed they are. They're tricks of reason? I don't deny it. But what is this thing that without any measure measures us, and without existing kills us? It's in these moments, when I don't even know if time exists, that it seems to me like a person, and I feel like going to sleep. 351. Games of Solitaire On evenings lit by kerosene lamps in large and echoing country houses, the old ants of those who had them passed the time by playing solitaire, while the maid dozed off to the simmering sound of the tea kettle. Someone in me who has taken my life feels nostalgia for this useless peace. The tea arrives and the old deck of cards is placed in a neat stack on a corner of the table. The shadow of the enormous china cabinet makes the dusky dining room still darker. The maid's face sweats with sleepiness as she slowly hurries to finish. I see all of this, inside myself, with an anguish and nostalgia that aren't related to anything, and I find myself considering the state of mind of someone playing solitaire. 352. It's not in open fields or in large gardens that I see spring arrive. It's in the several scrawny trees of a small city square. There the greenness stands out like a special gift and is joyful like a warm sorrow. I love these lonely squares, tucked between streets with little traffic, and themselves with just as little. They are useless clearings, always there waiting, in between forgotten clamor. They are a bit of village in the city. I come to a square walk up one of the streets that runs into it, then back down the same street. Seen from the other direction, the square is different, but the same peace gilds with sudden nostalgia, the setting sun, the view I didn't see when I walked up the street. Everything is useless, and I feel it as such. All that I've lived I've forgotten, as if I'd only vaguely heard it. All that I'll be reminds me of nothing as if I had lived and forgotten it. A sunset of mild sorrow hovers all around me. Everything turns chilly, not because it's colder, but because I've entered a narrow street and the square is gone. 353. The not cold, not warm morning 
gilded over the few houses dotting the slopes at the edge of town. A thin, wide-awake fog was disintegrating into shapeless shreds on the drowsy slopes. It wasn't cold except for the fact life had to resume. And all of this, all this moist coolness of a gentle morning, was analogous to a happiness he had never been able to feel. The tram slowly descended towards the avenues. As it approached the denser concentration of houses, he was vaguely seized by a sense of loss. Human reality was beginning to be visible. In these early morning hours, when the shadows have vanished, but their light weight still lingers, the spirit that yields to the moment's suggestion hankers for arrival in the sun-bathed port of old. One would like not so much to have the moment stand still, as it does for solemn landscapes, or for the moon when it so peacefully shines on the river, but to have had a different life, so that this moment could have a different flavor, more akin to oneself. The uncertain fog thinned even more, the sun penetrated things more deeply, the sounds of life were growing everywhere louder. At times like these, the right thing would be never to arrive at the human reality for which our lives are destined, to hover imponderably in the fog and the morning, not in spirit, but in spiritualized body, in winged real life. That is what would most satisfy our desire to seek a refuge, although there's no reason to seek one. To feel everything in fine detail makes us indifferent, save towards what we can't obtain. Sensations our soul is still too embryonic to grasp, human activities congruent with feeling things deeply, passions and emotions lost among more visible kinds of achievement. The trees that lined the avenues were independent of all this. The morning hour came to an end in the city, like the slope on the other side of the river when the boat touches the wharf. As long as it didn't dock, it bore the scenic view of the far shore on its hull. The scenery fell away at the sound of the hull scraping against the rocks. A man whose trousers were rolled up past his knees placed a clamp on the rope. His gesture was definite, perfectly natural, and it metaphysically concluded with my soul no longer being able to enjoy a doubtful anxiety. The boys on the wharf looked at me as at a normal man, one who would never feel such undue emotion for the practical aspects of docking a boat. 354. Heat, like an invisible piece of clothing, makes one feel like taking it off. 355. I was already feeling uneasy. Without warning, the silence had stopped breathing. Suddenly, the light of all hells cracked like steel. I crouched like an animal against the top of the desk, my hands lying flat like useless paws. A soulless light had swept through all nooks and souls, and the sound of a nearby mountain tumbled down from on high, rending the hard veil of the abyss with a boom. My heart stopped, my throat gulped, my consciousness saw only a blot of ink on a sheet of paper. 356. After the heat had lulled and the light beginning of rain increased until it could be heard, there was a tranquility that the air didn't have when it was hot, a new peace in which the water blew its own breeze. So clear was the joy of this soft rain, with no darkness or threat of storm that even those without raincoats or umbrellas, which was almost everyone, laughingly talked as they stepped quickly down the glistening street. During an idle moment, I walked over to the open office window. The heat had caused it to be open, but the rain hadn't caused it to be shut, and looked with intense and indifferent concentration, as is my custom, at what I just finished accurately describing before I saw it. Yes, there went the joy of two banal souls, smiling as they talked in the fine rain, walking more briskly than hurriedly, in the veiled yet luminous limpid day. But suddenly, popping into my view from behind a corner, there appeared an old, mean-looking, 
poor and unhumble man who impatiently made his way in the rain that was letting up. He surely had no special aim, but at least he had impatience. I looked at him with concentration, no longer the careless kind applied to things, but the kind that discerned symbols. He was the symbol of nobody, which is why he was in a hurry. He was the symbol of those who were never anything. That is why he suffered. He belonged not to those who smile as they feel the rain's joyful discomfort, but to the rain itself, a man so unconscious that he felt reality. That's not what I wanted to say, however. Something stepped in between my observation of the passerby, whom I had at any rate lost view of, because I'd stopped looking at him, and the thread of my reflections. Some mystery from the unobserved, some urgency of the soul, stepped in and prevented me from continuing. And in the depths of my distraction, I hear, without hearing, the voices of the packers at the far end of the office, where the warehouse begins, and without seeing, I see the twine used for parcels, doubly knotted and doubly strung around the volumes wrapped in heavy brown paper, and on the table next to the black window, among jokes and scissors. To see is to have seen. 357. It's a rule of life that we can and should learn from everyone. There are solemn and serious things we can learn from quacks and crooks. There are philosophies taught us by fools. There are lessons in faithfulness and justice brought to us by chance and by those we chance to meet. Everything is in everything. In certain particularly lucid moments of contemplation, like those of early afternoon when I observantly wander through the streets, each person brings me a novelty. Each building teaches me something new. Each poster has a message for me. My silent stroll is a continual conversation. And all of this, men, buildings, stones, posters, and sky, are a huge friendly crowd elbowing each other with words in the great procession of destiny. 358. Yesterday I saw and heard a great man. I don't mean a man reputed to be great, but a man who really is great. He is a man of worth, if there is worth in this world, and people see it, and he knows they see it. Thus he meets all the conditions necessary for me to call him a great man and that's what I call him. His physical appearance is that of a tired businessman. His face shows signs of fatigue, which could be from thinking too much, or simply from not leading a healthy life. His gestures are unremarkable. His gaze has a certain sparkle, the privilege of not being nearsighted. His voice is a bit garbled, as if the beginnings of a general paralysis had affected this particular expression of his soul and his soul, thus expressed, goes on about party politics, about the devaluation of the escudo, and about what's wrong with his colleagues in greatness. If I didn't know who he is, I wouldn't be able to tell by his appearance. I realize that great men need not conform to that heroic ideal of simple souls, whereby a great poet is always an Apollo in body and a Napoleon in expression, or, at the very least, a man of distinction with an expressive face. I realize that such notions are as absurd as they are human. But if we can't expect everything, or almost everything, we can still expect something. And passing from the figure we see to the soul that speaks, although we can't expect vivacity or verve, we should at least be able to count on intelligence and a hint of grandeur. All this, these human disillusions, forces us to question what truth there is, if any, in our common notion of inspiration. It seems that this body of a businessman and this soul of a polite, educated fellow must, when all by themselves, be mysteriously endowed with some inner thing that's extraneous to them. It seems that they don't speak, but that some voice speaks through them, uttering what would be falsehood if they said it. These are casual and useless speculations. I sometimes regret indulging in them, 
They don't diminish the worth of the man, nor increase his body's expressiveness. But then, there isn't anything that changes anything. And what we say or do merely brushes the tops of the hills, in whose valleys everything sleeps. 359. No one understands anyone else. We are, as the poet said, islands in the sea of life. Between us flows the sea that defines and separates us. However much one soul strives to know another, he can know only what is told him by a word, a shapeless shadow on the ground of his understanding. I love expressions, because I know nothing of what they express. I'm like the master of St. Martha. I'm satisfied with what I've been given. I see, and that's quite enough. Who can understand anything? Perhaps it's this skepticism, vis-a-vis -vis our understanding, that makes me look at a tree and at a face, a poster and a smile, in exactly the same way. Everything is natural, everything artificial, everything equal. Everything I see is for me the merely visible, whether it be the lofty blue sky, tinted with the whitish green of a pre-dawn morning, or the false frown on the face of someone suffering the death of a loved one before witnesses. Sketches, illustrations, pages we look at and then turn. My heart isn't in them, and my gaze merely passes over them on the outside like a fly over a sheet of paper. Do I even know if I feel, if I think, if I exist? I know only that there's an objective scheme of colors, shapes, and expressions, of which I'm the useless shifting mirror for sale. 360. Compared with real, ordinary men who walk down the streets of life with a natural, fortuitous goal in mind, those who sit around in cafes cut a figure that can be described only by comparing them to certain elves from dreams, creatures that aren't exactly nightmarish or anguishing, but whose remembrance, when we wake up, leaves a foul taste in our mouth that we don't quite understand, a feeling of deep disgust that's not for them directly, but for something they embody. I see the world's true geniuses and conquerors, both great and small, sailing in the night of things, oblivious to what their haughty boats are cutting through in that gulfweed sea of packing straw and crumbled cork. Everything is summed up in those cafes, just like in the inner court behind the office building, which, through the grating of the warehouse window, looks like a jail cell for confining rubbish. 361. The Search for Truth be it the subjective truth of belief, the objective truth of reality, or the social truth of money or power, always confers, on the searcher who merits a prize, the ultimate knowledge of its non-existence. The grand prize of life goes only to those who bought tickets by chance. The value of art is that it takes us away from here. 362. It's legitimate to break ordinary moral laws in obedience to a higher moral law. Hunger is no excuse for stealing a loaf of bread, but an artist can be excused for stealing 10,000 escudos to guarantee his sustenance and tranquility for two years, provided his work seeks to advance human civilization. If it's merely an aesthetic work, then the argument doesn't hold. 363. We cannot love, son. Love is the most carnal of illusions. Listen. To love is to possess. And what does a lover possess? The body? To possess it, we would have to incorporate it, to eat it, to make its substance our own. And this impossibility, were it possible, wouldn't last, because our body passes on and transforms because we don't even possess our body, just our sensation of it. And because once the beloved body were possessed, it would become ours and stop being other. And so love, with the disappearance of the other, would likewise disappear. Do we possess the soul? Listen carefully. 
No, we don't. Not even our own soul is ours. And how could a soul ever be possessed? Between one and another soul lies the impassable chasm of the fact that they are two souls. What do we possess? What do we possess? What makes us love? Beauty? And do we possess it when we love it? If we intensely, totally possess a body, what do we really possess? Not the body, not the soul, and not even beauty. When we grasp an attractive body, it's not beauty, but fatty and cellular flesh that we embrace. Our kiss doesn't touch the mouth's beauty, but the wet flesh of decaying, membranous lips. And even sexual intercourse, though admittedly a close and ardent contact, is not a true penetration, not even of one body into another. What do we possess? What do we really possess? Our own sensations, at least? Isn't love at least a means of possessing ourselves through our sensations? Isn't it at least a way of dreaming vividly, and therefore more gloriously, the dream that we exist? And once the sensation has vanished, doesn't the memory at least stay with us always, so that we really possess? Let's cast off even this delusion. We don't even possess our own sensations. Don't speak. Memory is no more than our sensation of the past, and every sensation is an illusion. Listen to me. Keep listening. Listen and don't look out the window at the river's far shore, so flat and smooth, nor at the twilight text is missing, nor towards the train whistle cutting the empty distance. Listen to me carefully. We do not possess our sensations, and through them we cannot possess ourselves. The tilted urn of twilight pours out on us in oil, text is missing, in which the hours, like rose petals, separately float. 364. How can I possess with my body when I don't even possess my body? How can I possess with my soul when I don't possess my soul? How can I understand with my mind when I don't understand my mind? There is no body or truth we possess, nor even any illusion. We are phantoms made of lies, shadows of illusions, and our life is hollow on both the outside and the inside. Does anyone know the borders of his soul, that he can say, I am I? But I know that I'm the one who feels what I feel. When someone else possesses this body, does he possess the same thing in it as I? No. He possesses another sensation. Is there anything that we possess? If we don't know who we are, how can we know what we possess? If, referring to what you eat, you were to say, I possess this, then I would understand you, because you obviously incorporate what you eat into yourself. You transform it into your substance. You feel it enter into you and belong to you. But it's not with regard to what you eat that you speak of possession. What do you call possessing? 365. The madness known as affirmation the sickness called belief, the infamy of being happy. All of this reeks of the world. It smacks of this sad thing that is the earth. Be indifferent. Love the sunset and the dawn because it does no good, not even for you, to love them. Dress yourself in the gold of the dying afternoon, like a king disposed on a morning of roses in full bloom with May in the white clouds and the smile of virgins in secluded villas. Let your yearning perish among myrtles, your tedium cease among tamarinds, and may the sound of water accompany all of this as if it were twilight on the banks of a river whose only meaning is to flow, eternal, towards distant seas. The rest is but the life that leaves us, the sparkle in our eyes that fades the purple robes worn thin even before we don them, the moon that shines down on our exile, the stars that spread their silence over our hour of disillusionment. 
Assiduous is the sterile and friendly grief that clasps us against its breast with love. Decadence is my destiny. My domain of old was in deep valleys. The water that trickled in my dreams was never tainted by blood. The tree's foliage that forgets life was always green in my forgetting. The moon was fluid like water between stones. Love never reached that valley, which is why life was happy there. Neither love nor dreams nor gods in temples, and we walked in the breeze in the invisible hour without any nostalgia for drunken, useless beliefs. 366. Useless landscapes, like those that wind around Chinese teacups, starting out from the handle and abruptly ending at the handle. The cups are always so small. Where would the landscape lead to, and with what, text is missing, of porcelain, if it could continue past the teacup handle? Certain souls are capable of feeling heartfelt grief because the painted landscape on a Chinese fan isn't three-dimensional. 367. And the chrysanthemums languish their sickly life in gardens made gloomy by their presence. The Japanese luxuriance of having only two apparent dimensions. The colorful existence of Japanese figures circling teacups dull translucence. A table set for a discreet tea, a mere pretext for perfectly sterile conversations, has always struck me as a kind of living thing an individuality with soul. It forms, like an organism, a synthetic whole, which is not the mere sum of its component parts. 368. And the dialogues in those fantastical gardens that indefinitely circle certain teacups. What sublime words the two figures seated on the other side of that teapot must be exchanging. And I, without ears to hear them, a dead member of polychromatic humanity. Exquisite psychology of truly static things, a psychology woven by eternity, and the expression of a painted figure, from the summit of its visible eternity, disdains our transitory fever, which never lingers at the windows of an attitude, nor pauses at the gates of a gesture. Just imagine the folklore of the colorful people who inhabit paintings. The loves of embroidered figures, loves marked by a two-dimensional geometric chastity, should be, text is added, probed for the entertainment of venturesome psychologists. We don't love, we only pretend to. True love, immortal and useless, belongs to those figures whose feelings never change, since by nature they're static. Ever since I've known the Japanese man who sits on the convex, text is added, surface of my teapot. He has yet to make a move. He has never savored the hand of the woman who is forever out of reach. Enervated colors like those of an emptied, poured-out sun eternally unrealize the slopes of that hill, and the whole scene observes a moment of sorrow, a sorrow more faithful than the one that right now fills, without filling, the hollowness in my weary hours. 369. In this metallic age of barbarians, only a relentless cultivation of our ability to dream, to analyze, and to captivate can prevent our personality from degenerating into nothing or else into a personality like all the rest. Whatever is real in our sensations is precisely what we have that isn't ours. The sensations common to us all are what constitute reality. Our sensation's individuality, therefore, lies in whatever they have that's erroneous. What joy it would give me to see a scarlet-colored sun! How totally and exclusively mine it would be! 370. I never let my feelings know what I'm going to make them feel. I play with my sensations like a bored princess with her large, viciously agile cats. I slammed doors within me where certain sensations were about to pass in order to be realized. I quickly clear their path of mental objects that might cause them to make gestures. Little nonsense phrases inserted into the conversations we pretend to be having. 
meaningless affirmations made from the ashes of other equally meaningless affirmations. Your gaze reminds me of music played on a boat in the middle of a mysterious river with woods on the facing shore. Don't say that. It's a chilly moonlit night. I abhor moonlit nights. There are people who actually play music on moonlit nights. That's also a possibility, an unfortunate one, of course. But your gaze evidently wants to be nostalgic about something. It lacks the feeling it expresses. In the falseness of your expression, I can see many of the illusions that I've had. I can assure you that I sometimes feel what I say, and even, despite being a woman, what I say through my gaze. Aren't you being harsh on yourself? Don't we really feel what we think we're feeling? Does this conversation, for example, have any semblance of reality? Surely not. It would be unacceptable in a novel. And with good reason. Look, I'm not absolutely certain that I'm talking with you. In spite of being a woman, I made it my duty to be an illustration in the picture book of a mad artist. Some of my detail is overly precise. I realize it gives the impression of an overwrought, somewhat forced reality. To be an illustration seems to me the only ideal worthy of a contemporary woman. As a child, I wanted to be the queen of one of the suits in a deck of old cards we had at home. This seemed to me like such a compassionately heraldic vocation. For a child, of course, such aspirations are common. Only later, when all our aspirations are immoral, do we really think about this. Since I never talk to children, I believe in their artistic instinct. You know, even as I'm talking, I'm trying to fathom the true meaning of the things you've been telling me. Do you forgive me? Not entirely. We should never plumb the feelings that other people pretend to have. They're always too intimate. Don't think it doesn't hurt me to share these intimate secrets, all of which are false, but which represent true tatters of my pathetic soul. The most pitiful thing about us, believe me, is what we really aren't, and our worst tragedies take place in the idea we have of ourselves. That's so true. Why say it? You've hurt me. Why ruin the constant unreality of our conversation? This way it almost becomes a plausible interchange at a table set for tea between a beautiful woman and a dreamer of sensations. You're right. Now it's my turn to ask forgiveness. But I was distracted and really didn't notice that I'd said something that makes sense. Let's change the subject. How late it always is. Don't get upset again. The sentence I just said, after all, is complete nonsense. Don't apologize, and don't pay any attention to what we're talking about. Every good conversation should be a two-way monologue. We should ultimately be unable to tell whether we really talked with someone or simply imagined the conversation. The best and profoundest conversations, and the least morally intrusive ones, are those that novelists have between two characters from one of their books. For example, For heaven's sake, don't tell me you were going to cite an example. That's only done in grammar books. Perhaps you've forgotten that we don't even read them. Did you ever read a grammar book? Never. I've always despised knowing the correct way to say something. All I ever liked in grammar books were the exceptions and pleonisms. To dodge the rules and say useless things sums up the essentially modern attitude. Did I say that correctly? Absolutely. What's especially irritating in grammar books, have you noticed how exquisitely impossible it is for us to be talking about this? The most irritating part of these books is the chapter on verbs, since these are what give meaning to the sentences. An honest sentence should always have any number of possible meanings. Verbs. A friend of mine who committed suicide, every time I have a longish conversation, I suicide a friend, was going to dedicate his life to destroying verbs. Why did he commit suicide? Wait, I still don't know. He wanted to discover and develop a method for surreptitiously not completing sentences. He used to say that he was searching for the microbe of meaning. He committed suicide, yes, of course, because one day he realized what a tremendous responsibility he'd assumed. The enormity of the problem made him go nuts. A revolver and... 
No, that's preposterous. Don't you see that it could never be a revolver? A man like that never shoots himself in the head. You understand very little about the friends you've never had. That's a serious defect, you know. My best girlfriend, a ravishing young man I invented. Do you get along? As best we can. But this girl you can't imagine. The two figures sitting at the table, set for tea, surely didn't have this conversation. But they were so well-groomed and dressed that it seemed a pity for them not to talk this way. That's why I wrote this conversation for them to have had. Their gestures, mannerisms, playful glances and smiles. Those short interludes in the conversation when we stop feeling our own existence. Clearly expressed what I faithfully pretend to be reporting. After they go their separate ways, each marrying someone else, since they think too much alike to marry each other, if one day they happen to look at these pages, I think they'll recognize what they never said and will be grateful to me for so accurately interpreting not only what they really are, but also what they never wished to be, nor ever knew they were. If they read me, may they believe that this was what they really said. In the words that they apparently heard from each other, there were so many text is missing, things missing, such as the fragrance in the air, the tea's aroma, the meaning of the corsage of text is missing, which she wore on her chest. Although never stated, those things formed part of the conversation. All these things were there, and so my task isn't really to write literature, but history. I reconstruct, completing what's missing, and this will serve as my excuse to them for having eavesdropped on what they didn't say and wouldn't have wanted to say. 371. In praise of absurdity. I speak in earnest and with sadness. It's not a matter for joy, because the joys of dreaming are contradictory and gloomy, and must be enjoyed in a special, mysterious way. Sometimes I inwardly, objectively observe delightful and absurd things, which I can't even imagine seeing for they're illogical to our eyesight. Bridges that connect nothing to nothing. Roads without beginning or end. Upside-down landscapes. The absurd, the illogical, the contradictory. Everything that detaches and removes us from reality and its vast entourage of practical thoughts, human feelings, and all notions of useful and profitable action. Absurdity prevents the state of spirit in which dreaming is a sweet fury from ever becoming too tedious. And I have a peculiar, mysterious way of envisioning these absurdities. In some way I can't explain, I'm able to see these things that are inconceivable to any kind of human vision. 372. In Praise of Absurdity Let's Absurdity Life from East to West 373. Life is an experimental journey that we make involuntarily. It is a journey of the mind through matter, and since it is the mind that journeys, that is where we live. And so there are contemplative souls who have lived more intensely, more widely, and more turbulently than those who live externally. The end result is what counts. What was felt is what was lived. A dream can tire us out as much as physical labor. We never live as hard as when we've thought a great deal. The man in the corner of the dance hall dances with all the dancers. He sees everything, and because he sees everything, he lives everything. Since everything is ultimately our own sensation, to have actual contact with a body counts for no more than seeing it or just remembering it. I dance, therefore, when I see someone else dance. I second the English poet, who lying in the grass and watching three mowers in the distance, said, A fourth man is mowing, and that fourth am I. All of this, told the way I feel it, has to do with the great weariness that came over me today, suddenly and for no apparent reason. I'm not only weary, but embittered. And the bitterness is also a mystery. I feel so anguished I'm on the verge of tears. Not the kind that are wept, but the kind that stay inside. Tears caused by a sickness of the soul, not by a sensible pain. How much I've lived without having lived. 
how much I've thought without having thought. I'm exhausted from worlds of static violence, from adventures I've experienced without moving a muscle. I'm surfeited with what I've never had and never will, jaded by gods that so far don't exist. I bear the wounds of all the battles I've avoided. My muscles are sore from all the effort I have never even thought of making. Dull, silent, futile. The lofty sky is of a flawed, dead summer. I look at it as if it weren't there. I sleep what I think. I'm lying down as I walk. I suffer without feeling anything. My enormous nostalgia is for nothing, is nothing. Like the lofty sky that I don't see and that I'm staring at impersonally. 374. In the day's limpid perfection, the sun-filled air nevertheless stagnates. It's not the present pressure of the future storm, not a malaise in our involuntary bodies, not a vague haziness in the true blue sky. It's the torpor that the thought of not working makes us feel, a feather tickling our dozing face. It's sultry, but it's summer. The countryside appeals even to those who don't like it. If I were someone else, this would no doubt be a happy day for me, because I'd feel it without thinking about it. I would look forward to finishing my normal day's work, which to me is monotonously abnormal day after day, and then take the train to Benfica with some friends. We would eat dinner right as the sun was setting, in one of the garden restaurants. Our happiness in that moment would be part of the landscape, and recognized as such by all who saw us. But since I'm me, I merely take a little pleasure in the little that it is to imagine myself as that someone else. Yes, soon he, I, under a tree or bower, will eat twice what I can eat, drink twice what I dare drink, and laugh twice what I can conceive of laughing. Soon he, now I. Yes, for a moment I was someone else. In someone else I saw and lived this human and humble joy of existing as an animal in shirt sleeves. Great day that made me dream all this. The sky is sublimely blue, like my fleeting dream of being a hale and hearty sales representative on a sort of holiday when the day's work is over. 375. The countryside is always where we aren't. There and there alone do real trees and real shade exist. Life is the hesitation between an exclamation and a question. Doubt is resolved by a period. Miracles are God's laziness, or rather, the laziness we ascribe to God when we invent miracles. The gods are the incarnation of what we can never be, the weariness of all hypotheses. 376. The slight inebriation of a mild fever, with its soft and penetrating discomfort that's cold in our aching bones and warm in our eyes, under our throbbing temples. I adore that discomfort, like a slave his beloved oppressor. It puts me in that state of feeble, quivering passivity, in which I glimpse visions, turn corners of ideas, and get lost among sudden and unexpected feelings. Thinking, feeling, and wanting become a single confused thing. Beliefs, sensations, imagined things and real things get all mixed up, like the contents of various drawers overturned onto the floor. 377. There's a kind of sad happiness in the feeling of convalescence, especially if the sickness that preceded it affected the nerves. There's an autumn in our emotions and thoughts, or rather, a beginning of spring that except for the absence of falling leaves, seems, in the air and in the sky, like autumn. Our fatigue is pleasant, and the pleasantness hurts a little. We feel a bit removed from life, though still in it, as if on the balcony of life's house. We become pensive without actually thinking. We feel without any definable emotion. Our will grows calm, for we have no need of it. That's when certain memories, certain hopes, and certain vague desires slowly climb the slope of consciousness, like indistinct wayfarers 
seen from the top of a mountain. Memories of futile things. Hopes whose non-fulfillment didn't particularly matter. Desires that weren't violent in nature or in their manifestation, that weren't ever able to want really to be. When the day is in keeping with these sensations, today, for example, which is rather cloudy even though it's summer, with a slight wind that feels almost chilly for not being warm, then the particular mood in which we think, feel, and live these impressions is accentuated. Not that the memories, hopes, and desires we've had become any clearer, but we feel them more, and their indefinite sum total weighs a little, absurdly, on the heart. In this moment I feel strangely far away. I'm on the balcony of life, yes, but not exactly of this life. I'm above life, looking down on it. It lies before me, descending in a varied landscape of dips and terraces, towards the smoke from the white houses of the villages in the valley. If I close my eyes, I keep seeing, because I'm not really seeing. If I open them, I see no more, because I wasn't really seeing in the first place. I'm nothing but a vague nostalgia, not for the past, nor for the future, but for the present. Anonymous, unending, and unintelligible. 378 the classifiers of things, by which I mean those scientists whose science is merely to classify, generally don't realize that what's classifiable is indefinite and thus cannot be classified. But what really astounds me is that they don't realize that there are things hidden in the cracks of knowledge, things of the soul and of consciousness, that can also be classified. Perhaps because I think too much or dream too much, or perhaps for some other reason, I don't distinguish between the reality that exists and the world of my dreams, which is the reality that doesn't exist. And so, in my ruminations about the sky and the earth, I insert things that aren't lit up by the sun or trod on by feet, fluid wonders of my imagination. I gild myself with sunsets I invent, but what I invent is alive in my imagination. I rejoice in imaginary breezes, but the imaginary lives while it's being imagined, and I have a soul, according to various hypotheses, and each of these hypotheses has its own soul, which it gives to me. The only problem is that of reality, as insoluble as it is alive. What do I know about the differences between a tree and a dream? I can touch the tree, I know that I have the dream. What is all this really? What is all this? It's that I, alone in the deserted office, can imaginatively live without abstaining from my intelligence. My thinking isn't interrupted by the vacant desks and the shipping division that's empty except for brown paper and balls of string. I'm not at my stool but leaning back in Mortiera's comfortable armchair, enjoying a premature promotion. Perhaps it's the influence of my surroundings that has anointed me with distraction. These dog days make me tired. I sleep without sleeping for lack of energy. And that's why I think this way. 379. Dolorous Interlude I'm tired of the street, but no, I'm not tired of it. The street is all of life. There's the tavern opposite, which I can see if I look over my right shoulder and there are the piled-up crates, which I can see by looking over my left shoulder, and in the middle, which I can only see if I turn around completely, there's the steady sound of the shoemaker's hammer at the entrances to the offices of the Africa Company. I don't know what's on the upper floors. On the third floor, there's a rooming house which is said to be immoral, but so it is with everything, life. Tired of the street? Only thinking makes me tired. When I look at the street, or feel it, then I don't think. I do my work with great inner repose, ensconced in my corner, bookkeepingly nobody. I have no soul. Nobody here does. It's all just work in this large office. Where millionaires live the good life, always in some foreign country or other, there is likewise work, and likewise no soul. And all that will remain is one or another poet, 
If only a phrase of mine could remain, just one thing I've written that would make people say, well done. Like the numbers I register, copying them in the book of my entire life. I think that I shall always be an assistant bookkeeper in a fabric warehouse. I hope, with absolute sincerity, never to be promoted to head bookkeeper. 380. For a long time, I'm not sure if for days or for months, I haven't recorded any impressions. I don't think, therefore, I don't exist. I've forgotten who I am. I'm unable to write because I'm unable to be. Through an oblique slumber, I've been someone else. To realize I don't remember myself means that I've woken up. I passed out for a time, cut off from my life. I returned to myself without remembering what I've been, and the memory of what I used to be suffers from having been interrupted. I have a confused impression of a mysterious interlude. Part of my memory is vainly struggling to find the other part. I can't pull myself together. If I've lived during this time, I forgot to be aware of it. It's not that this first day that really feels like autumn, the first uncomfortably cool one to dress the dead summer with less light, gives me, through a kind of distracted clarity, a sensation of dead purpose and false desire. It's not that in this interlude of lost things there's a pale trace of useless memory. It's more painful than that. It's a tedium of trying to remember what can't be recalled. An anguish over what my consciousness has lost among the reeds and seaweed, on the seashore of who knows what. I know that the clear, still day has a veritable sky whose blue is less vivid than a deep blue. I know that the sun, slightly less golden than it was, bathes the walls and windows with its humid glimmers. I know that, although there is no wind, nor a breeze to recall and negate it, a wakeful coolness dozes in the hazy city. I know all this, without thinking or wanting to, and I'm sleepy only because I remember to be sleepy, nostalgic only because I'm disquieted. I remotely and futilely convalesce from the sickness I never had. Wide awake, I prepare myself for what I don't dare. What sleepiness kept me from sleeping? What endearment refused to speak to me? How good to be someone else, taking in a deep, cold breath of vigorous spring. How good, much better than life, to be able at least to imagine it, while in the distance. In the image I remember, the blue-green reeds bow along the riverside, where there's not a hint of wind. How often, remembering who I wasn't, I think of myself young and forget all the rest. The landscapes that existed but that I never saw were different then, and the landscapes that didn't exist but that I did see were new to me. Why do I care? I ended up in interstices, led on by chance, and now, as the sun itself seems to radiate coolness, the dark reeds by the river sleep coldly in the sunset that I see but do not have. 381. No one has yet defined tedium in a language comprehensible to those who have never experienced it. What some people call tedium is merely boredom. Others use the term to mean a nagging discomfort. Still others consider tedium to be weariness. But while tedium includes weariness, discomfort, and boredom, it doesn't resemble them any more than water resembles the hydrogen and oxygen of which it is composed. If some have a limited and incomplete notion of tedium, a few people give it a meaning that in a certain way transcends it, as when they use the word to signify intellectual and visceral dissatisfaction with the world's diversity and uncertainty. What makes us yawn, which we call boredom, what makes us fidget and is known as discomfort, and what makes us practically immobile, namely weariness, None of these things is tedium, but neither is tedium the profound sense of life's emptiness that causes frustrated ambition to surface, disappointed longings to rise up, and the seed to be planted in the soul of the future mystic or saint. Tedium, yes, is boredom with the world, 
the nagging discomfort of living, the weariness of having lived. Tedium is indeed the carnal sensation of the endless emptiness of things. But tedium, even more than all that, is a boredom with other worlds, whether real or imaginary, the discomfort of having to keep living, albeit as someone else, in some other way, in some other world. A weariness not only of yesterday and today, but also of tomorrow and of eternity, if such exists, or of nothingness, if that's what eternity is. It's not only the emptiness of things and living beings that troubles the soul afflicted by tedium. It's also the emptiness of something besides things and beings, the emptiness of the very soul that feels this vacuum, that feels itself to be this vacuum and that within this vacuum is nauseated and repelled by its own self. Tedium is the physical sensation of chaos, a chaos that is everything. The bored, the uncomfortable, and the weary feel like prisoners in a narrow cell. Those who abhor the narrowness of life itself feel shackled inside a large cell. But those who suffer tedium feel imprisoned in the worthless freedom of an infinite cell. The walls of the narrow cell may collapse and bury those who are bored, uncomfortable, or tired. The shackles may fall and allow the man who abhors life's puniness to escape, or they may cause him pain as he struggles in vain to remove them and, through the feeling of that pain, revive him without his old abhorrence. But the walls of the infinite cell cannot crumble and bury us, because they don't exist nor can we be revived by the pain of shackles no one has put on us. This is what I feel before the placid beauty of this eternally dying afternoon. I look at the lofty, clear sky where I see fuzzy, pinkish shapes like the shadows of clouds, an impalpable soft down of a winged and faraway life. I look below me at the river, whose ever so slightly shimmering water is of a blue that seems to mirror a deeper sky. I raise my eyes back to the sky, where the colored fuzziness that shredlessly unravels in the visible air is now tinged by a frigid shade of dull white, as if something in the higher, more rarefied sphere of things had its own material tedium, an impossibility of being what it is, an imponderable body of anguish and desolation. But what's in the lofty air besides the lofty air, which is nothing? What's in the sky besides a color that is not its own? What in these tatters that aren't even of clouds, and whose very existence I doubt, besides a few glimmers of materially arriving rays from an already resigned sun? What's in all this besides myself? Ah, but that, and that alone, is tedium. In all of this, the sky, the earth, the world, there is nothing at all but me. 382. I've reached the point where tedium is a person, the incarnate fiction of my own company. 383. The outer world exists like an actor on a stage. It's there, but is something else. 384. And everything is an incurable sickness. The indolence of feeling. The frustration of never knowing how to do anything. The inability to take action. 385. Fog or smoke? Was it rising from the ground or descending from the sky? Impossible to say. It seems more like a disease of the air than an emanation or something descended. Sometimes it seemed more like an ailment of the eyes than a reality of nature. Whatever it was, the entire landscape was cloaked by a hazy uneasiness made of forgetfulness and attenuation. It was as if the silence of the delinquent sun had taken shape in an imperfect body, or as if a general intuition that something was going to happen had caused the visible world to disguise itself. It was hard to tell if the sky was filled with clouds or fog. It was all a torpid haze that was colored here and there, 
a grayness with just a hint of yellow, except where it had dissolved into a false pink or had bluely stagnated, though this blue may have been the sky showing through rather than another blue overlaying it. Nothing was definite, not even the indefinite. That's why it was only natural to call the fog smoke, since it didn't seem like fog, or to ask whether it was fog or smoke, it being impossible to determine. Even the air's temperature contributed to that doubt. It wasn't hot or cold or in between, but seemed to be composed of elements that had nothing to do with heat. Indeed, the fog that felt cool to the eyes seemed hot to the touch, as if sight and touch were two distinct modes of the same faculty of perception. One couldn't even find, around the outlines of the trees or the corners of buildings, that blurring of contours and edges caused by true fog when it sets in, nor the slipping into view and out of view caused by real smoke. It was as if each thing projected its own vaguely diurnal shadow, in all directions, without a source of light to explain it as shadow, and without a specific place where it was projected to justify it as something visible. Nor, in fact, was it visible. It was like something about to appear, equally throughout, as if it hesitated to be revealed. And what feeling prevailed? The impossibility of having any feeling the heart all broken in pieces in the mind. Feelings all in a jumble, conscious existence in a stupor, in the beginning of some faculty akin to hearing, but in the soul, in order to apprehend a definite, useless revelation that's always on the verge of appearing, like truth, and that always remains, like truth, the twin of what never appears. Even the desire to sleep remembered by the mind, has withered because mere yawning seems like too much of an effort. Even to stop seeing hurts the eyes. And in the soul's complete and colorless renunciation, only external, distant sounds constitute what's left of the impossible world. Ah, another world, other things, another soul with which to feel them, another mind with which to know this soul. Anything, even tedium, Anything but this general blurring of the soul in things, this bluish, forlorn indefiniteness of everything. 386. Together and apart, we walked along the forest's sharply turning paths. Foreign to us, our steps were united, for they went in unison over the crackling softness of the yellow and half-green leaves that matted the ground's unevenness. But they also went separately, for we were two minds, with nothing in common except for the fact that what we weren't was treading in unison over the same resonant ground. Autumn had already begun, and besides the leaves under our feet we could hear, in the wind's rough accompaniment, the constant falling of other leaves, or sounds of leaves, wherever we walked or had walked. There was no landscape but the forest which veiled all others. But it was a good enough place for people like us, whose only life was to walk diversely and in unison over a moribund ground. I believe it was the close of day, the close of that day or any day, or perhaps all days, in an autumn that was all autumns, in the symbolic and true forest. Not even we could say what homes, duties, and loves we'd left behind. We were, in that moment, no more than wayfarers between what we had forgotten and what we didn't know, knights on foot defending an abandoned ideal. But that explained, along with the steady sound of trampled leaves and the forever rough sound of an unsteady wind, the reason for our departure, or for our return, since, not knowing what the path was, or why, we didn't know if we were coming or going. And always, all around us, the sound of leaves we couldn't see, falling we didn't know where, lulled the forest to sleep with sadness. Although we paid no attention to each other, neither of us would have continued alone. We kept each other company with the drowsiness we both felt. 
The sound of our steps in unison helped each of us to think without the other, whereas our own solitary steps would have brought the other to mind. The forest was all false clearings, as if the forest itself were false, or were ending. But neither it nor the falseness was going to end. Our steps kept going in unison, and around the sound of the leaves we were trampling, we heard a very soft sound of leaves falling in the forest that had become everything, in the forest that was the universe. Who were we? Were we two or two forms of one? We didn't know, and we didn't ask. The hazy sun presumably existed, for it wasn't night in the forest. A vague aim presumably existed, for we were walking. Some world or other presumably existed, since a forest existed. But what it was or might be was foreign to us, two perpetual walkers treading in unison over dead leaves, anonymous and impossible listeners to falling leaves, nothing else. A now harsh, now gentle murmur of the inscrutable wind, a now loud, now soft rustle of the unfallen leaves, a vestige, a doubt, a goal that had perished, an illusion that never was. The forest, the two walkers, and I, I, unsure of which one I was, or if I was both, or neither. And without seeing it to the end, I watched the tragedy of nothing ever having existed, but the autumn and the forest. The always rough and unsteady wind, and the always fallen or falling leaves. And always, as if surely there were a sun and day out there, one could see clearly, to nowhere, in the clamorous silence of the forest. 387. I suppose I'm what they call a decadent, one whose spirit is outwardly defined by those sad glimmers of artificial eccentricity that incarnate an anxious and artful soul in unusual words. Yes, I think that's what I am, and that I'm absurd. That's why, in the spirit of a classical writer, I try at least to place into an expressive mathematics the decorative sensations of my substituted soul. At a certain point in my written cogitation, I no longer know where the center of my attention lies, whether in the scattered sensations I attempt to describe like enigmatic tapestries, or in the words which absorb me as I try to describe the acts of describing, and which, absorbing me, distract me and cause me to see other things. Beset by lucid and free associations of ideas, images, and words, I say what I imagine I'm feeling as much as what I'm really feeling, and I'm unable to distinguish between the suggestions of my soul and the fruits born of images that fell from my soul to the ground. Nor do I know whether the sound of a discordant word or the rhythm of an incidental phrase might not be diverting me from the already hazy point, from the already slowed sensation, thereby absolving me from thinking and saying, like long voyages designed to distract us. And all of this, which even as I'm telling it, should stir in me a sense of futility, failure, and anguish, gives me only wings of gold. As soon as I start talking about images, even if it's to say they should be used sparingly, images are born in me. As soon as I stand up for myself to repudiate something I don't feel, I start feeling that very thing, and even my repudiation becomes a feeling trimmed with embroidery. As soon as I want to abandon myself to the wind, having lost faith in my efforts, a placid phrase or a sober, concrete adjective suddenly, like sunlight, makes me clearly see the dormantly written page before me, and the letters drawn in my ink are an absurd map of magic signs. And I lay myself aside like my pen, and wrap myself in the flowing cape of obliviously leaning back, far away, intermediate and submissive, doomed like a castaway, drowning within sight of marvelous islands engulfed by the same purplish seas that he had so truly dreamed in distant beds. 388. 
Let's make the receptivity of our senses purely literary. And let's convert our emotions, when they stoop to becoming apparent, into visible matter that can be sculpted into statues with fluid, glowing words. 389. Creator of indifferences is the motto I want for my spirit today. I'd like my life's activity to consist, above all, in educating others to feel more and more for themselves, and less and less according to the dynamic law of collectiveness. To educate people in that spiritual antisepsis, which precludes contamination by commonness and vulgarity, is the loftiest destiny I can imagine for the pedagogue of inner discipline that I aspire to be. If all who read me would learn, slowly, of course, as the subject matter requires, to be completely insensitive to other people's opinions and even their glances, that would be enough of a garland to make up for my life's scholastic stagnation. My inability to act has always been an ailment with a metaphysical ideology. I've always felt that to perform a gesture implied a disturbance, a repercussion, in the outer universe. I've always had the impression that any movement I might make would unsettle the stars and rock the skies. And so the tiniest gesture assumed for me early on a metaphysical significance of astonishing proportions. I developed an attitude of transcendental honesty with respect to all action. And ever since this attitude took firm hold in my consciousness, it has prevented me from having intense relations with the tangible world. 390. To know how to be superstitious is still one of the arts which, developed to perfection, distinguishes the superior man. 391. Ever since I've been using my idle moments to observe and meditate, I've noticed that people don't agree or know the truth about anything that's of real importance in life or that would be useful for living it. The most exact science is mathematics, which lives in the cloister of its own laws and rules. When applied, yes, it elucidates other sciences, but it can elucidate only what they discover. It cannot help in the discovery. In the other sciences, the only sure and accepted facts are those that don't matter for life's supreme ends. Physics knows the expansion coefficient for iron, but it doesn't know the true mechanics of the world's composition. And the more we advance in what we'd like to know, the more we fall behind in what we do know. Metaphysics would seem to be the supreme guide, since it alone is concerned with ultimate truth and life's supreme ends. But it isn't even a scientific theory, just a pile of bricks that these or those hands form into awkward houses with no mortar holding them together. I've also noticed that the only difference between humans and animals is the way they deceive themselves and remain ignorant about the life they live. Animals don't know what they do. They're born, they grow up, they live, and they die without thought, reflection, or a real future. And how many men live differently from animals? We all sleep, and the only difference is in what we dream, and in the degree and quality of our dreaming. Perhaps death will awaken us, but we can't even be sure of that unless it's by faith, for which believing is having, by hope, for which wanting is possessing, or by charity, for which giving is receiving. It's raining on this cold and sad winter afternoon, as if it had been raining just as monotonously since the very first page of the world. It's raining, and as if the rain had made them hunch forward, my feelings lower their stupid gaze to the ground, where water flows and nourishes nothing, washes nothing, cheers up nothing. It's raining, and I suddenly feel the terrible weight of being an animal that doesn't know what it is, dreaming its thought and emotion, withdrawn into a spatial region of being, as into a hovel, satisfied by a little heat, as by an eternal truth. 392. 
The people are a regular guy. The people are never humanitarian. What most characterizes this fellow called the people is a narrow focus on his interests and a careful exclusion, as far as possible, of the interests of others. When the people lose their tradition, it means that the social bond has been severed. And when the social bond is severed, then the bond between the people and the minority who aren't like them is also severed. And the severing of the social bond between the minority and the people spells the death of art and true science. The end of the main agencies on whose existence civilization depends. To exist is to deny. What am I today, living today, but the denial of who and what I was yesterday? To exist is to contradict oneself. Nothing better symbolizes life than those news articles that contradict today what the newspaper said yesterday. To want is to be unable to achieve. The man who wanted something he achieved didn't want it until it was already in his power to achieve. The man who wants will never achieve, because he loses himself in wanting. These principles seem fundamental to me. 393 contemptible like the aims we live for, without our having chosen those aims. Most, if not all men, live a contemptible life, contemptible in all its joys, and contemptible in almost all its sorrows, except those that have to do with death, when our very life denies itself. Through the filter of my inattention, I hear fluid, scattered sounds, which rise like intermittently flowing waves from outside, as if they came from another world. Cries of vendors selling what's natural, such as vegetables, or what's social, such as lottery tickets. The round scraping of wheels from carts and wagons that hurriedly jerk forward. Cars whose veering makes more noise than their motors. The shaking of some sort of cloth out of some window. The whistle of a little boy the laughter from an upper floor, the metallic groan of the tram one street over, the jumble of sounds issuing from the cross street, a mismatch of loud noises, soft noises, and silences, halting rumbles of traffic, some footsteps, beginnings, middles, and ends of people's utterances. And all of this exists for me, who am sleeping while thinking of it like a stone poking out of a patch of grass where it doesn't belong. Next, and coming through the wall of my rented room, it's domestic sounds that flow together in a stream. Footsteps, dishes, the broom, a song that's cut short, last night's balcony rendezvous, irritation because something is missing from the dining table, someone asking for the cigarettes left on top of the cabinet. All of this is reality the anaphrodisiac reality that has no part in my imagination. Lightly fall the steps of the junior maid, whose slippers I picture having a red and black braid, and since that's how I picture them, their sound takes on something of a red and black braid. Loudly fall the boots of the family's son, who's going out and yells goodbye, the slam of the door cutting the echo of the later that follows the see you. A dead calm, as if the world on this fourth floor had ended. Dishes being taken to the kitchen to get washed. Water running. Didn't I tell you that? And silence whistling from the river. But I dreamily and digestively drowse. I have time, between synesthesias. And it's extraordinary to think that, if I were asked right now what I want for this short life, I could think of nothing better than these long, slow minutes, this absence of thought and emotion, of action and almost of sensation itself. This inner sunset of dissipated desire, and then it occurs to me, almost without thinking, that most, if not all, people live like this, with greater or lesser consciousnesses, moving forward or standing still but with the very same indifference towards ultimate aims, the same renunciation of their personal goals, the same watered-down consciousness of life. 
Whenever I see a cat lying in the sun, I think of humanity. Whenever I see someone sleep, I remember that everything is slumber. Whenever someone tells me he dreamed, I wonder if he realizes that he has never done anything but dream. The sound from the street gets louder, as if a door had opened and the doorbell rings. It was nothing, for the door shut immediately. The footsteps die out at the end of the hallway. The washed plates raise their voice of water and porcelain. A passing truck shakes the back of the apartment. And since all things end, I get up from my thinking. 394 And I reason at will, in the same way I dream, for reasoning is just another kind of dreaming. O oh, prince of better days, I was once your princess, and we loved each other with another kind of love, whose memory makes me grieve. 395. The so gentle and ethereal hour was an altar for prayer. The horoscope of our meeting was surely ruled by auspicious conjunctions. So subtle and silken was the vague substance of glimpsed dreams that had mingled with our awareness of feeling. Our bitter conviction that life wasn't worth living had come to an end, like one more summer. There was a rebirth of that spring which we could now, albeit fallaciously, imagine had been ours. With humiliating similarity to humans, the pools among the trees also lamented, along with the roses in the unshaded flower beds and the indefinite melody of living, all irresponsibly. It's useless to discern or foresee. The whole of the future is a mist that surrounds us and when we glimpse tomorrow, it tastes like today. My destinies are the clowns that the caravan left behind, with no better moonlight than that of the open road, nor any quivering in the leaves except what the breeze causes, and the uncertainty of the moment, and our belief that they are quivering. Distant purples, fleeting shadows, the dream incomplete and no hope of death's completing it the rays of a dying sun, the light in the house on the hill, the anguish night, the perfume of death here among these books, all alone, with life outside, the trees smelling greenly in the vast night that is starrier on the other side of the hill. And so your sorrows had their solemn and benevolent union. Your few words royally consecrated the voyage. No ships ever returned not even real ones, and the smoke of living stripped everything of its contours, leaving only the shadows and skeletons, the bitter waters of eerie ponds among boxwoods seen through gates that from a distance recall Watteau, anguish, and never again. Millenniums just for you to come, but the road has no curves, and so you can never arrive. Goblets reserved for the inevitable hemlocks, not yours, but the life of us all, and even the street lamps, the nooks and niches, the faint wings we only hear, while in the restless, suffocating night our thought slowly rises and paces across its anxiety. Yellow, green-black, love-blue, all dead, my divine nursemaid, all dead, and all ships are the ship that never set sail. Pray for me and perhaps God will exist because it's for me that you pray. The fountain softly pattering in the distance, life uncertain, the smoke fading to nothing in the village where night is falling, my memory so hazy, the river so far away. Grant that I may sleep, grant that I may forget myself, lady of obscure designs, mother of endearments and of blessings, incompatible with their own existence. 396. After the last rains left the sky for earth, making the sky clear and the earth a damp mirror, the brilliant clarity of life that returned with the blue on high, and that rejoiced in the freshness of the water here below, left its own sky in our souls, a freshness in our hearts. Whether we like it or not, 
We are servants of the hour in its colors and shapes. We are subjects of the sky and earth. Even those who delve only in themselves, disdaining what surrounds them, delve by different paths when it rains and when it's clear. Obscure transmutations, perhaps felt only in the depths of abstract feelings, occur because it rains or stops raining. They're felt without our feeling them, because the weather we didn't feel made itself felt. Each of us is several, is many, is a profusion of selves, so that the self who disdains his surroundings is not the same as the self who suffers or takes joy in them. In the vast colony of our being there are many species of people who think and feel in different ways. At this very moment, jotting down these impressions during a break that's excusable because today there's not much work, I'm the one who is attentively writing them. I'm the one who is glad not to have to be working right now. I'm the one seeing the sky outside, invisible from in here. I'm the one thinking about all of this. I'm the one feeling my body satisfied and my hands still a bit cold. And my entire world of all these souls who don't know each other casts, like a motley but compact multitude, a single shadow the calm, bookkeeping body with which I lean over Borges' tall desk, where I've come to get the blotter that he borrowed from me. 397. Falling between the buildings, in alternating patches of light and shadow, or of brighter and less bright light, the morning dawns over the city. It seems to come not from the sun, but from the city itself as if the sunlight emanated from the walls and rooftops, not from them physically, but because they happen to be there. To see and feel it makes me feel a great hope, but I realize that hope is literary. Morning, spring, hope. They're linked in music by the same melodic intention. They're linked in the soul by the same memory of an identical intention. No. If I observe myself as I observe the city, I realize that all I can hope is for the day to end, like all days. Reason also sees the dawn. Whatever hope I placed in the day wasn't mine. It was of those who just lived the passing hour, and whose outer way of understanding I happened for a moment to embody. Hope? What do I have to hope for? The day doesn't promise me more than the day and I know it has a certain duration and an end. The light heartens, but it does not improve me, for I'll walk away as the same man, just a few hours older, a feeling or two happier, a thought or two sadder. When something is born, we can feel it as a birth, or we can think of it as having to die. Now, under the full light of the sun, the city landscape is like an open field of buildings natural, vast, and harmonious. But while seeing all this, can I forget that I exist? My consciousness of the city is, at its core, my consciousness of itself. I suddenly remember when I was a child and saw, as today I cannot see, dawn breaking over the city. Back then it didn't break for me but for life, because back then I, not being conscious, was life. I saw dawn break and felt happy. Today I see dawn break, feel happy, and become sad. The child is still there, but has fallen silent. I see the way I saw, but from behind my eyes I see myself seeing, and that is enough to darken the sun, to make the green of the trees old, and to wilt the flowers before they bloom. Yes, I once belonged here. But today, before each landscape, no matter how fresh, I stand as a foreigner, a guest and pilgrim before it, an outsider of what I can see and hear, old to myself. I've seen everything, even what I've never seen nor will ever see. Even the memory of future landscapes flows in my blood, and my anxiety over what I'll have to see again is already monotonous to me and leaning on the window sill to enjoy the day 
gazing at the variegated mass of the whole city, just one thought fills my soul, that I profoundly wish to die, to cease, to see no more light shining on this city or any city, to think no more, to feel no more, to leave behind the march of time and the sun like a piece of wrapping paper, to remove like a heavy suit, next to the big bed, the involuntary effort of being. 398. I'm intuitively certain that for people like me, no material circumstance can be propitious. No situation have a favorable outcome. If I already had good reasons for withdrawing from life, this is yet another one. Those courses of events that make success inevitable in an ordinary man have an unexpected, adverse effect in my case. The observation sometimes causes me a painful impression of divine hostility. It seems that only by some conscious manipulation of events to make them work against me could the series of disasters that define my life have happened. The result of all this is that I never make much of an effort. Let luck come my way, if it will. I know all too well that my greatest effort won't achieve what it would in other people. That's why I give myself up to luck, without expecting anything from it. What should I expect? My stoicism is an organic necessity. I need to shelter myself against life, since stoicism is, after all, just a stringent form of Epicureanism. I try to get some amusement out of my misfortune. I don't know to what extent I achieve this. I don't know to what extent I achieve anything. I don't know to what extent anything can be achieved. Where another man would succeed not so much by his effort as by circumstantial inevitability, I wouldn't and couldn't succeed, whether by that inevitability or by that effort. I seem to have been born, spiritually speaking, on a short winter day. Night fell early on my being. The only way I can live my life is in frustration and desolation. None of this is truly stoic. It's only in words that my suffering is at all noble. I complain like a sick maid. I fret like a housewife. My life is totally futile and totally sad. 399. All I asked of life is what Diogenes asked of Alexander, not to stand in the way of the sun. There were things I wanted, but I was denied any reason for wanting them. As for what I found, it would have been better to have found it in real life. Dreaming. While out walking, I formulated perfect phrases which I can't remember once I get home. I'm not sure if the ineffable poetry of these phrases belongs totally to what they were and which I forgot, or partly to what they after all weren't. I hesitate in everything, often without knowing why. How often I've sought, as my own version of the straight line, seeing it in my mind as the ideal straight line the longest distance between two points. I've never had a knack for the act of life. I've always taken wrong steps that no one else takes. I've always had to make an effort to do what comes naturally to other people. I've always wanted to achieve what others have achieved almost without wanting it. Between me and life, there were always sheets of frosted glass that I couldn't tell were there by sight or by touch. I didn't live that life or that dimension. I was the daydream of what I wanted to be, and my dreaming began in my will. My goals were always the first fiction of what I never was. I've never known if it was my sensibility that was too much for my intelligence or the other way around. I've always been late. I'm not sure if for the former or for the latter or perhaps for both, or perhaps it was the third thing that was late. The dreamers of ideals, bracketed question mark, socialists, altruists, and humanitarians of whatever ilk, make me physically sick to my stomach. They're idealists with no ideal, thinkers with no thought. 
They're enchanted by life's surface because their destiny is to love trash, which floats on the water, and they think it's beautiful because scattered shells also float on the water. 400. An expensive cigar smoked with one's eyes closed. That's all it takes to be rich. Like someone who revisits a place where he lived in his youth. With a cheap cigarette, I can return, heart and soul, to the time in my life when I used to smoke them. Through the mild flavor of the smoke, the whole of the past comes back to me. At other times it's a certain sweet, a mere piece of chocolate, can shake up my nerves with the surfeit of memories it provokes. Childhood. And as my teeth sink into the dark, soft mass, I chew and savor my humble joys as the happy companion of my toy soldiers. As the knight, in perfect accord with whatever stick happened to be serving as my horse. Tears well up in my eyes, and along with the flavor of the chocolate, I can taste my bygone happiness, my long-lost childhood, and I voluptuously bask in the sweetness of my sorrow. This ritual of taste, however simple it may be, is as solemn as any other. But it's cigarette smoke that most subtly, spiritually, reconstructs my past. Since it just barely grazes my awareness of taste, it evokes the moments to which I've died in a more general way. By a kind of displacement, it makes them more remotely present, more like mist when they envelop me, more ethereal when I embody them. A menthol cigarette or a cheap cigar wraps certain of my moments in a sweet softness. With what subtle plausibility, taste combined with smell, I recreate the dead stage settings and reinvest them with the colors of a past always so 18th century in its weary and mischievous aloofness, always so medieval in its irreparable lostness. 401. Elevating disgrace into splendor, I created for myself a pageantry of pain and effacement. I didn't make a poem out of my pain, but I used it to make a cortege. And from the window that looks on to myself, I contemplate in awe the deep red sunsets, the wispy twilights of my sorrows without cause, where the dangers, burdens, and failures of my innate incapacity for existing march by in processions of my aimlessness. The child in me that never died still watches and excitedly waves at the circus I stage for myself. He laughs at the clowns, who exist only in the circus. He fixes his eyes on the stuntmen and the acrobats as if they were the whole of life. And thus all the unsuspected anguish of a human soul about to burst. All the incurable despair of a heart forsaken by God. Sleeps the innocent child sleep, without joy and yet contented. Within the four walls of my room with their ugly, peeling wallpaper. I walk, not through the streets, but through my sorrow. The flanking rows of buildings are all the incomprehension that surrounds my soul. My footsteps resound against the pavement, like a ridiculous death knell, a frightful noise in the night, final like a receipt or a tomb. Stepping back from myself, I see that I'm the bottom of a well. The man I never was died. God forgot who I should have been. I'm just a vacant interlude. If I were a musician, I would compose my own funeral march, and with such good reason. 402. To be reincarnated in a stone or a speck of dust. My soul weeps with this yearning. I'm losing my taste for everything, including even my taste for finding everything tasteless. 403. I have no meaning I can fathom. Life weighs on me. Any emotion is too much for me. Only God knows my heart. What cortèges of my past cause a tedium of unremembered splendors to cradle my nostalgia? And what canopies, what starry sequences, 
What lilies? What pennants? What stained glass windows? What shady path of mystery was followed by our best fantasies, which so vividly remember this world's trickling waters, cypress trees, and boxwoods, and which can find no canopies for their processions except in the fruits of abdication? Kaleidoscope Don't speak. You happen too much. If only I didn't see you. When will you be just a fond memory of mine? How many women you'll be until this happens? And my having to suppose I can see you is an odd bridge no one uses. Yes, this is life. The others have dropped their oars. The cohorts have lost their discipline. The knights left at daybreak with the sound of their lances. Your castles passively waited to be deserted. No wind abandoned the rows of trees on the summit. Useless porticos, hidden silverware, prophetic signs, all of this belongs to vanquished twilights in ancient temples and not to our meeting in this present moment. For there is no reason for lindens to give shade apart from your fingers and their belated gesture. All the more reason for remote territories, treaties signed by stained-glass kings, lilies from religious pictures. Whom is the retinue waiting for? Where did the lost eagle go? 404. To wrap the world around our fingers, like a thread or ribbon which a woman twiddles while daydreaming at the window. Everything comes down to our trying to feel tedium in such a way that it doesn't hurt. It would be interesting to be two kings at the same time, not the one soul of both of them, but two distinct kingly souls. 405. Life, for most people, is a pain in the neck that they hardly notice, a sad affair with some happy respites, as when the watchers of a dead body tell anecdotes to get through the long, still night with their obligation to keep watch. I've always thought it futile to see life as a valley of tears. Yes, it is a valley of tears, but one in which we rarely weep. Hine said that after great tragedies we always merely blow our noses. As a Jew, and therefore universal, he understood the universal nature of humanity. Life would be unbearable if we were conscious of it. Fortunately, we're not. We live as unconsciously, as uselessly, and as pointlessly as animals. And if we anticipate death, which presumably, though not assuredly, they don't, we anticipate it through so many distractions, diversions, and ways of forgetting that we can hardly say we think about it. That's how we live, and it's a flimsy basis for considering ourselves superior to animals. We are distinguished from them by the purely external detail of speaking and writing, by an abstract intelligence that distracts us from concrete intelligence, and by our inability to imagine impossible things. All this, however, is incidental to our organic essence. Speaking and writing have no effect on our primordial urge to live, without knowing how or why. Our abstract intelligence serves only to elaborate systems or ideas that are quasi-systems, which in animals corresponds to lying in the sun. And to imagine the impossible may not be exclusive to us. I've seen cats look at the moon, and it may well be that they were longing to have it. All the world, all life, is a vast system of unconscious agents operating through individual consciousnesses like two gases that form a liquid when an electric current passes through them, so two consciousnesses, that of our concrete being and that of our abstract being, form a superior unconsciousness when life and the world pass through them. Happy the man who doesn't think, for he accomplishes instinctively and through organic destiny what the rest of us must accomplish through much meandering and an inorganic or social destiny. Happy the man who most resembles the animals, 
for he is effortlessly what the rest of us only are by hard work. For he knows the way home, which the rest of us can reach only through byways of fiction and hazy return routes. For he is rooted like a tree, forming part of the landscape and therefore of beauty. While we are but myths who cross the stage, walk-ons of futility and oblivion, dressed in real-life costumes. 406. I don't much believe in the happiness of animals, except when I want to use this conceit as a frame for highlighting a particular feeling. To be happy, it's necessary to know that one's happy. The only happiness we get from sleeping without dreaming is when we wake up and realize that we'd slept without dreaming. Happiness is outside of happiness. There's no happiness without knowledge. But the knowledge of happiness brings unhappiness. Because to know that you're happy is to realize that you're experiencing a happy moment and will soon have to leave it behind. To know is to kill, in happiness as in everything else. Not to know, on the other hand, is not to exist. Only the absolute of Hegel managed to be two things at once, but in writing. Being and non-being do not mix and meld in the sensations and laws of life. They exclude one another by a kind of reverse synthesis. What to do? Isolate the moment like a thing and be happy now, in the moment we're feeling happiness, thinking of nothing but what we're feeling and completely excluding everything else. Trap all thought in our sensations. That's what I believe this afternoon. It's not what I'll believe tomorrow morning, because tomorrow morning I'll be someone else. What kind of believer will I be tomorrow? I don't know. I would already have to be there to know. Not even God eternal, in whom today I believe, could know, today or tomorrow, anything about me tomorrow. Because today I am I, and tomorrow it's possible that he will have never existed. 407. God created me to be a child and willed that I remain a child. But why did he let life beat me up? take away my toys and leave me alone during playtime, my weak hands clutching at my blue, tear-stained smock. If I couldn't live without loving care, why was this thrown out with the rubbish? Ah, every time I see a child crying in the street, left there on his own, the jolting horror of my exhausted heart grieves me even more than the child's sadness. I grieve with every pore of my emotional life and it is my hands that wring the corner of the child's smock, my mouth that is contorted by real tears, my weakness and my loneliness. And all the laughs from the adult life passing by are like the flames of matches struck against the rough fabric of my heart. 408 He sang, in a soft and gentle voice, a song from a faraway country. The music made the strange words familiar. It sounded like the soul's fado, though it didn't in the least resemble fado. Through its veiled words and human melody, the song told of things that are in the hearts of us all and that no one knows. He sang in a kind of stupor, a kind of ecstasy right there in the street, his gaze oblivious to his listeners. The crowd that had gathered listened to him without any discernible scoffing. The song belonged to everyone, and the words sometimes spoke to us, an eternal secret of some lost race. We didn't hear the city's noises, even if we heard them, and the carts passed by so close that one of them brushed against my coat. But I only felt it, I didn't hear it. There was a rapt intensity in the stranger's song that was soothing to what in us dreams or doesn't succeed. It was a street incident, and we all noticed the policeman slowly turning the corner. He approached with the same slow gait, then stood still for a while behind the boy selling umbrellas, as if something had caught his eye. That's when the singer stopped. No one said anything. Then the policeman intervened. 409. For some reason or other, I'm alone in the office. 
Although this dawns on me suddenly, I had already vaguely sensed it. In some corner of my consciousness, I'd felt a great sigh of relief, a deeper breathing with different lungs. This is one of the strangest sensations that the fortuity of encounters and absences can bring, that of finding ourselves alone in a place that is normally full of people and noise, or that belongs to someone else. We suddenly have a feeling of absolute ownership, of vast and effortless dominion, and, as I said, of relief and serenity. How good it feels to be completely alone, to be able to talk to ourselves out loud, to walk around without being looked at, to lean back in an undisturbed reverie. Every house becomes an open field. Every room has the breath of a farm. The usual sounds are all strange, as if they belong to a nearby but independent universe. We are kings at last. This is what we all truly long to be, and the most plebeian among us, perhaps more ardently than those full of false gold. For a moment, we are the universe's pensioners, recipients of a steady income, with no needs and no worries. Ah, but in those footsteps climbing the stairs, I recognize someone who's coming here, someone who will interrupt my amused solitude. My implicit empire is about to be invaded by barbarians. The footsteps don't tell me who it is that's coming. They don't recall the footsteps of anyone I know. But I have a gut instinct that I am the destination of what for now are merely footsteps, climbing up the stairs which I suddenly see since I'm thinking about who's climbing them. Yes, it's one of the clerks. He stops. The door opens. He enters. I see all of him. And as he enters, he says, All alone, Senor Suarez. And I answer, Yes, for some time now. And then, taking off his jacket while eyeing the other, older one that's hanging up, he says, To be here all alone is a real bore, Senor Suarez. And not only that, a real bore, no doubt about it, I answer. It almost makes you feel like sleeping, he says, already wearing the frayed jacket and walking toward his desk. It certainly does, I agree, smiling, and reaching for my forgotten pen, I graphically re-enter the anonymous wholesomeness of normal life. 410 Whenever they can, they sit opposite a mirror. While talking to us, they look at themselves with infatuated eyes. Sometimes, as happens to people in love, they lose track of the conversation. They always liked me because my adult aversion to my physical appearance made me automatically turn my back to whatever mirror I found. And so they treated me well, for they instinctively recognized that I was the good listener, who would always let them show off and have the pulpit. As a group, they weren't so bad. As individuals, some were better and some were worse. They had tender and generous feelings that an observer of average behavior would never expect. Mean and petty attitudes that a normal human being would hardly imagine. Pathetic, envious, and self-deluded. That sums them up. And the same words would sum up whatever part of this milieu has infiltrated the work of worthy men who happen to get caught for a time in its mire. This explains the presence, in Fialho's writings, of flagrant envy, rank vulgarity, and an abominable lack of elegance. Some are witty, others have nothing but wit, and still others don't exist. Café wit may be divided into jokes about those who are absent and jibes at those who are present. This kind of wittiness is known elsewhere as mere vulgarity. There's no greater proof of an impoverished mind than its inability to be witty except at other people's expense. I passed by, I saw, and, unlike them, I conquered, because my victory consisted in seeing. I saw that they were no different from other inferior social groups. In the house where I rent a room, I found the same squalid soul that the café had already revealed to me, but without, thank all the gods, 
any delusions of making a hit in Paris. My landlady dreams of Lisbon's newer section in her moments of imaginative fancy, but she's spared from the myth of going abroad, and my heart is touched. From that time I spent at the tomb of human will, I remember a couple of funny jokes and otherwise being bored sick. They're heading to the cemetery, and it seems that their past was left behind at the cafe, for they don't even mention it now. And posterity will never know of them, forever hidden from its view, under the rotten heap of penance they won in their verbal battles. 411. Pride is the emotional certainty of our own greatness. Vanity is the emotional certainty that others see this greatness or attribute it to us. These two sentiments don't necessarily coincide, nor do they naturally oppose each other. They're different, but compatible. Pride all by itself, unaccompanied by vanity, manifests itself in timid behavior. One who feels he's great but isn't convinced that others recognize him as such will be afraid to pit his opinion about himself against other people's opinion. Vanity all by itself, unaccompanied by pride, which is rare but possible, manifests itself through audacity. One who is certain that others think highly of him will fear nothing from them. Both physical courage and moral courage can exist without vanity, but audacity cannot. And by audacity, I mean boldness in taking the initiative. Audacity can exist without physical or moral courage, for these character traits are of a different, incommensurable order. 412. Dolorous Interlude I don't even have the consolation of pride, and even if I did have something I could brag about, how much more I have to be ashamed of. I spend life lying down, and not even in my dreams can I make a move to get up. So complete is my incapacity for any and all effort. The creators of metaphysical systems and, text is missing, of psychological explanations are still in the primary stage of suffering. What is systematizing and explaining but, text is missing, and construction? And what is all this arranging, ordering, organizing, but achieved effort? And how deplorably this is life? No, I'm no pessimist. Happy those who are able to translate their suffering into a universal principle. I don't know if the world is sad or arbitrary, nor do I care, because I'm indifferent to what other people suffer. As long as they don't weep or moan, which I find bothersome and unpleasant, I don't even shrug my shoulders at their suffering. That's how deep my disdain for them runs. I like to think of life as half light, half darkness. I'm not a pessimist. I don't complain about the horrors of life. I don't complain about the horror of my life. The only fact I worry about is that I exist and suffer and can't even dream of being removed from my feeling of suffering. The happy dreamers are the pessimists. They shape the world to their likeness and thus always feel at home. What grieves me the most is the disparity between the world's happy bustle and my own glum, wearisome silence. For those who live it, life with all its sorrows and fears and jolts must be a good and happy thing, like a journey in an old stagecoach, when one is in good company and can enjoy it. I can't even consider my suffering a sign of greatness. I don't know if it is or it isn't. But I suffer things that are so trivial and am hurt by things so banal that the hypothesis, if I dared entertain it, would be an insult to the hypothesis that I might be a genius. The splendor of a beautiful sunset saddens me with its beauty. When gazing at one, I always think, what a thrill it must be for a happy man to see this. And this book is a lament. Once written, it will replace alone as the saddest book in Portugal. Next to my pain, all other pains seem unreal or insignificant. They're the pains of people who are happy or who live life and complain. 
My pains are of a man who finds himself incarcerated, cut off from life, between me and life. And so I see all the things which cause anguish and feel none of the things which bring joy. And I've noticed that suffering is seen more than felt, whereas happiness is felt more than seen. Because if one doesn't see or think, he will know a certain contentment, like that of the mystics and the bohemians and the riffraff. It's by the door of thought and the window of observation that suffering comes into one's house. 413. Let us live by dreams and for dreams, distractedly dismantling and recomposing the universe according to the whim of each dreaming moment. Let us do this while being consciously conscious of the uselessness and, text is missing, of doing it. Let us ignore life with every pore of our body, stray from reality and all of our senses, and abdicate from love with our whole heart. Let us fill the pitchers we take to the well with useless sand and empty them out, so as to refill and re-empty them in utter futility. Let us fashion garlands so that, once finished, they can be thoroughly and meticulously taken apart. Let us mix paints on a palette without having a canvas on which to paint. Let us order stone for chiseling without having a chisel and without being sculptors. Let us make everything an absurdity and turn all our sterile hours into pure futilities. Let us play hide-and-seek with our consciousness of living. Let us hear the hours tell us that we exist with a delighted and incredulous smile on our lips. Let us watch time paint the world and find the painting not only false but also empty. Let us think with sentences that contradict one another speaking out loud in sounds that aren't sounds and colors that aren't colors. Let us affirm and grasp, which would be impossible, that we are conscious of not being conscious, and that we are not what we are. Let us explain all this by way of a hidden, paradoxical meaning that things have in their divine, reverse-side dimension, and let us not believe too much in the explanation so that we won't have to give it up. Let us sculpt in hopeless silence all our dreams of speaking. Let us make all our thoughts of action languish and torpor. And over all of this the horror of living will hover remotely like a blue and unbroken sky. 414. But the landscapes we dream are just shades of the landscapes we've already seen. And the tedium of dreaming them is almost as great as the tedium of looking at the world. 415. Imaginary figures have more depth and truth than real ones. My imaginary world has always been the only true world for me. I've never had loves so real and so full of verve and blood and life as the ones I've had with characters I myself created. What madness! I miss them because, like all loves, these kind also come and go. 416. Sometimes, in my inner dialogues on exquisite afternoons of imagination, as I carry on weary conversations in imaginary sitting rooms at twilight, it can happen during a lull in the discussion that, finding myself alone with an interlocutor who's more I than the others, I start to wonder why our scientific age's will to understand hasn't been extended to artificial, inorganic things. And one of the questions that I most languidly ponder is why we don't develop, along with the usual psychology of human and subhuman creatures, a psychology, for surely they have one, of artificial figures and of creatures whose existence takes place only in rugs and in pictures. It's a sad view of reality that would limit it to the organic realm and not place the idea of soul in statuettes and needlework. Where there is form, there is a soul. These private deliberations aren't an idle pastime, but a scientific endeavor like any other. And so, 
before having an answer, and without knowing if I'll ever have one, I think of what's possible as if it already existed. And with inner analyses and intense concentration, I envision the likely result of this actualized endeavor. As soon as I start thinking this way, scientists immediately appear in my mind, hunched over illustrations that they know to be real lives. Microscopists of warp and weft emerge from the rugs. Physicists emerge from the broad, swirling patterns around their borders. Chemists from the idea of shapes and colors and pictures. Geologists in the stratified layers and cameos. And finally, and most importantly, psychologists who record and classify, one by one, the sensations that a statuette must feel. The ideas that pass through the hazy psyche of a figure in a painting or a stained glass window. The wild impulses, the unbridled passions, the occasional hatreds and sympathies, and, question mark, found in these special universes marked by death and immobility, whether in the eternal gestures of bas-reliefs or in the immortal consciousnesses of painted figures. More than the other arts, literature and music are fertile territory for the subtleties of a psychologist. Novelistic figures, as we all know, are as real as any of us. Certain aspects of sounds have a swift, winged soul, but they are still susceptible to psychology and sociology. Let all the ignorant be informed. Veritable societies exist in colors, sounds, and sentences, even as regimes and revolutions, reigns, politics, and exist, literally, not metaphysically, in the instrumental ensemble of symphonies, in the structured holes of novels, and in the square feet of a complex painting, where the colorful poses of warriors, lovers, or symbolic figures find enjoyment, suffer, and mingle together. When one of my Japanese teacups is broken, I imagine that the real cause was not the careless hand of a maid, but the anxieties of the figures inhabiting the curves of that porcelain text is missing. Their grim decision to commit suicide doesn't shock me. They use the maid as one of us might use a gun. To know this, and with what precision I know it, is to have gone beyond modern science. 417. I know no pleasure like that of books, and I read very little. Books are introductions to dreams, and no introductions are necessary for one who freely and naturally enters into conversation with them. I've never been able to lose myself in a book. As I'm reading, the commentary of my intellect or imagination has always hindered the narrative flow. After a few minutes, it's I who am writing, and what I write is nowhere to be found. My favorite things to read are the banal books that sleep with me at my bedside. There are two that I always have close at hand. Father Figueiredo's Rhetoric and Father Freer's Reflections on the Portuguese Language. I always reread these books with pleasure, and while it's true I've read them over many times, it's also true that I've read neither one straight through. I'm indebted to these books for a discipline I doubt I could ever have acquired on my own. To write with objectivity, with reason as one's constant guide. The affected, dry, monastic style of Father Figueiredo is a discipline that delights my intellect. The nearly always undisciplined verbosity of Father Friere amuses my mind without tiring it and teaches me without stirring up any worries. Both are learned, untroubled minds that confirm my complete lack of desire to be like them or like anyone else. I read and abandon myself, not to my reading, but to me. I read and fall asleep, and it's as if my already dreaming eyes still followed Father Figueiredo's descriptions of the figures of speech. And it's in enchanted forests that I hear Father Friere explain that one should say Magdalena, because only an ignorant person says Madalina. 418. I hate to read. 
The mere thought of unfamiliar pages bores me. I can read only what I already know. My bedside book is Father Figueredo's Rhetoric, where every night I read yet again, for the thousandth time, in correct and clerical Portuguese, the descriptions of various figures of speech, whose names I still haven't learned. But the language lulls me, and I'd sleep fitfully were I to miss out on the Jesuitical words written with the archaic C. I might, however, give credit to the exaggerated purism of Father Figueredo's book for the relative care I take, as much as I can muster, to write correctively the language in which I express myself. And I read a passage from Father Figueredo. Pompous, empty, and cold, and this helps me forget life. Or this, a passage about figures of speech which returns in the preface. I'm not exaggerating a verbal smidgen. I feel all this. As others read passages from the Bible, I read them from this rhetoric. But I have two advantages, complete repose and lack of devotion. 419. The trivial things that make up life, the trifles of the ordinary and routine, like a dust that underscores, with a hideous, smudged line, the sordidness and vileness of my human existence. The cash book lying open before my eyes that dream of countless orients. The office manager's inoffensive joke that offends the whole universe. The could you please ask Senor Vasquez to call me? His girlfriend, Miss So-and-so. Right when I was pondering the most asexual part of an aesthetic and intellectual theory. And then there's one's friends. Good fellows, good fellows. Great to be with them and talk. To have lunch together dinner together, but all of it, I don't know, so sordid and pathetic and trivial, because even on the street we remain in the fabric warehouse. Even overseas we're still seated behind the cash book. And even in infinity we still have our boss. Everyone has an office manager with a joke that's out of place, and everyone has a soul that falls outside the normal universe. Everyone has a boss and the boss's girlfriend and the phone call that arrives at the inevitably worst moment when the evening is wondrously falling and girlfriends politely offer their apologies, bracketed question mark, or else leave messages for their lover, who we all know has gone out for a fancy tea. All who dream, even if they don't dream in a downtown Lisbon office, bent over the accounts of a fabric warehouse, have before them a cash book, which may be the woman they married, or the administration of a future they've inherited, or anything at all that positively exists. All of us who dream and think are assistant bookkeepers in a fabric warehouse or in some other business in this or another downtown. We enter amounts and lose. We add up totals and pass on. We close the books and the invisible balance is always against us. The words I write make me smile, but my heart is ready to break. To break like things that shatter into fragments, shards, and debris, hauled away in a bin on somebody's shoulders to the eternal rubbish cart of every city council. And everything is waiting, dressed up and expectant, for the king who will come and who is already arriving, for the dust of his retinue forms a new mist in the slowly appearing east, and the lances in the distance are already flashing with their own dawn. 420. Funeral March. Hieratic figures from mysterious hierarchies are lined up in the corridors, waiting for you. There are fair-haired boys bearing lances. Young men, text is missing with scattered flashes of naked blades, reflections glancing off helmets and brass, dark glimpses of silk and tarnished gold. All that the imagination infects. The funereal feeling makes pageants melancholy and even weighs on us in victories. The mysticism of nothing, the asceticism of absolute negation. Not the six feet of cold earth that cover our closed eyes beneath the warm sun and next to the green grass, 
but the death that surpasses our life and is a life all its own. A dead presence in some God, the unknown God of the religion of my gods. The Ganges also passes by the Rua dos Torredores. All eras exist in this cramped room. The mixture, text is missing. The multicolored march of customs. The distances between cultures. And the vast variety of nations. And right here on this very street, I can wait in ecstasy for death among battlements and swords. 421. Journey in the Mind From my fourth-floor room overlooking infinity, in the viable intimacy of the falling evening, at the window before the emerging stars, my dreams, in rhythmic accord with the visible distance, are of journeys to unknown, imagined, or simply impossible countries. 422. The blonde light of the golden moon shines out of the east. The shimmer it forms on the wider river opens into snakes on the sea. 423. In lavish satins and puzzled purples, the empires proceeded toward death under the exotic flags flanking wide roads and luxurious canopies at the stopping places. Baldeskins passed by. Roads now drab, now spruce, let the processions come through. The weapons coldly flashed in the excruciatingly slow, pointless marches. The gardens on the outskirts were forgotten, and the fountain's water was merely the continuation of what had been left behind, a distant laughter falling among memories of light, which is not to say that the statues along the paths talked, nor did the succession of yellows stifle the autumn colors that embellished the tombs. The hall birds were corners around which lay splendorous ages dressed in green-black, faded purple, and garnet-colored robes. Behind all the evasions, the square lay empty, and never again would the flower beds where we stroll be visited by the shadows that had abandoned the aqueducts. The drums, like thunder, drummed the tremulous hour. 424 Every day things happen in the world that can't be explained by any law of things we know. Every day they are mentioned and forgotten, and the same mystery that brought them takes them away, transforming their secret into oblivion. Such is the law by which things can't be explained but must be forgotten. The visible world goes on as usual in the broad daylight. Otherness watches us from the shadows. 425 Dreaming itself has become a torture. I've acquired such lucidity in my dreams that I see all dreamed things as real. And so all the value that they had as mere dreams has been lost. Do I dream of being famous? Then I feel all the public exposure that comes with glory. The total loss of privacy and the anonymity that makes glory painful. 426 to think of our greatest anxiety as an insignificant event, not only in the life of the universe, but also in the life of our own soul, is the beginning of wisdom. To think this way right in the midst of our anxiety is the height of wisdom. While we're actually suffering, our human pain seems infinite. But human pain isn't infinite, because nothing human is infinite. And our pain has no value beyond its being a pain we feel. How often, oppressed by a tedium that seems like insanity or by an anxiety that seems to surpass it, I stop, hesitating, before I revolt. I hesitate, stopping, before I deify myself. From among all the pains there are, the pain of not grasping the mystery of the world, the pain of not being loved, the pain of being treated unjustly, the pain of life oppressing us, suffocating and restraining us, the pain of a toothache, the pain of shoes that pinch. Who can say which is the worst for himself, let alone for someone else, or for the generality of those who exist? Some of the people I talk with consider me insensitive, but I think I'm more sensitive than the vast majority. I'm a sensitive man who knows himself, 
and who therefore know sensitivity. Ah, it's not true that life is painful, or that it's painful to think about life. What's true is that our pain is grave and serious only when we pretend it is. If we let it be, it will leave just as it came. It will die down the way it grew up. Everything is nothing, our pain included. I'm writing this under the weight of a tedium that doesn't seem to fit inside me, or that needs more room than is in my soul. A tedium of all people and all things that strangles and deranges me. A physical feeling of being completely misunderstood that innerves and overwhelms me. But I lift up my head to the blue sky that doesn't know me. I let my face feel the unconsciously cool breeze. I close my eyelids after having looked, and I forget my face after having felt. This doesn't make me feel better, but it makes me different. Seeing myself frees me from myself. I almost smile, not because I understand myself, but because, having become another, I've stopped being able to understand myself. High in the sky, like a visible nothingness, floats a tiny white cloud left behind by the universe. 427. My dreams. In my dreams I create friends, with whom I then keep company. They're imperfect in a different way. Remain pure, not in order to be noble or strong, but to be yourself. To give your love is to lose love. Abdicate from life so as not to abdicate from yourself. Women are a good source of dreams. Don't ever touch them. Learn to disassociate the ideas of voluptuousness and pleasure. Learn to delight in everything, not for what it is, but for the ideas and dreams it kindles. Because nothing is what it is, but dreams are always dreams. To accomplish this, you mustn't touch anything. As soon as you touch it, your dream will die. The touched object will occupy your capacity for feeling. Seeing and hearing are the only noble things in life. The other senses are plebeian and carnal. The only aristocracy is never to touch. Avoid getting close. That is true nobility. 428. Aesthetics of Indifference For each separate thing, the dreamer should strive to feel the complete indifference which it, as a thing, arouses in him. The ability to spontaneously abstract whatever is dreamable from each object or event, leaving all of its reality as dead matter in the external world, that is what the wise man should strive for. Never to feel his own feelings sincerely, and to raise his pallid triumph to the point of regarding his own ambitions, longings, and desires with indifference. To pass alongside his joys and anxieties as if passing by someone who doesn't interest him. The greatest self-mastery is to be indifferent towards ourselves, to see our body and soul as merely the house and grounds where destiny willed that we spend our life. To treat our own dreams and deepest desires with arrogance, en grand seigneur, politely and carefully ignoring them. To act modestly in our own presence. To realize that we are never truly alone, since we are our own witnesses, and should therefore act before ourselves as before a stranger, with a studied and serene outward manner, indifferent because it's noble, and cold because it's indifferent. In order not to sink into our own estimation, all we have to do is quit having ambitions, passions, desires, hopes, whims, or nervous disquiet. The key is to remember that we're always in our own presence. We're never so alone that we can feel at ease. With this in mind, we will overcome having passions and ambitions, for these make us vulnerable. We won't have desires or hopes, since desires and hopes are plebeian and inelegant. And we won't have whims or be disquieted, because rash behavior is unpleasant for others to witness. And agitated behavior is always a vulgarity. The aristocrat is the one who never forgets that he's never alone. That's why etiquette and decorum are the privilege of aristocracies. Let's internalize the aristocrat. 
Let's take him out of his gardens and drawing rooms and place him in our soul and in our consciousness of existing. Let's always treat ourselves with etiquette and decorum, with studied and, for other people, gestures. Each of us is an entire community, an entire neighborhood of the great mystery, and we should at least make sure that the life of our neighborhood is distinctive and elegant, and the feasts of our sensations are genteel and restrained, and that the banquets of our thoughts are decorous and dignified. Since other souls may build poor and filthy neighborhoods around us, we should clearly define where our own begins and ends. And from the facades of our feelings to the alcoves of our shyness, everything should be noble and serene, sculpted in sobriety, without ostentation. We should try to find a serene way to realize each sensation, to reduce love to the shadow of a dream of love, a pale and tremulous interval between the crests of two tiny moonlit waves, to turn desire into a useless and innocuous thing, a kind of knowing smile in our soul, to make it into something we never dream of achieving or even expressing, to lull hatred to sleep like a captive snake, and to tell fear to give up all its outer manifestations except for anguish in our eyes, or rather, in the eyes of our soul. For only this attitude can be considered aesthetic. 429. Throughout my life, in every situation and in every social circumstance, everyone has always seen me as an intruder, or at least as a stranger, whether among relatives or acquaintances. I've always been regarded as an outsider. I'm not suggesting that this treatment was ever deliberate. It was due, rather, to a natural reaction in the people around me. Everyone everywhere has always treated me kindly. Rare is the man like me, I suspect, who has caused so few to raise their voice, wrinkle their brow, or speak angrily or askance. But the kindness I've been shown has always been devoid of affection. For those who are closest to me, I've always been a guest, and thus treated well, but always with the kind of attention accorded to a stranger, and with the lack of affection that's normal for an intruder. I don't doubt that this attitude in other people derives mainly from some obscure cause intrinsic to my own temperament. Perhaps I have a communicative coldness that makes others automatically reflect my unfeeling manner. By nature, I quickly strike up acquaintances. People are friendly to me right away, but I never receive affection. I've never been shown devotion. To be loved has always seemed impossible to me, like a stranger calling me by my first name. I don't know if I should regret this, or if I should accept it as an indifferent destiny which there's no reason to regret or accept. I've always wanted to be liked. It always grieved me that I was treated with indifference. Left an orphan by fortune, I wanted, like all orphans, to be the object of someone's affection. This need has always been a hunger that went unsatisfied, and so thoroughly have I adapted to this inevitable hunger that I sometimes wonder if I really feel the need to eat. Whatever the case be, life pains me. Other people have someone who is devoted to them. I've never had anyone who even thought of being devoted to me. Others are doted on. I'm treated nicely. I know I have the capacity to stir respect, but not affection. Unfortunately, I've never done anything that would justify, for others, the respect they initially feel. And so, they never come to truly respect me. Sometimes I think I must enjoy suffering, but I know I'd really prefer something else. I don't have the qualities of a leader or of a follower, nor even those of a contented man, which are the ones that count when the others are missing. Other people, less intelligent than I, are stronger. They're better at carving out their place in life. They manage their intelligence more effectively. I have all the qualities it takes to exert influence except for the knack of actually doing it, or even the will to want to do it. Were I ever to fall in love, I wouldn't be loved back. All I have to do is want something for it to perish. 
My destiny lacks the strength to be lethal in general, but it has the weakness of being lethal in whatever specifically concerns me. 430. Having seen how lucidly and logically certain madmen justify their lunatic ideas to themselves and to others, I can never again be sure of the lucidness of my lucidity. 431. One of my life's greatest tragedies, albeit a surreptitious tragedy, of the kind that take place in the shadows, is my inability to feel anything naturally. I can love and hate like others, and, like others, feel fear and enthusiasm. But neither my love nor my hate, nor my fear nor my enthusiasm, are quite like the real thing. Either they lack a certain ingredient, or they have one that doesn't belong. They are, at any rate, some other thing, and what I feel doesn't square with life. In what is very aptly called a calculating personality, Feelings are shaped by calculation and a kind of scrupulous self-interest, to the point that they seem like something else. In what is specifically known as a scrupulous personality, the same displacement of natural instincts can be observed. In me there is a similar disturbance, a lack of clarity in my feelings, yet I am neither calculating nor scrupulous. I have no excuse for feeling things abnormally. I instinctively denature my instincts. Against my will, I will in the wrong way. 432. The slave of my own character, as well as of my circumstances, offended not only by other people's indifference, but also by their affection for whom they think I am. Such are the human insults heaped on me by destiny. 433. I was a foreigner in their midst, but no one realized it. I lived among them as a spy, and no one, not even I, suspected it. They all took me for a relative. No one knew I'd been swapped at birth. And so I was one of their equals, without anything in common, a brother to all, without belonging to the family. I had come from wondrous lands, from landscapes more enchanting than life. But only to myself did I ever mention these lands, and I said nothing about the landscapes which I saw in dreams. My feet stepped like theirs over the floorboards and the flagstones, but my heart was far away, even if it beat close by, false master of an estranged and exiled body. No one knew me under the mask of similarity, nor ever knew that I had a mask, because no one knew that there are masked people in the world. No one imagined that at my side there was always another, who was, in fact, I. They always supposed I was identical to myself. Their houses sheltered me, their hands shook mine, and they saw me walk down the street as if I were there. But the I that I am was never in their living rooms. The I whose life I live has no hands for others to shake and the I that I know walks down no streets, unless the streets are all streets, nor is seen in them by others, unless he himself is all the others. We all live far away and anonymous. Disguised, we suffer as unknowns. For some, however, the distance between oneself and oneself is never revealed. For others it is occasionally enlightened, to their horror or grief by a flash without limits. But for still others, this is the painful daily reality of life. To realize that who we are is not ours to know. That what we think or feel is always a translation. That what we want is not what we wanted, nor perhaps what anyone wanted. To realize all this at every moment, to feel all this in every feeling. Isn't this to be foreign in one's own soul? exiled in one's own sensations? But the mask I'd been staring at as I talked on a street corner with an unmasked man on this night of Carnival finally held out its hand and laughingly said goodbye. The natural-faced man turned left down the street at whose corner he'd been standing. The mask, an uninteresting one, 
walked straight ahead, disappearing among shadows and occasional lights in a definite farewell, extraneous to what I was thinking. Only then did I notice that there was more in the street than the glowing street lamps. And where the lamplight didn't reach, there rolled a hazy moonlight, veiled and speechless and full of nothing, like life. 434. Moonlights. Damply tarnished by a lifeless brown. On the frozen avalanche of overlapping rooftops, it is a grayish white, damply tarnished by a lifeless brown. 435. And the whole ensemble is staggered in diverse clusters of darkness, outlined on one side by white and dappled with blue shades of cold nacre. 436. Rain. And finally, over the darkness of the gleaming rooftops, the cold light of the tepid morning breaks like a torment of the apocalypse. Once again, it's the vast night of increasing luminosity. Once again, it's the usual horror, the day, life, fictitious purposes, inescapable activity. Once again, it's my physical, visible, and social personality, communicated by meaningless words and exploited by the acts and consciousness of others. Once again, I'm I, exactly as I'm not. And as this light from the darkness fills with gray doubts the cracks around the shutters, far from hermetic, alas, I begin to realize that I can no longer hold on to this refuge of staying in bed, of not sleeping but being able to, of dreaming without remembering truth and reality, of nestling between a cool warmth of clean sheets and an ignorance of my body's existence beyond its feeling of comfort. I realize that I'm losing the happy unconsciousness with which I've been enjoying my consciousness the animal drowsiness in which I observe, as through the slowly blinking eyelids of a cat in the sun, the movements described by my free imagination's logic. I realize that the privileges of darkness are vanishing, and with them the slow rivers under the bowing trees of my glimpsed eyelashes, and the murmur of the cascades lost between the soft flowing of blood in my ears and the faint, steady rain. I'm losing myself to become alive. I don't know if I'm sleeping or if I just feel as if I were. I'm not exactly dreaming, but seem, rather, to be waking up from a sleepless slumber. For I hear the city's first sounds of life rising like floodwaters from that vague place down below, where the streets made by God run this way and that. The sounds are happy, filtered through the sadness of the rain that's falling or that perhaps has stopped falling, for I don't hear it anymore. I'm aware only of the excessive grayness it gives to the light that's advancing through the cracks, in the shadows of the clarity too faint for this time of morning, whatever time that may be. The sounds are happy, scattered, and painful to my heart, as if they were calling me to an exam or an execution. Each new day, if I hear it break from the bed of my sweet oblivion, seems like the day of a great event in my life that I won't have the courage to face. Each new day, if I feel it rise from its bed of shadows as linens fall in the lanes and streets, comes to summon me to a court of law. Each new day, I'm going to be judged. And the man in me who is perpetually condemned clings to his bed as to the mother he lost and fondles the pillow as if his nursemaid could protect him from people. The happy sleep of the hulking animal shaded by trees. The balmy fatigue of the tramp lying in the tall grass. The torpor of the black man on a warm and faraway afternoon. The pleasure of the yawn that weighs in tired eyes. Everything that helps us to forget and bring sleep. The peace of mind that gently closes the shutters of our soul's window, and the anonymous caress of slumber. To sleep, to be far away, remote without knowing it. To forget one's own very body. To have the freedom of unconsciousness, like a refuge on a forgotten lake. 
stagnating among the thick foliage in the hidden depths of forests. A nothingness that breathes, a mild death from which we awaken fresh and nostalgic, a deep forgetting that massages the tissues of our soul. And again I hear, like the renewed protest of one who still isn't convinced, the abrupt clamor of rain spattering the lit-up universe. I feel a chill in my imagined bones, as if I were afraid. And cowering in my insignificance, so human and alone, in the last vestige of the darkness that's deserting me, I begin to weep. I weep, yes, over solitude and life, and my useless grief lies like a wheelless cart on the edge of reality amid the dung of oblivion. I weep over everything, the loss of the lap where I once lay, the death of the hand I was given, the arms to embrace me that I never found, the shoulder to lean on that I never had, and the day that breaks definitely, the grief that breaks in me like the naked truth of day, all that I dreamed or thought or forgot, all of this like an amalgam of shadows, fictions, and regrets, blends into the wake of the passing worlds and falls among the things of life like the skeleton of a bunch of grapes, stolen by young boys and eaten on the street corner. The noise of the human day suddenly increases, like the sound of a bell that's calling. I hear, inside the building, the softly clicking latch of the first door that opens for someone to go out and live. I hear slippers in an absurd hallway leading to my heart. And with a brusque movement, as when a man finally succeeds in killing himself, I throw off the snug covers that shelter my stiff body. I've woken up. The sound of the rain fades, moving higher in the indefinite outdoors. I feel better. I fulfilled something or other. I get up, go to the window and open the shutters with brave determination. A day of clear rain floods my eyes with dull light. I open the window. The cool air moistens my warm skin. It's raining, yes, but although it's the same rain I'd been hearing, it's after all so much less. I want to be refreshed, to live, and I lean my neck out to life, stretching it across the window as across a guillotine. 437. A rural calm sometimes visits the city. There are times in sunny Lisbon, especially at midday in summer, when the countryside invades us like a wind, and we sleep peacefully right here on the Rua dos Torredores. How refreshing for the soul to see a hush fall, beneath a high, steady sun, over these carts full of straw, these half-built crates, and these unhurried pedestrians who suddenly seem to be walking in a village. I, myself, alone in the office and looking at them through the window, am transported. I'm in a quiet little town in the country, or stagnating in an unknown hamlet, and because I feel other, I am happy. I know, if I raise my eyes, I'll be confronted by the dingy row of buildings opposite by the grimy windows of all the downtown offices, by the incongruous windows of the upper floors where people still live, and by the eternal laundry hanging in the sun between the gables at the top, among flower pots and plants. I know this, but the golden light shining on everything is so soft, and the calm air surrounding me so devoid of sense, that even what I see is no reason to renounce my make-believe village my rural small town, whose commerce is sheer tranquility. I know, I know, it is indeed time for lunch, or for resting, or for doing nothing. Everything is going smoothly on the surface of life. Even I am sleeping, although my body is leaning over the balcony, as over the rail of a ship sailing past an unfamiliar landscape. Even I have put my mind to rest, as if I were in the country. And suddenly something else looms before me, surrounds me, commands me. I see, behind the small town's midday, all of life in all of the small town. 
I see the grand stupid happiness of its domestic life, the grand stupid happiness of life in the fields, the grand stupid happiness of peaceful squalor. I see it because I see it. But I didn't see it, and I wake up. I look around, smiling, and the first thing I do is shake off the dust from my unfortunately dark suit, whose sleeves had been leaning on the balcony rail, which no one has ever cleaned, unaware that one day, if only for a moment, it would have to serve as a deck rail, where there could logically be no dust, of a ship on an infinite sightseeing cruise. 438. Against the blue made pale by the green of night, the cold unevenness of the buildings on the summer horizon formed a jagged, brownish-black silhouette, vaguely haloed by a yellowed gray. In another age, we mastered the physical ocean, thereby creating universal civilization. Now we will master the psychological ocean, emotion, mother human nature, thereby creating intellectual civilization. 439. The painful intensity of my sensations, even when they're happy ones, the blissful intensity of my sensations, even when they're sad, I'm writing on a Sunday, the morning far advanced, on a day full of soft light in which, above the rooftops of the interrupted city, the blue of the always brand new sky closes the mysterious existence of stars into oblivion. In me it is also Sunday. My heart is also going to a church, located it doesn't know where. It wears a child's velvet suit, and its face, made rosy by first impressions, smiles without sad eyes above the collar that's too big. 440. Every morning of that lingering summer, the sky, when it woke up, was a dull green-blue, which soon changed to a blueness grayed by a silent white. In the West, however, the sky was the color we usually ascribe to all of it. When they feel the ground sliding beneath their feet, then how many men begin to speak the truth, to seek and find, to deny the world's illusion, and how their illustrious names mark with capital letters, like those found on maps, the insights of sober and learned pages, cosmorama of things happening tomorrow that could never have happened, lapis lazuli of intermittent emotions. Do you remember how many memories can spring from a false supposition, from mere imagination. And in a delirium sprinkled with certainties, the soft, brisk murmur of all the water from all parks wells up as an emotion from the depths of my self-awareness. The old branches are vacant, and all around them the paths spread their melancholy of empty streets. Night in Heliopolis, night in Heliopolis, who will tell me the useless words? Who? through blood and indecision, will compensate me. 441. High in the nocturnal solitude, an anonymous lamp flourishes behind a window. All else that I see in the city is dark, save where feeble reflections of light hazily ascend from the streets and cause a pallid, inverse moonlight to hover here and there. The building's various colors, or shades of colors, are hardly distinguishable in the blackness of the night. Only vague, seemingly abstract differences break the regularity of the congested ensemble. An invisible thread links me to the unknown owner of the lamp. It's not the mutual circumstance of us both being awake. In this there can be no reciprocity, for my window is dark, so that he cannot see me. It's something else, something all my own that's related to my feeling of isolation that participates in the night and in the silence and that chooses the lamp as an anchor because it's the only anchor there is. It seems to be its glowing that makes the night so dark. It seems to be the fact that I'm awake, dreaming in the dark, that makes the lamp shine. Everything that exists perhaps exists because something else exists. Nothing is, everything coexists. 
Perhaps that's how it really is. I feel I wouldn't exist right now, or at least I wouldn't exist in the way I'm existing, with this present consciousness of myself, which, because it is a consciousness, and present, is entirely me in this very moment, if that lamp weren't shining somewhere over there. A useless lighthouse with a specious advantage of height. I feel this because I feel nothing. I think this because this is nothing. 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 Part of the night and the silence and what I share with them of vacancy, of negativity, of in-betweenness. A gap between me and myself. Something forgotten by some god or other. 442. In one of those spells of sleepless somnolence, when we intelligently amuse ourselves without the intelligence, I reread some of the pages that together will form my book of random impressions. And they give off, like a familiar smell, an arid impression of monotony. Even while saying that I'm always different, I feel that I've always said the same thing, that I resemble myself more than I'd like to admit, that when the books are balanced, I've had neither the joy of winning nor the emotion of losing. I'm the absence of a balance of myself, the lack of a natural equilibrium, and this weakens and distresses me. Everything, all that I've written, is gray. My life, even my mental life, has been like a drizzly day in which everything is non-occurrence and haziness, empty privilege and forgotten purpose. I agonize in tattered silks. In the light and in tedium, I see but don't know myself. My humble attempt to say at least who I am, to record like a machine of nerves the slightest impressions of my subjective and ultra-sensitive life, this was all emptied like a bucket that got knocked over, and it poured across the ground like the water of everything. I fashioned myself out of false colors, and the result is an attic made out to be an empire. My heart, out of which I spun the great events of prose I lived, seemed to me today, in these pages written long ago and reread now with a different soul, like a water pump on a homestead, instinctively installed and pressed into service. I shipwrecked on a sea without storm, where my feet could have touched bottom. And I ask the conscious vestige that I still conserve, in this confused series of intervals between non-existent things, what good it did me to fill so many pages with phrases I believed in as my own, with emotions I felt as if I had thought them up, with flags and army banners that finally amount to no more than pieces of paper stuck together with spit by the daughter of the beggar who sits under the eaves. I ask what remains of me, why I bothered with these useless pages, dedicated to rubbish and dispersion, lost even before existing among destiny's ripped-up papers. I ask, but I proceed. I write down the question, wrap it up in new phrases, unravel it with new emotions. And tomorrow I'll go back to my stupid book, jotting down the daily impressions of my cold lack of conviction. Let them keep coming. Once the dominoes are all played and the game is won or lost, the pieces are turned over and the finished game is black. 4.43 What hells and purgatories and heavens I have inside me! But who sees me do anything that disagrees with life, me so calm and peaceful? I don't write in Portuguese. I write my own self. 444. Everything has become unbearable except for life. The office, my home, the streets, and even their contrary, if that were my fate, overwhelm and oppress me. Only their ensemble brings me relief. Yes, anything that comes from the whole ensemble is enough to console me a ray of sunlight that eternally enters the dead office, a vendor's cry that flits up to the window of my room, the existence of people, the fact that there are climates and changes in weather, 
the world's astonishing objectivity. The ray of sun suddenly entered the office for me, who suddenly saw it. It was actually an extremely sharp, almost colorless blade of light that sliced the dark wooden floor, quickening the old nails over which it passed, along with the furrows between the boards, black lines of non-white. For several minutes I studied the almost imperceptible effect of the sun penetrating into the still office. Pastimes of prisons. Only the incarcerated watched the sun move this way, like someone observing a file of ants. 445. It is said that tedium is a disease of the idle, or that it attacks only those who have nothing to do. But this ailment of the soul is in fact more subtle. It attacks people who are predisposed to it, and those who work or pretend they work, which in this case comes down to the same thing, are less apt to be spared than the truly idle. Nothing is worse than the contrast between the natural splendor of the inner life with its natural Indias and its unexplored lands, and the squalor, even when it's not really squalid, of life's daily routine. And tedium is more oppressive when there's not the excuse of idleness. The tedium of those who strive hard is the worst of all. Tedium is not the disease of being bored because there's nothing to do, but the more serious disease of feeling that there's nothing worth doing. This means that the more there is to do, the more tedium one will feel. How often, when I look up from the ledger where I enter amounts, my head is devoid of the whole world. I'd be better off remaining idle, doing nothing and having nothing to do, because that tedium, though real enough, I could at least enjoy. In my present tedium there is no rest, no nobility, and no well-being against which to feel unwell. There's a vast effacement of every act I do, rather than a potential weariness from acts I'll never do. 446. Omar Khayyam The tedium of Khayyam isn't the tedium of those who, because they don't know how to do anything, naturally don't know what to do. This tedium belongs to those who were born dead and who understandably turn to morphine or cocaine. The tedium of the Persian sage is more noble and profound. It's the tedium of one who clearly considered and saw that everything was obscure. Of one who took stock of all the religions and philosophies and said, like Solomon, I saw that all was vanity and vexation of spirit. Or in the words of another king, the emperor Septimus Severus, when he said farewell to power in the world, Omnia fui, nihil expedit. I've been everything. Nothing's worth the trouble. Life, according to Targ, is the search for the impossible by way of the useless, which is what Omar Khayyam would have said if he had said it. That's why the Persian insists on the use of wine. Drink, drink, sums up his practical philosophy. It's not the kind of drinking inspired by happiness, which drinks to become even happier, more itself. Nor is it the drinking inspired by despair, which drinks to forget, to be less itself. Happiness adds vigor and love to the wine. And in Kayem, we find no note of energy, no words of love. The wispy, gracile figure of Saki appears only occasionally in the Rubaiyat, and she is merely the girl who serves the wine. The poet appreciates her elegant shape as he appreciated the shape of the amphora containing the wine. Dean Aldrich is an example of how happiness speaks of wine. If all be true that I do think, there are five reasons we should drink. Good wine, a friend, or being dry, or lest we should be by and by, or any other reason why. The practical philosophy of Khayyam is essentially a mild form of Epicureanism, with only a slight trace of desire for pleasure. To see roses and drink wine is enough for him. A gentle breeze, a conversation without point or purpose, a cup of wine, flowers, 
in this and in nothing else, the Persian sage places his highest desire. Love agitates and wearies. Action dissipates and comes to nothing. No one knows how to know, and to think muddles everything. Better to cease from desire and hope, from the futile pretension of explaining the world, and from the foolish ambition of improving or governing it. Everything is nothing, or, as recorded in the Greek anthology, all that exists comes from unreason. And it was a Greek, hence a rational soul, who said it. 447. We are ultimately indifferent to the truth or falseness of all religions, all philosophies, and all the uselessly verifiable hypotheses we call sciences. Nor are we really concerned about the fate of so-called humanity, or about what, as a whole, it does or doesn't suffer. Charity, yes, for our neighbor, as the gospel says, and not for man, of whom it says nothing. And we all feel this way to a certain extent. How much does a massacre in China really disturb even the most noble among us? It's more heart-rending, even for the most sensitively imaginative, to see a child in the street get slapped for no apparent reason. Charity for all, intimacy with none. Thus Fitzgerald, in one of his notes, interprets a certain aspect of Khayyam's ethics. The gospel recommends love towards our neighbor. It doesn't mention love toward man or toward humanity, which no one can help or improve. Some may wonder if I myself subscribe to the philosophy of Khayyam, as restated and interpreted here, with fair accuracy, I believe. I would have to say that I don't know. On certain days it does seem to me the best and even the only practical philosophy there is. On other days it strikes me as void, dead and useless, like an empty glass. Because I think I don't know myself. And so I don't know what I really think. If I had faith, I would be different. But I would also be different if I were crazy. I would be different, yes, if I were different. Besides these lessons from the profane world, there are, of course, the secret teachings of esoteric orders, the mysteries that are freely acknowledged but kept strictly secret, and the veiled mysteries embodied in public rites. There are things hidden or half-hidden in great universal rites such as the Marian ritual of the Roman Church or the Freemason ceremony of the Spirit. But who's to say that the initiate, having entered the inner sanctum of mystery, isn't merely the eager prey of a new facet of our illusion. What certainty can he have, if a madman is even more certain of his mad ideas? Spencer compared our knowledge to a sphere which, as it expands, touches more and more on all that we don't know. And I also remember, with respect to secret initiations and what they can offer us, the terrible words of a grand wizard. I have seen Isis and touched Isis but I do not know if she exists. 448. Omar Khayyam Omar had a personality. I, for better or worse, have none. In an hour I'll have strayed from what I am at this moment. Tomorrow I'll have forgotten what I am today. Those who are who they are, like Omar, live in just one world, the external one. Those who aren't who they are, like me, live not only in the external world, but also in a diversified, ever-changing inner world. Try as we might, we could never have the same philosophy as Omar's. I harbor in me, like unwanted souls, the very philosophies I criticize. Omar could reject them all, for they were all external to him, but I can't reject them, because they are me. 449. There are inner sufferings so subtle and so diffuse that we can't tell whether they belong to the body or the soul, whether they're an anxiety that comes from our feeling that life is futile or an indisposition 
originating in some organic abyss, such as the stomach, liver, or brain. How often my normal self-awareness becomes turbid with the stirred dregs of an anguished stagnation. How often it hurts me to exist, with a nausea so indefinite I'm not sure if it's a tedium or a warning that I'm about to vomit. How often? Today my soul is sad unto my body. All of me hurts. Memory, eyes, and arms. It's like a rheumatism in all that I am. My being isn't touched by the day's limpid brightness, by the sheer blue sky, by this unabating high tide of diffused light. I'm not soothed by the soft, cool breeze, autumnal but reminiscent of summer, which gives the air personality. Nothing touches me. I'm sad, but not with a definite sadness, nor even with an indefinite sadness. I'm sad down there, on the street, littered with packaging crates. These expressions don't exactly translate what I feel, for surely nothing can exactly translate what one feels but I try to convey at least some impression of what I feel, a blend of various views of me and of the street, which is also, since I see it, a part of me in some profound way I cannot fathom. I'd like to live a different life in far-off lands. I'd like to die as someone else among unfamiliar flags. I'd like to be a claimed emperor in other eras, better today because they're not of today and we see them as hazy, colorful, enigmatic novelties. I'd like to have all that could make what I am ridiculous, and precisely because it would make what I am ridiculous. I'd like, I'd like. But there's always the sun when the sun is shining, and the night when the night falls. There's always grief when grief troubles us, and dreams when dreams lull us. There's always what there is, and never what there should be not for being better or worse, but for being different. There's always... The loaders are clearing the crates off the street. Amid jokes and laughter, they place the crates one by one onto wagons. I'm looking down at them from my office window, with sluggish eyes whose eyelids are sleeping. And something subtle and inscrutable links what I feel to the freight that's being loaded. Some strange sensation makes a crate out of all my tedium or anxiety or nausea, which is hoisted on the shoulders of someone who's loudly joking and then loaded onto a wagon that's not there. And in the narrow street, the ever-serene daylight diagonally shines on where they're hoisting the crates, not on the crates themselves, which are in the shade, but on the far corner where the delivery boys are occupied in doing nothing indeterminately. 450. Something still more portentous, like a black expectation, now hovered in the air, so that even the rain seemed intimidated. A speechless darkness fell over the atmosphere. And suddenly, like a scream, a dreadful day shattered. The light of a cold hell swept through the contents of all things filling mines and niches. Everything gaped in awe, and then heaved a sigh of relief, for the strike had passed. The almost human sound of the sad rain was happy. Hearts automatically pounded hard, and thinking made one dizzy. A vague religion formed in the office. No one was himself, and Senor Vasquez appeared at the door of his office to say he didn't quite know what. Mortiera smiled, the fringes of his face still yellow from the sudden fright, and his smile was no doubt saying that the next bolt of thunder would strike further away. A swift wagon loudly broke in on the usual noises from the street. The telephone shivered uncontrollably. Instead of retreating to his private office, Vasquez stepped toward the phone in the common office. There was a respite, a silence and the rain fell like a nightmare. Vasquez forgot about the phone, which had stopped ringing. The office boy fidgeted in the back of the office like a bothersome object. An enormous joy, full of deliverance and peace of mind, 
disconcerted us all. We returned to our work a bit light-hearted, becoming spontaneously sociable and pleasant with each other. Without being told to, the office boy opened wide the windows. The fragrance of something fresh entered with the damp air into the office. The now gentle rain fell humbly. The sounds from the street, which were the same as before, were different. We could hear the voices of the wagoners. And they were really people. The clear ringing bells of the trams a block over participated in our sociability. A lone child's burst of laughter was like a canary in the limpid atmosphere. The gentle rain tapered off. It was six o'clock. The office was closing. Through the half-open door of his private office, Senor Vasquez said, You can all go now, pronouncing the words like a business benediction. I immediately stood up, closed the ledger, and put it away. I returned my pen with a deliberate gesture to its place in the inkstand, walked towards Moriera while pronouncing a See you tomorrow, full of hope, and then shook his hand as if he'd done me a big favor. 451. Travel? One need only exist to travel. I go from day to day as from station to station, in the train of my body or my destiny, leaning out over the streets and squares, over people's faces and gestures, always the same and always different, just like scenery. If I imagine, I see. What more do I do when I travel? Only extreme poverty of imagination justifies having to travel to feel. Quote, Any road, this simple and temptful road, will lead you to the end of the world. End quote. But the end of the world, when we go around it full circle, is the same and temptful from which we started out. The end of the world, like the beginning, is in fact our concept of the world. It is in us that the scenery is scenic. If I imagine it, I create it. If I create it, it exists. If it exists, then I see it like any other scenery. So why travel? In Madrid, Berlin, Persia, China, and at the North or South Pole, where would I be but in myself and in my particular type of sensations? Life is what we make of it. Travel is the traveler. What we see isn't what we see, but what we are. 452. The only real traveler with soul that I've known was an office boy at another firm where I was once employed. This young fellow collected promotional brochures for cities, countries, and transportation companies. He had maps that he'd torn out of journals or that he'd asked for here and there. He had illustrations of landscapes, prints of exotic costumes, and pictures of boats and ships that he'd clipped out of newspapers and magazines. He would go to travel agencies in the name of some imaginary office, or perhaps in the name of a real office, perhaps even the one where he worked, and he would ask for brochures about trips to Italy, brochures about excursions to India, brochures listing the boat connections between Portugal and Australia. He was not only the greatest, but truest traveler I've known. He was also one of the happiest people I've had the privilege to meet. I regret not knowing what's become of him. Or rather, I pretend I should regret it. In fact, I don't. Because by now, ten years or more after the brief period when I knew him, he must be a grown-up, a responsible idiot who fulfills his duties, perhaps as a married man, somebody's provider, dead, that is, while still alive. And maybe he has even traveled in body, he who traveled so well in his soul. I just remembered, he knew the exact route of the train from Paris to Bucharest, as well as the routes of all the trains in England. And as he mispronounced the strange names, I could see the glowing certainty of his greatness of soul. Today, yes, he probably exists as a dead man. But perhaps one day, in his old age, he will remember how it's not only better, but also truer, to dream of Bordeaux than to actually go there. Then, too, all of this may have some other explanation. He may just have been imitating someone. Or, yes, I sometimes think, 
given the appalling difference between the intelligence of children and the stupidity of adults, that in childhood we're accompanied by a guardian spirit who lends us his own astral intelligence, and that later, perhaps with regret but compelled by a higher law, he abandons us, like animal mothers after they've nursed their young, to our destiny as fattened pigs. 453. From the terrace of this café, I look at life with tremulous eyes. I see just a little of its vast diversity concentrated in this square that's all mine. A slight daze like the beginning of drunkenness reveals to me the soul of things. Visible, unanimous life proceeds outside me in the clear and distinct steps of passing pedestrians, in the regulated fury of all their motions. In this moment when my feelings are but a lucid and confused mistake, when my senses have stagnated and everything seems like something else, I spread my wings without moving, like an imaginary condor. Man of ideals that I am, perhaps my greatest ambition is really no more than to keep sitting at this table in this cafe. Everything is futile, like stirring dead ashes, and hazy like the moment before dawn breaks. And the light strikes things so perfectly and serenely, gilding them with sadly smiling reality. All the world's mystery descends until I see it take shape as banality and street. Ah, the mysteries grazed by ordinary things in our very midst. To think that right here, on this sunlit surface of our complex human life, time smiles uncertainly on the lips of mystery. How modern all this sounds, and yet how ancient, how hidden, how full of some other meaning besides the one we see glowing all around us. 454. Reading the newspaper is always unpleasant from an aesthetic point of view, and often from a moral point of view as well, even for those who don't worry much about morality. Reading about the effects of wars and revolutions, there's always one or the other in the news, doesn't make us feel horror, but tedium. What really disturbs our soul isn't the cruel fate of all the dead and wounded, the sacrifice of all who die in action, or who die without seeing action, but the stupidity that sacrifices lives and property to some inevitably futile cause. All ideals and all ambitions are a hysteria of prattling women posing as men. No empire justifies breaking a child's doll. No ideal is worth the sacrifice of a toy train. What empire is useful or what ideal profitable? It's all humanity, and humanity is always the same. Variable, but unimprovable, with fluctuations, but unprogressive. Vis-a-vis -vis the intransigent march of all things, the life that we were given without knowing why, and that we'll lose we don't know when, the ten thousand chess games that constitute our life in common and in conflict, the tedium of uselessly contemplating what we'll never accomplish. Vis-a-vis -vis all that, what can the wise man do but ask to retire? to be excused from having to think about life, since living it is already burdensome enough. To have a little sun and fresh air, and at least the dream that there's peace on the other side of the hills. 455. All those unfortunate occasions in life, when we've been ridiculous or boorish or woefully late, should be seen, in the light of our inner serenity, as the vicissitudes of travel. We are but tourists in the world, traveling willingly or unwillingly, between nothing and nothing, or between everything and everything, and we shouldn't worry too much about the bumps along the way and the mishaps of the journey. I take comfort in this thought, either because there's something in it that's comforting, or simply because I take comfort in it. But fictitious comfort, if I don't think about it, is real enough. And there are so many things that comfort. There's the blue sky above, clear and calm, where odd-shaped clouds are always floating. There's the light breeze, which in the country shakes the thick branches of trees, while in the city it whips the laundry hanging from the fourth and fifth floors. There's warmth when it's warm, and coolness when it's cool. 
and always a memory with its nostalgia, its hope, and a magic smile at the window of the world. And what we want knocking on the door of what we are, like beggars who are the Christ. 456. How long since I last wrote something? In the past few days I've lived through centuries of wavering renunciation. I've stagnated like a forsaken pawn among landscapes that don't exist. Meanwhile, I've been going through the varied monotony of every day, the never-equal succession of the equal hours. Life. Everything has been going well. If I'd been sleeping, it wouldn't have gone any differently. I've stagnated like a pawn that doesn't exist among forsaken landscapes. It often happens that I don't know myself, which is typical in those who know themselves. I look at myself in the various disguises that make me alive. Of all the changes, I possess whatever remains the same. Of all that is accomplished, whatever amounts to nothing. I remember far off inside me, as if I were journeying within, the monotony of that old house in the country, so different from the monotony I feel now. I spent my childhood in that house, but I couldn't say, if I ever wanted to, whether it was happier or sadder than my life today. It was a different self that lived back then. That life and this one are different, diverse, incomparable. The same monotonies that link them on the outside are undoubtedly different on the inside. They're not just two monotonies, but two lives. Why do I bother to remember? Weariness. Remembering is a repose, for it means not doing. For even greater repose, I sometimes remember what never was, and my memories of the countryside where I really lived can't begin to compare, in sharpness and nostalgia, to my memories that inhabit, floorboard by creaking floorboard, the vast rooms of yesteryear that I never inhabited. I've become so entirely the fiction of myself that any natural feeling I may have is immediately transformed, as soon as it's born, into an imaginary feeling. Memories turn into dreams, dreams into my forgetting what I dream, and knowing myself into not thinking of myself. I've so stripped myself of my own being that existence consists of dressing up. I'm only myself when disguised. And all around me, expiring, unknown sunsets gild the landscapes I'll never see. 457. Modern things include 1. The development of mirrors 2. Wardrobes We evolved body and soul into clothed creatures. Since the soul always conforms to the body, it developed an intangible suit. We advance to having a soul that's basically clothed, in the same way that we advanced, as physical humans, to the category of clothed animals. The point isn't just that our suit has become an integral part of us, it's the complexity of this suit, and the curious lack of any real relationship between it and the features that make our body, and our body's movements, naturally elegant. If I were asked to discuss the social causes responsible for my soul's condition, I would speechlessly point to a mirror, a clothes hanger, and a pen. 458. In the light morning fog of mid-spring, the downtown area wakes up groggy and the sun rises as if sluggishly. There's a calm joy in the slightly cold air, a kind of non-breeze softly blows and life vaguely shivers from the cold that has ceased, not from the bit of cold that lingers, but from the memory of the cold, not from today's weather, but in comparison with the approaching summer. The shops are still closed except for the cafes and dairy bars, but the stillness isn't one of torpor, like on Sundays. It's just stillness. A blonde tinge streaks the air that's emerging from the night, and through the dissipating fog, the blueness lightly blushes. The first signs of movement dot the streets, with each pedestrian standing out distinctly, while up above hazy figures can be seen stirring in the few open windows. The clanging trams trace their yellow, numbered furrows in mid-air, 
Little by little, the streets begin to undesert. I drift without thoughts or emotions, just sense impressions. I woke up early and came out to the street without preconceptions. I observe as if in a reverie. I see as if deep in thought. And a gentle mist of emotion absurdly rises up in me. The fog that's disappearing outside seems to be seeping into me. I realize that I've been inadvertently thinking about life. I hadn't noticed, but that's what I was doing. I thought I was no more in my leisurely stroll than a reflector of given images, a blank screen on which reality projects colors and light instead of shadows. But I was unwittingly more than that. I was also my self-denying soul, and even my abstract observing was a denial. As the mist diminishes, the air darkens, imbued by a pale light that seems to have incorporated the mist. I suddenly notice that it's much noisier and that many more people exist. The steps of the now more numerous pedestrians are less hurried. And then, breaking in on everyone else's lesser haste, the sprightly fishwives pop into view. Bakers come swaying under their monstrously large bread baskets, and the diverse sameness of the street vendors is only demonotonized by the contents of their baskets, in which the colors vary more than the actual objects. The unequal cans of the milkmen jangle like absurd hollow keys. The policemen stand stock still in the intersections like civilization's uniform denial of the invisibly rising day. How I would love right now to be able to see all this as somebody whose only relation to it was visual. To view everything as an adult traveler who has just arrived at the surface of life. To not have learned from birth to attach predetermined meanings to all these things. To be able to see them in their natural self-expression irrespective of the expressions that have been imposed on them. To be able to recognize the fishwife in her human reality, independent of her being called a fishwife, and my knowing that she exists and sells fish. To see the policeman as God sees him. To notice everything for the first time, not as apocalyptic revelations of life's mystery, but as direct manifestations of reality. Bells or a large clock strike what, without counting, I know must be eight o'clock. I awaken from myself because of the banality of measured time, that cloister which society imposes on time's continuity, a border to contain the abstract, a boundary around the unknown. I see that the mist, which has completely quit the sky, except for the quasi-blue that still lingers in the blueness, has indeed penetrated into my soul, and has likewise penetrated into the depths of things where they have contact with my soul. I've lost the vision of what I was seeing. My eyes see, but I am blind. I've begun to perceive things with the banality of knowledge. What I see is no longer reality, it's just life. Yes, the life to which I also belong, and which also belongs to me and no longer reality, which belongs only to God or to itself, which contains neither mystery nor truth, and which, since it is real or pretends to be real, exists somewhere invariably, free from having to be temporal or eternal, an absolute image, the external equivalent to the idea of a soul. I turn and walk slowly, though faster than I think, to the door that will lead me back up to my rented room. But I don't enter. I hesitate. I keep going. Praccia da Figuera, gaping with variously colored wares and filling up with customers, blocks the horizon from my view. I advance slowly, lifelessly, and my vision is no longer mine. It's no longer anything. It's merely the vision of a human animal that inexorably inherited Greek culture. Roman order, Christian morality, and all the other illusions that form the civilization in which I feel and perceive. Where are the living? 459. I'd like to be in the country to be able to like being in the city. 
I like being in the city in any case, but I'd like it twice over if I were in the country. 460. The greater the sensibility and the subtler its capacity for feeling, the more absurdly it shivers and shudders over little things. It takes extraordinary intelligence to feel anxiety because of an overcast day. Humanity, basically insensitive, doesn't get anxious over the weather, because there's always weather. Humanity doesn't feel the rain unless it's falling on its head. The hazy, torpid day humidly swelters. Alone in the office, I review my life, and what I see is like the day that oppresses and afflicts me. I see myself as a child, happy for no reason, as an adolescent, full of ambition, as a full-grown man, without happiness or ambition. And it all happened in a haze and a torpor, like this day that makes me see or remember it. Who among us, looking back down the path of no return, can say they followed it in the right way? 461 Knowing how easily the littlest things can torture me, I deliberately avoid contact with the littlest things. If I suffer when a cloud passes in front of the sun, how will I not suffer from the darkness of the forever overcast day that is my life? My isolation isn't a search for happiness, which my soul wouldn't know how to feel, nor for tranquility, which no one obtains unless he never really lost it, but for sleep for effacement, for a modest renunciation. The four walls of my squalid room are at once a cell and a wilderness, a bed and a coffin. My happiest moments are those when I think nothing, want nothing, and dream nothing, being lost in a torpor like some accidental plant, like mere moss growing on life's surface. I savor without bitterness this absurd awareness of being nothing, this foretaste of death and extinction. I've never had anyone I could call master. No Christ died for me. No Buddha showed me the way. No Apollo or Athena in my loftiest dreams ever appeared to enlighten my soul. 462 but my self-imposed exile from life's actions and objectives and my attempt to break off all contact with things led precisely to what I tried to escape. I don't want to feel life or to touch anything real. For the experience of my temperament in contact with the world has taught me that the sensation of life was always painful to me. But in isolating myself to avoid that contact, I exacerbated my already overwrought sensibility. If it were possible to cut off completely all contact with things, then my sensibility would pose no problem. But this total isolation cannot be achieved. However little I do, I still breathe. However little I act, I still move. And so, having exacerbated my sensibility through isolation, I found that the tiniest things, which even for me had been perfectly innocuous, began to rack me like catastrophes. I chose the wrong method of escape. I fled via an uncomfortable and roundabout route to end up at the same place I started from, with the fatigue of my journey added to the horror of living there. I've never seen suicide as a solution, because my hatred of life is due to my love of life. It took me a long time to be convinced of this unfortunate mistake and how I live with myself. Convinced of it, I felt frustrated, which is what I always feel when I convince myself of something, since for me, new conviction means another lost illusion. I killed my will by analyzing it. If only I could return to my childhood before analysis, even if it would have to be before I had a will. My parks are all a dead slumber, their pools stagnating under the midday sun, when the drone of insects swells and life oppresses me, not like a grief, but like a persistent physical pain. Far away palaces, pensive parks, narrow paths in the distance, the dead charm of stone benches where no one sits anymore, 
perished splendors, vanished charm, lost glitter. Oh, my forgotten yearning, if I could only recover the grief with which I dreamed you. 463. Peace at last. All that was dross and residue vanishes from my soul as if it had never been. I'm alone and calm. It's like the moment when I could theoretically convert to a religion. But although I'm no longer attracted to anything down here, I'm also not attracted to anything up above. I feel free, as if I'd ceased to exist and were conscious of the fact. Peace, yes, peace. A great calm, gentle like something superfluous, descends on me to the depths of my being. The pages I read, the tasks I complete, the motions and vicissitudes of life, all has become for me a faint penumbra, a scarcely visible halo circling something tranquil that I can't identify. The exertion in which I've sometimes forgotten my soul, and the contemplation in which I've sometimes forgotten all action, both come back to me as a kind of tenderness without emotion, a paltry, empty compassion. It's not the mild and languidly cloudy day. It's not the feeble, almost non-existent breeze, hardly more perceptible than the still air. It's not the anonymous color of the faintly and spottily blue sky. It's none of this, because I feel none of it. I see without wanting to see, helplessly. I attentively watch the non-spectacle. I don't feel my soul, just peace. External things, all of them, distinct and now perfectly still, even if they're moving, are to me as the world must have been to Christ when, looking down on everything, Satan tempted him. They are nothing, and I can understand why Christ wasn't tempted. They are nothing, and I can't understand why clever old Satan thought they would be tempting. Go swiftly by life that's not felt a stream flowing silently under forgotten trees. Go gently by, soul that's not known, an unseen rustle beyond large fallen branches. Go uselessly by, pointlessly by, consciousness conscious of nothing, a hazy flash in the distance amid clearings in the leaves. Coming from and going to, we don't know where. Go, go, and let me forget. Faint breath of what never dared live, dull sigh of what failed to feel, useless murmur of what refused to think. Go slowly, go slackly, go in the eddies you have to have and in the dips you're given. Go to the shadow or to the light, brother of the world. Go to glory or to the abyss, son of chaos and of the night. But remember in some obscure part of you, that the gods came later, and that they will also pass. 464. Whoever has read the pages of this book will by now surely have concluded that I'm a dreamer, and he will have concluded wrongly. I lack the money to be a dreamer. Great melancholies and sorrows full of tedium can exist only in an atmosphere of comfort and solemn luxury. That's why Poe's Aegeus, pathologically absorbed in thought for hours on end, lives in an ancient ancestral castle where, beyond the doors of the lifeless drawing room, invisible butlers administer the house and prepare the meals. Great dreams require special social circumstances. One day when the doleful cadence of a certain passage I'd written made me excitedly think of Chateaubriand, it didn't take me long to remember that I'm not a Viscount, nor even a Breton. On another occasion, when I'd written something whose contents seemed to recall Rousseau, it likewise didn't take long for me to realize that besides not being the noble lord of a castle, I also lacked the privilege of being a wanderer from Switzerland. But there is also the universe of the Rua dos Doradores. Here God also grants that the enigma of life knows no bounds. My dreams may be poor, like the landscape of carts and crates from among whose wheels and boards I conceive them, but they are what I have and am able to have. 
The sunsets, to be sure, are somewhere else. But even from this fourth-floor room that looks out over the city, it's possible to contemplate infinity. An infinity with warehouses down below, it's true, but with stars up above. This is what occurs to me as I look out my high window at the close of day, with the dissatisfaction of the bourgeois that I'm not, and with the sadness of the poet that I can never be. 465. The advent of summer makes me sad. It seems that summer's luminosity, though harsh, should comfort those who don't know who they are, but it doesn't comfort me. There's too sharp a contrast between the teeming life outside me and the forever unburied corpse of my sensations. What I feel and think without knowing how to feel or think. In this borderless country known as the universe, I feel like I'm living under a political tyranny that doesn't oppress me directly, but that still offends some secret principle of my soul. And then I'm slowly, softly seized by an absurd nostalgia for some future, impossible exile. What I mostly feel is slumber. Not a slumber that latently brings, like all other slumbers, even those caused by sickness, the privilege of physical rest. Not a slumber that, because it's going to forget life and perhaps bring dreams, bears the soothing gifts of a grand renunciation on the platter with which it approaches our soul. No, this is a slumber that's unable to sleep, that weighs on the eyes without closing them, that purses the corners of one's disbelieving lips into what feels like a stupid and repulsive expression. It's the kind of sleepiness that uselessly overwhelms the body when one's soul is suffering from acute insomnia. Only when night comes do I feel, not happiness, but a kind of repose, which, since other reposes are pleasant, seems pleasant by way of analogy. Then my sleepiness goes away, and the confusing mental dusk brought on by the sleepiness begins to fade and to clear until it almost glows. For a moment there's the hope of other things but the hope is short-lived. What comes next is a hopeless, sleepless tedium, the unpleasant waking up of one who never fell asleep. And from the window of my room, I gaze with my wretched soul and exhausted body at the countless stars, countless stars, nothing, nothingness, but countless stars. 466 Man should not be able to see his own face. There's nothing more sinister. Nature gave him the gift of not being able to see it, and of not being able to stare into his own eyes. Only in the waters of rivers or ponds could he look at his own face, and the very posture he had to assume was symbolic. He had to bend over, stoop down, to commit the ignominy of beholding himself. The inventor of the mirror poisoned the human heart. 467. He listened to me reading my verses, which I had read well that day, for I was relaxed, and said to me with the simplicity of a natural law, If you could always be like that, but with a different face, you'd be a real charmer. The word face, more than what it referred to, yanked me out of myself by the collar of my self-ignorance. I looked at the mirror in my room and saw the poor, pathetic face of an unpoor beggar. And then the mirror turned away, and the specter of the Rua dos Torredores opened up before me like a postman's nirvana. The acuity of my sensations is like a disease that's foreign to me. It afflicts someone else, of whom I'm just the sick part, for I'm convinced that I must depend on some greater capacity for feeling. I'm like a special tissue, or a mere cell, that bears the brunt of responsibility for an entire organism. When I think, it's because I'm drifting. When I dream, it's because I'm awake. Everything I am is tangled up in myself, such that no part of me knows how to be. 468. When we constantly live in the abstract, be it the abstraction of thought itself, or of thought sensations, 
Then, quite against our own sentiment or will, the things of the real world soon become phantoms, even those things which, given our particular personality, we should feel most keenly. However much and however sincerely I may be someone's friend, the news that he is sick or that he died produces in me only a vague, indefinite, dull impression, which it embarrasses me to feel. Only direct contact, the actual scene, would kindle my emotion. When we live by the imagination, we exhaust our capacity for imagining, and especially for imagining what's real. Mentally living off what doesn't and can never exist, we lose our ability to ponder what can exist. I found out today that an old friend, one I haven't seen for a long time, but whom I always sincerely remember with what I suppose is nostalgia, has just entered the hospital for an operation. The only clear and definite sensation that this news aroused in me was weariness at the thought of my having to visit him, and the ironic alternative of foregoing the visit and feeling guilty about it. That's all. From dealing so much with shadows, I myself have become a shadow in what I think and feel and am. My being substance consists of nostalgia for the normal person I never was. That, and only that, is what I feel. I don't really feel sorry for my friend who's going to be operated on. I don't really feel sorry for anyone who's going to be operated on, or who suffers and grieves in this world. I only feel sorry for not being a person who can feel sorry. And all at once I'm helplessly thinking of something else, impelled by I don't know what force, and as if I were hallucinating, Everything I was never able to feel or be gets mixed up with a rustling of trees, a trickling of water into pools, a non-existent farm. I try to feel, but I no longer know how. I've become my own shadow, as if I'd surrendered my being to it. Contrary to Peter Schlemiel of the German story, I sold not my shadow, but my substance to the devil. I suffer from not suffering from not knowing how to suffer. Am I alive, or do I just pretend to be? Am I asleep or awake? A slight breeze that coolly emerges from the daytime heat makes me forget everything. My eyelids are pleasantly heavy. It occurs to me that this same sun is shining on fields where I neither am nor wish to be. From the midst of the city's din, a vast silence emerges. How soft it is! but how much softer, perhaps, if I could feel. 469. Even writing has lost its appeal. To express emotions in words and to produce well-wrought sentences has become so banal it's like eating or drinking, something I do with greater or lesser interest, but always with a certain detachment and without real enthusiasm or brilliance. 470. To speak is to show too much consideration for others. It's when they open their mouths that Fish and Oscar Wilde are fatally hooked. 471. Once we're able to see this world as an illusion and a phantasm, then we can see everything that happens to us as a dream, as something that pretended to exist while we were sleeping and we will become subtly and profoundly indifferent toward all of life's setbacks and calamities. Those who die turn to corner, which is why we've stopped seeing them. Those who suffer pass before us like a nightmare, if we feel, or like an unpleasant daydream, if we think. And even our own suffering won't be more than this nothingness. In this world we sleep on our left side, hearing even in our dreams the heart's oppressed existence. Nothing else. A little sunlight, a slight breeze, a few trees framing the distance, the desire to be happy, regret over time's passing, our always doubtful science, and the always undiscovered truth. That's all. Nothing else. No, nothing else. 472 to attain the satisfactions of the mystic state, 
without having to endure its rigors. To be the ecstatic follower of no god, the mystic or epoch with no initiation, to pass the days meditating on a paradise you don't believe in. All of this tastes good to the soul that knows it knows nothing. The silent clouds drift high above me, a body inside a shadow. The hidden truths drift high above me, a soul imprisoned in a body. Everything drifts high above, and everything high above passes on, just like everything down below, with no cloud leaving behind more than rain, no truth leaving behind more than sorrow. Yes, everything that's lofty passes high above, and passes on. Everything that's desirable is in the distance, and distantly passes on. Yes, everything attracts, everything remains foreign and everything passes on. What's the point of knowing that in the sun or in the rain, as a body or as a soul, I will also pass on? No point. Just the hope that everything is nothing, and nothing, therefore, everything. 473. Every sound mind believes in God. No sound mind believes in a definite God. There is some being, both real and impossible, who resigns over all things, and whose person, if he has one, cannot be defined, and whose purposes, if he has any, cannot be fathomed. By calling this being God, we say everything, since the word God, having no precise meaning, affirms him without saying anything. The attributes of infinite, eternal, omnipotent, all just or all loving, that we sometimes attach to him, fall off by themselves, like all unnecessary adjectives, when the noun suffices. And he, who, being indefinite, cannot have attributes, is for that very reason the absolute noun. The same certainty and the same obscurity exist with respect to the soul's survival. We all know that we die. We all feel that we won't die. It's not just a desire or hope that brings us this shadowy intuition that death is a misunderstanding. It's a visceral logic that rejects. 474. A day. Instead of eating lunch, a necessity I have to talk myself into every day, I walked down to the Tagus, and I wandered back along the streets without even pretending that it did me good to see it. Even so, living isn't worth our while, only seeing is. To be able to see without living would bring happiness, but this is impossible, like virtually everything we dream. How great would be the ecstasy that didn't include life. To create at least a new pessimism, a new negativity, so that we can live the illusion that something of us, albeit something bad, will remain. 475. What are you laughing about? The voice of Mordiera harmlessly wandered beyond the two bookshelves that marked the boundary of my pinnacle. I mixed up some names, I answered, and my lungs calmed. Oh, he said quickly, and dusty silence fell once more over the office and over me. The Viscount of Chateaubriand doing the books. Professor Amiel sitting here on a high royal stool. Count Alfred de Vigny debiting Grandella department store. Senacure on the Rua dos Torredores. Not even poor, miserable Bourget, whose books are all tiresome as a building without an elevator. I turn and lean out the window to look once more at my Boulevard Saint Germain, and precisely at that moment, the ranch owner's partner is spitting from the next window over. And between thinking about this and smoking, and not connecting one thing to the other, my mental laughter finds the smoke, gets tangled in my throat, and expands into a mild attack of audible laughter. 476. It will seem to many that my diary, written just for me, is too artificial. But it's only natural for me to be artificial. How else can I amuse myself 
except by carefully recording these mental notes, though I'm not very careful about how I record them. In fact, I jot them down in no particular order and with no special care. The refined language of my prose is the language in which I naturally think. For me, the outer world is an inner reality. I feel this not in some metaphysical way, but with the senses normally used to grasp reality. Yesterday's frivolity is a nostalgia that gnaws at my life today. There are cloisters in this moment. Night has fallen on all our evasions. A final despair in the blue eyes of the pools reflect the dying sun. We were so many things in the parks of old. We were so voluptuously embodied in the presence of the statues and in the English layout of the paths. The costumes, the foils, the wigs, the graceful motions, and the processions were so much a part of the substance of our spirit. But who does R refer to? Just the fountain's winged water in the deserted garden, shooting less high than it used to in its sad attempt to fly. 477. And lilies on the banks of remote rivers, cold and solemn on a never-ending close of day in the heart of real continents. With nothing else, and yet utterly real. 478. Lunar scene. The entire landscape is in no place at all. 479. Far below, sloping down in a tumult of shadows from the heights where I gaze. The icy city sleeps in the moonlight. An anxiety for being me, forever trapped in myself, floods my whole being without finding a way out, shaping me into tenderness, fear, sorrow, and desolation. An inexplicable surfeit of absurd grief. A sorrow so lonely, so bereft, so metaphysically mine. 480 the silent, hazy city spreads out before my wistful eyes. The buildings, all different, form a confused, self-contained mass, whose dead projections are arrested in the pearly, uncertain moonlight. There are rooftops and shadows, windows and middle ages, but nothing around which to have outskirts. There's a glimmer of the far away in everything I see. Above where I'm standing, there are black branches of trees, and all the city's sleepiness fills my disenchanted heart. Lisbon by moonlight, and my weariness because of tomorrow. What a night! It pleased whoever fashioned the world's details that for me there should be no better melody or occasion than these solitary, moonlit moments when I no longer know the self I've always known. No breeze, no person interrupts what I'm not thinking. I'm sleepy in the same way that I'm alive, but there is feeling in my eyelids, as if something were making them heavy. I hear my breathing. Am I asleep or awake? To drag my feet homeward weighs like lead on my senses. The caress of extinction, the flower proffered by futility, my name never pronounced, my disquiet like a river contained between its banks, the privilege of abandoned duties, and, around the last bend in the ancestral park, that other century like a rose garden. 481. I went into the barber shop as usual, with the pleasant satisfaction of entering a familiar place easily and naturally. New things are distressing to my sensibility. I'm at ease only in places where I've already been. After I'd sat down in the chair, I happened to ask the young barber, occupied in fastening a clean, cool cloth around my neck, about his older colleague from the chair to the right, a spry fellow who had been sick. I didn't ask this because I felt obliged to ask something. It was the place and my memory that sparked the question. He passed away yesterday. Flatly answered the barber's voice behind me 
and the linen cloth as his fingers withdrew from the final tuck of the cloth in between my shirt collar and my neck. The whole of my irrational good mood abruptly died. Like the eternally missing barber from the adjacent chair, a chill swept over all my thoughts. I said nothing. Nostalgia. I even feel it for people and things that were nothing to me. Because time's fleeing is for me an anguish. And life's mystery is a torture. Faces I habitually see on my habitual streets. If I stop seeing them, I become sad. And they were nothing to me, except perhaps the symbols of all of life. The nondescript old man with dirty gaiters who often crossed my path at 9.30 in the morning. The crippled seller of lottery tickets who would pester me in vain. The round and ruddy old man smoking a cigar at the door of the tobacco shop. The pale tobacco shop owner. What has happened to them all, who, because I regularly saw them, were a part of my life? Tomorrow I too will vanish from the Rua de Prata, the Rua dos Torredores, the Rua dos Fanqueiros. Tomorrow I too, I, this soul that feels and thinks, this universe I am for myself. Yes, tomorrow I too will be the one who no longer walks these streets whom others will vaguely evoke with a, what's become of him? And everything I've done, everything I've felt, and everything I've lived will amount to merely one less passerby on the everyday streets of some city or other.